from the book jacket. At long last, the New York Times best-selling series that launched the Star Wars saga into the next generation and into thrilling new territory reaches its spectacular finale. Side by side, Luke Skywalker, Han Solo, Leia Organa Solo, their children, and their comrades in the Galactic Alliance rally for their last stand against the enemy that threatens not only the galaxy, but the Force itself. The Galactic Alliance's hard-won success in countering the Yuzhan Vong onslaught has proven all too brief, and the tide has turned once more to the invaders' advantage. Having overcome the sabotage strategies of the Jedi and their allies, the marauding aliens have pushed deeper into the galaxy and subjugated more worlds in their ruthless quest for domination. Coruscant has been remade into a Yuzhan Vong stronghold. The remnants of the Resistance are struggling to form a united front. Luke, Mara, and Jason are missing in action. Clearly, the stage is set for endgame. Now, as Han and Leia receive the chilling news that hundreds of high-ranking Galactic Alliance prisoners face slaughter in a sacrifice to the enemy's bloodthirsty gods, Luke and his team try desperately to convince the living world of Zonama Seacote to join the Jedi's final campaign against the Yuzhan Vong. Yet, even as they speak, a lone space station is all that stands between Alliance headquarters on Mon Calamari and wave after wave of ferocious enemy forces waging their most decisive assault. At the same time, the Jedi's alliances throughout the galaxy are being tested, and the chances of victory jeopardized by rogue factions determined to deploy the lethal weapon that will exterminate the Yuzhan Vong, and perhaps countless other species. And among the Yuzhan Vong themselves, the threat of revolt has reached a boiling point as the oppressed underclass and powerful officials alike fear their supreme overlord's mad actions will provoke the wrath of the gods. Ultimately, for both the forces of invasion and resistance, too much has been sacrificed, and too much is at stake to ever turn back. And now nothing can stand in the way of seizing victory or facing annihilation. Part 1. Across the Stars Chapter 1 Selvaris, faintly green against a sweep of white-hot stars, and with only a tiny moon for companionship, looked like the loneliest of planets. Almost five years into a war that had seen the annihilation of peaceful worlds, the disruption of major hyperlanes, the fall and occupation of Coruscant itself, the fact that such a backwater place could rise to sudden significance was perhaps the clearest measure of the frightful shadow the Yuzhan Vong had cast across the galaxy. Immediate evidence of that significance was a prisoner-of-war compound that had been hollowed from the dense coastal jungle of Selvaris's modest southern continent. The compound of wooden detention buildings and organic hive-like structures known as grashels was enclosed by Yorick coral walls and watchtowers that might have been thrust from the planet's aquamarine sea or left exposed by a freakishly low tide. Beyond the tall, scabrous perimeter, where the vegetation had been leveled or reduced to ash by plasma weapons, rigid blades of knee-high grass poked from the sandy soil, extending all the way to the vibrant green palisade that was the tree line. Whipped by a persistent salty wind, the fan-like leaves of the tallest trees flapped and snapped like war banners. Standing between the prison camp and a brackish estuary that meandered finally to the sea, the jungle combined indigenous growth with exotic species, bioengineered by the Yuzhan Vong, and soon to become dominant on Selvaris, as had already happened on countless other worlds. Two charred Yorick Trima landing craft, not yet fully healed from recent deep space engagements with the enemy, sat in the spacious prison yard. Shuffling past them came a group of humans, bald domed Bith, and thick horned Gotals carrying three corpses wrapped in cloth. 
His back pressed to one of the coral craft, a Yuzhan Vong guard watched the prisoners struggle with the dead. Be quick about it, he ordered. The more lure doesn't like to be kept waiting. The camp's prisoners had argued vehemently to be allowed to dispose of bodies according to the customs of the deceased, but graves or funeral pyres had been expressly forbidden by the order of the Yuzhan Vong priests who officiated at the nearby temple. Their ruling was that all organics had to be recycled. The dead could either be left to Selvaris's ample and voracious flocks of carrion eaters, or be fed to the Yuzhan Vong biot, known as a maulur, which some of the more well-traveled prisoners characterized as a mating of trash compactor and sarlacc. The guard was tall and long-limbed, with an elongated sloping forehead and bluish sacks underscoring his eyes. The light of Selvaris's two sons had reddened his skin slightly, and the planet's hothouse heat had turned him lean. Facial tattoos and scarifications marked him as an officer, but he lacked the deformations and implants peculiar to commanders. Bound by a ring of black coral, his dark hair fell in a side knot to below his shoulders, and his uniform tunic was cinched by a narrow hide belt. A melee weapon coiled around his muscular right forearm like a deadly vine. What made subaltern Shito unusual was that he spoke basic, though not nearly as fluently as his commander. The prisoners paused briefly in response to Shito's order that they hurry. We'd sooner see their bones picked clean by scavengers than let them be a meal for your garbage eater, the shortest of the humans said. Make the maw lure happy by throwing yourself in, a second human added. You tell him, Kaminor, the Gotal beside him encouraged. Shirtless, the prisoners were slick with sweat and kilos lighter than when they had arrived on Selvaris two standard months earlier, after being captured during an abortive attempt to retake the planet Gindine. Those who wore trousers had cut them off at the knee and likewise trimmed their footwear to provide no more than was needed to keep their feet from being bloodied by the coarse ground or the waves of thorned senelax that thrived outside the walls. Sieto only sneered at their insolence and waved his left hand to disperse the cloud of insects that encircled him. The short human cracked a smile and laughed. That's what you get for using blood as body paint, Sieto. Sieto puzzled out the meaning of the remark. Insects are not the problem, only that they are not Yuzhan Vong insects. With uncommon speed, he snatched one out of the air and curled his hand around it. Not yet, that is. World shaping had commenced in Selvaris's eastern hemisphere and was said to be creeping around the planet at the rate of 200 kilometers per local day. Bioengineered vegetation had already engulfed several population centers, but it would be months before the botanical imperative was concluded. Until then, all of Selvaris was a prison. No residents had been allowed off-world since the internment camp had been grown and all enemy communications facilities had been dismantled. Technology had been outlawed. Droids especially had been destroyed with much accompanying celebration and in the name of benevolence. Liberated from their reliance on machines, sentient species might at long last glimpse the true nature of the universe which had been brought into being by Yun Yuzhan in an act of selfless sacrifice, and was maintained by the lesser gods in whom the Creator had placed his trust. Maybe you should just try converting our insects, one of the humanoids suggested. Start with threatening to pull their wings off, the short human said. Sito opened his hand to display the winged bug, pinched between forefinger and thumb but unharmed. This is why you lose the war, and why coexistence with you is impossible. You believe we inflict pain for sport, when we do so only to demonstrate reverence for the gods. He held the pitiful creature at arm's length. Think of this as yourselves. Obedience leads to freedom, disobedience to disgrace. Abruptly, he smashed the insect against his taut chest. 
no middle path. You are Yuzhan Vong, or you are dead. Before any of the prisoners could reply, a human officer stepped from the doorway of the nearest hut into the harsh sunlight. Thick-set and bearded, he wore his filthy uniform proudly. Commonor, Antar, clock door. That's enough chatter, the officer said, referring to them by their native worlds rather than by name. Carry on with your duties and report back to me. On our way, Captain, the short human said, saluting. That's Paige, right? the Gotal asked. I hear nothing but good things. All of them true, one of the Biths said, but we need ten thousand more like him if we're ever going to turn this war around. As the prisoners moved off, Sitto turned to regard Captain Judder Page, who held the subaltern's appraising gaze for a long moment before stepping back into the wooden building. The body-bearer had spoken the truth, Sitto thought. Warriors like Page could snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. The Yuzhan Vong held the high ground in the long war, but only barely. The fact that a prison camp had had to be grown on the surface of Selvaris was proof of that. Normally a battle vessel would have served as a place of detention, but with the final stages of the conflict being waged on numerous fronts, every able vessel was deployed to engage hostile forces on contested worlds, patrol conquered systems, defend the hazy margins of the invasion corridor, or protect Yuzhan Tar the hallowed center, over which Supreme Overlord Shimra had now presided for a standard year. In any other circumstance, there would have been little need for high walls or watchtowers, let alone a full complement of warriors to guard even such high-status prisoners as the mixed-species lot gathered on Selvaris. At the start of the war, captives had been fitted with manacles, immobilized in blorash jelly or simply implanted with surge coral and enslaved to a Duryam, a governing brain. But living shackles, quick jelly, and surge coral were in short supply, and Duryams were so scarce as to be rare. Were Sitto in command, Page and others like him would already have been executed. As it was, too many compromises had been made. The wooden shelters, the disposal of bodies, the food— no matter the species, the prisoners had no stomach for the Yuzhan Vong diet. With so many of them succumbing to their battle wounds or malnutrition, the prison commander had been forced to allow food to be delivered from a nearby settlement, where the residents plucked fish and other marine life from Selvaris's bountiful seas, and harvested fruits from the planet's equally generous forests. Against the possibility that resistance cells might be operating in the settlement, the place was even more closely guarded than the prison. It was said among the warriors that Salvaris had no indigenous sentience, and in fact the settlers who called the planet home had the look of beings who had either been marooned or were in hiding. The sentient who delivered the weekly rations of food was no exception. Covered with a nap of smoke-colored fur, the being walked upright on two muscular legs, and yet was graced with a useful-looking tail. Paired eyes sparkled in a slender, mustachioed face, the prominent feature of which was a beak of some cartilaginous substance, perforated at intervals like a flute and down-curving over a drooping polar mustache. He was harnessed to a wagon that rode on two Yorick coral wheels and was laden with baskets, pots, and an assortment of bulging homespun sacks. Nutrition for the prisoners, the sentient announced as he neared the prison's bonework front gate. Sieto ambled over while a quartet of sentries busied themselves removing the lids of the baskets and undoing the drawstrings that secured the sacks. He sniffed at the contents of one of the open bags. All this has been prepared according to the commander's instructions? He asked the food-bearer in basic. The being nodded. The fur on his head was pure white and stood straight up as if raised by fright. Washed, decontaminated, separated into flesh, grains, and fruits, fearsome one. The honorific was usually reserved for commanders, but Sitto didn't bother to correct the food-bearer. Blessed as well? 
I arrive directly from the temple. Sito glanced down the unsurfaced track that vanished into the high jungle. To provide the garrison with a place of worship, the priests had placed a statue of Yun Yamka, the slayer, in a grashal grown specifically for use as a temple. Close to the temple stood the commander's grashal and barracks grashals for the lesser officers. Sito lowered his flat-nosed face to an open basket. Fish? Of a kind, fearsome one. The subaltern gestured to a cluster of hairy and hard-shelled spheres. And these? A fruit that grows in the crowns of the largest trees. Rich flesh, with a kind of milk inside. Open one. The food-bearer inserted a hooked finger deep into the seam of the fruit and pried it open. Sito gouged out a fingerful of the pinkish flesh and brought it to his broad mouth. Too good for them, he announced, as the flesh dissolved on his thorn-pierced tongue. But necessary, I suppose. Few of the guards accepted that the prisoners couldn't tolerate Yuzhan Vong food. They suspected that the alleged intolerance was a ploy, part of an ongoing contest of wills between the captives and their captors. The food-bearer placed his hands, palms raised, just below his heart, in a position of prayer. Yun Yuzhan is merciful, fearsome one. He provides even for the enemies of the true faith. Sito glowered at him. What do you know of Yun Yuzhan? I have embraced the truth. It took the coming of the Yuzhan Vong to open my eyes to the existence of the gods. Through their mercy, even your captives will see the truth. Sito shook his head firmly. The prisoners cannot be converted, for then the war is over. But eventually, all will kneel before Yun Yuzhan. He waved a signal to the sentries. Admit the food-bearer. In the largest of the wooden huts, all of which had been built by the prisoners themselves, there was little to do but tend to the sick and dying, pass the daylight hours in conversation or games of chance, or wait ravenously for the next meal to arrive. Harsh coughing or the occasional laugh punctuated a grim, broiling silence. The Yuzhan Vong hadn't required any of the captives to work in the villa paddies or anywhere else in or outside the York coral walls, and thus far only the top-ranking officers had been interrogated. A diverse lot, most of the prisoners had been taken at Bilbringi, but others had arrived from worlds as distant as Yagdul, Antar IV, and Ord Mantel. They wore the tattered remains of starfighter flight suits and combat uniforms. Their battered and undernourished bodies, whether hairless, coated, sleek, or fleshy, were laminated in sweat and grime. They had basic in common, and more important, a deep abiding hatred for the Yuzhan Vong. That they hadn't been killed outright meant that they were being saved for sacrifice— probably on completion of the world-forming of Selvaris, or in anticipation of an imminent battle with Galactic Alliance forces. Chow's here, a human standing at the entrance said. A rare cheer went up, and everyone capable got to their feet, forming up in an orderly line that spoke to the discipline demonstrated ceaselessly by the captives. Eyes wide, mouths salivating at the mere thought of nourishment, several of the prisoners hurried outside to help unload the food wagon and carry everything inside. A Twi'lek with an amputated leku studied the short being who had delivered the food, while the two of them were hauling sacks and pots into the hut. You're Wren, the Twi'lek said. Hope that doesn't mean you won't touch the food, the Wren said. The Twi'lek's orange eyes shone. Some of the best food I've ever tasted was prepared by Rin. Years ago, I ran with a couple of your people in the outer rim. Tan Shan, a human voice rang out. Everyone in earshot snapped too as a pair of human officers in uniform approached the hut. The prisoners had abandoned all notions of rank, but if it could be said that anyone was in command, it was these two. Captain Judder Page and Major Posh Kraken. Hailing from important worlds, 
Page from Coralag, Kraken from Contrum, they had much in common. Both were scions of influential families, and both had trained at the Imperial Academy before defecting to the Rebel Alliance during the Galactic Civil War. Page, the more unremarkable-looking of the pair, had established the Katarn Commandos. And Kraken, still ruggedly handsome and muscular in midlife, Kraken's flight group. Both had managed to become as fluent in Yuzhan Vong as subaltern Shito was in basic. Make room for the Major and the Captain at the front of the line, the same human who had announced them ordered. The officers deferred. We'll eat after the rest of you have had your share, Page said for the two of them. Please, sirs, several of those online insisted. Page and Kraken exchanged resigned looks and nodded. Kraken accepted a wooden bowl that had been fashioned by one of the prisoners and moved to the head of the food line, where the wren was stirring the gruelish contents of a large Yorick coral container. We appreciate your bringing this, Kraken said. His eyes were pale green, and his flame-red hair was shot through with gray, adding a measure of distinction to his aristocratic features. The wren smiled slyly. Plunging a ladle deep into the gruel, he bent over the pot, encouraging Kraken to do the same in order to get his bowl filled. When Kraken's left ear was within whisper distance of the Rin's mouth, the being said, Rin 115, out of Vortex. Kraken hid his surprise. He had learned about the Rin syndicate only two months earlier, during a briefing on Moan Calamari which had become Galactic Alliance headquarters following the fall of Coruscant. An extensive spy network, comprised of not only Rin, but also members of other equally displaced species, the Syndicate made use of secret space routes and hyperlanes blazed by the Jedi to provide safe passage for individuals and covert intelligence. You have something for us? Kraken asked quietly, while the Wren was ladling gruel into the wooden bowl. The Wren's forward-facing eyes darted between the container and Kraken's lined face. Chew carefully, Major, he said, just loud enough to be heard. Expect the unexpected. Kraken straightened, whispering the message to Page, who in turn whispered it to the Bith behind him in line. Surreptitiously, the message was relayed again and again, until it had reached the last of the one hundred or so prisoners. By then, Kraken, Page, and some of the others had carried their bowls to a crude table, around which they squatted and began to finger the gruel carefully into their mouths, glancing at one another in understated anticipation. At the same time, three prisoners moved to the doorway to keep an eye out for guards. The Yuzhan Vong hadn't installed villops or other listening devices in the huts, but warriors like Shito, who displayed obvious curiosity about the enemy, had made it a habit to barge in without warning and conduct sweeps and searches. A Deveronian hunkered down across the table from Page made a gagging sound. Faking a cough, he gingerly removed an object from his slash of dangerous mouth and glanced at it in secret. Everyone stared at him in expectation. Grissel, he said, lifting beady, disappointed eyes. At least I think that's what it is. The prisoners went back to eating, the tension mounting as their fingers began to scrape the bottoms of their bowls. Then Kraken bit down on something that made his molars ache. He brought his left hand to his mouth and used his tongue to push the object into his cupped hand. The center of attention, he opened his hand briefly, recognizing the object at once. Keeping the thing palmed, he set it on the table and slid it to his left, where in the blink of an eye it disappeared under the right hand of Page. Hollow wafer, the captain said softly without taking a second look. It'll display only once. We're going to have to be quick about it. Kraken nodded his chin to the horned Deveronian. Find Clockdor, Garbin, and the rest of that crew, and bring them here quickest. The Deveronian stood up and hurried out the doorway. Page ran his hand over his bearded face. We're going to need a place to display the data, 
We can't risk doing it in the open. Kraken thought for a moment, then turned to the long-bearded Bothan to his right. Who's the one with the sabak deck? The alien's fur rippled slightly. That'd be Coruscant. Tell him we need him. The Bothan nodded and made for the doorway. As word spread through the hut, the prisoners began to converse loudly as cover for what was being said by those who remained at the table. The Rin banged his ladle against the side of the pot, and several of the prisoners distributed fruits to the others by tossing them through the air as if in a game of catch. How are things in the yard? Page asked the lookouts at the doorway. Coruscant's coming, sir. Also clock doors bunch. The guards? No one's paying any mind. Coruscant, a tall, blond-haired human, entered grinning and fanning a deck of sabac cards he'd fashioned from squares of leather. Did I hear right that someone's interested in a game? Page motioned for everyone to form a circle in the center of the hut and to raise the noise level. The guards had grown accustomed to the boisterous activity that would sometimes erupt during card games, and Page was determined to provide a dose of the real thing. A dozen prisoners broke out in song. The rest conversed jocularly, giving odds and making bets. The human gambler, three Bith, and a Janet were passed through the falsely jubilant crowd to the center of the circle, where Page and Kraken were waiting with the hollow wafer. Coruscant began to dole out cards. Highly evolved humanoids, Bith were deep thinkers and skillful artists, with an ability to store and sift through immense amounts of data. The Janet, in contrast, was short and rodent-like, but possessed of an eidetic memory. When Page was satisfied that the inner circle was effectively sealed off, he crouched down as if to join in the game. We'll get only one chance at this. You sure you can do it? The Janet's muzzle twitched in amusement, and he fixed his red eyes on Page. That's why you chose us, isn't it? Page nodded. Then let's get to it. Deftly, Page set the small wafer on the plank floor and activated it with the pressure of his right forefinger. An inverted cone of blue light projected upward, within which flared a complex mathematical equation Page couldn't begin to comprehend, much less solve or memorize. As quickly as the numbers and symbols appeared, they disappeared. Then the wafer itself issued a sibilant sound and liquefied. He had his mouth open to ask the Bith and the Janet if they had been successful in committing the equation to memory, when Sito and three Yuzhan Vong guards stormed into the hut and shouldered their way to the center of the circle, their kufi daggers unsheathed and their serpentine amphistaffs on high alert, ready to strike or spit venom as needed. Cease your activities at once, the subaltern bellowed. The crowd fanned out slowly and began to quiet down. Coruscant and the ostensible card players moved warily out of striking range of the amphistaffs. What's the problem, subaltern? Page asked in Yuzhan Vong. Since when do you engage in games of chance at nourishment hour? We're wagering for second helpings. Sieto glared at him. You trifle with me, human. Page shrugged elaborately. It's my job, Sieto. The subaltern took a menacing step forward. Put an end to your game and your singing, or we'll remove the parts of you that are responsible for it. The four Yuzhan Vong turned and marched from the hut. That guy has absolutely no sense of humor, Coruscant said when he felt he could. Everyone in the vicinity of Page and Kraken looked to the two officers. The data has to reach Alliance Command, Kraken said. Page nodded in agreement. When do we send them out? Kraken compressed his lips. Prayer Hour Chapter 2 Shortly before its public immolation in a fire pit located just outside the prison gates, a silver protocol droid that had belonged briefly to Major Kraken had put the odds of escaping from Salvaris at roughly a million to one. But the droid hadn't known about the Rin Syndicate or about what the clandestine group had set in motion on the planet, even before the first chunks of Yorick coral had been sown. 
Kraken, Page, and the others knew something else as well, that hope flourished in the darkest of places, and that while the Yuzhan Vong could imprison or kill them, there wasn't a soldier in the camp who wouldn't have risked his or her life to see even one of their numbers survive to fight another day. First sunrise was an hour away, and Kraken, Page, the three Bith, and the Genet were crouched at the entrance to a tunnel the prisoners had excavated with hands, claws, and whatever tools they had been able to fabricate or steal during the excavation of the fire pit, in which several dozen droids had been ritually slagged by the camp's resident priests. Every prisoner in the hut was awake, and many hadn't slept a wink all night. They watched silently from the flattened fronds and grasses that were their beds, wishing they could voice a personal good luck to the four who were about to embark on what seemed a hopeless enterprise. Lookouts had been posted at the doorway. The light was gauzy, and the air was blessedly cool. Outside the hut, the chitterings and stridulations of jungle life were reaching a fevered crescendo. You want to go over any of it? Kraken asked in a whisper. No, sir, the four answered in unison. Kraken nodded soberly. Then may the force be with all of you, Page said for everyone in the hut. The cramped entrance to the tunnel was concealed by Kraken's own bed of insect-ridden palm fronds. Below a removable grate, the half-hewn shaft fell into utter darkness. The secret passageway had been started by the first captives to be imprisoned on Selvaris, and had been enlarged and lengthened over the long months by successive groups of new arrivals. Progress had often been measured in centimeters, as when the diggers had struck a mass of Yorick coral that had taken root in the sandy soil. But now the tunnel extended beneath the prison wall and the Senelac grasses beyond to just inside the distant tree line. His facial fur blackened with charcoal, the gaunt Jennet was the first to worm his way into the hole. When the three Bith had bellied in behind him, the entrance was closed and covered over. What little light there had been disappeared. The nominal leader of the would-be escapees, the Jennet, had been captured on Bilbringi during a raid on an enemy installation. His fellow captives knew him as Thorsh, although on his home world of Garbin, a list of his accomplishments and transgressions would have been affixed to the name. Reconnaissance was his specialty, so he was no stranger to darkness or tight spots, having infiltrated many a Yuzhan Vong Warren and Grashel on Duro, Gindine, and other worlds. The Salvaris Tunnel felt comfortably familiar. The Bith had it harder because of their size, but they were a well-coordinated species, with memory and olfactory abilities that rivaled Thorsh's own. Indeterminate minutes of muted crawling brought them to the first of a series of confined right-angle turns, where the tunnelers had been forced to detour around an amorphous mass of Yorick coral. To Thorsh, the detour meant that the team was directly under the prison wall itself. Now it was just a matter of negotiating the long stretch beneath the Senelax the Yuzhan Vong had cultivated outside the perimeter. Thorsh knew better than to relax, but his continued vigilance hardly mattered. In the space of a local week, Senelac roots had penetrated the roof of the poorly braced tunnel, and the convoluted roots were every bit as barbed as the strands released by the knee-high stalks themselves. For meters at a stretch, there was simply no avoiding them. The barbs shredded the thin garments the four had been wearing when captured and left deep bleeding furrows in the flesh of their backs. Thorsh muttered a curse at each encounter, but the Bith, ever careful about displaying emotion, endured the pain in silence. The brutal crawl ended where the tunnel sloped upward at the far edge of the Senelac field. Shortly, the team emerged inside the buttressed base of an enormous hardwood. The thick-trunked tree bore a striking resemblance to the gnarled trees native to Dagobah, but was in fact a different species altogether. One hundred meters away, the prison wall glowed softly green with bioluminescence. Two sleepy guards occupied the closest watchtower, 
their amphistaffs stiff as spears, and a third could be glimpsed in the adjacent tower. Those warriors who weren't elsewhere within the walls of the compound were attending prayer services at the temple. The bold incantations of the latter wafted through the jungle, counterpoint to the riotous calls of birds and insects. Strands of mist meandered through the treetops like apparitions. One of the Bith elbowed his way alongside Thorsh and aimed his slender forefinger to the west. There. Thorsh sniffed repeatedly and nodded. There. Deeper into the trees, ankle-high mud gave way to swamp, and it wasn't long before the four were wading waist-deep through black water. They made scarcely half a kilometer before an alarm sounded. Neither the howling of a siren nor the raucous bleating of a starship's klaxon, the alarm took the form of a prolonged and intensifying drone that arrived from all directions. Sentinel beetles, one of the Bith said in a grating voice. Small creatures that resembled turf hoppers, sentinels reacted to intruders or danger with rapid beating of their serrated wings. The species was not native to Salvaris, or indeed to any other world in the galaxy. Thorsh's clawed feet dug into the thick organic muck, and he quickened his pace, waving for the Bith to follow him. Hurry! The need for caution was behind them. They flailed through the dark scum-covered water, stumbling forward, slamming into stilt roots, their uniforms snagging on quilled branches and sinuous, coarse-barked lianas. The droning of the sentinel beetles modulated to a deafening buzz, and the harnessed beams of lambent crystal illuminators played and crisscrossed overhead. From the direction of the prison came the ferocious barking of bishops, the Yuzhan Vong lizard hounds, and something had taken to the air, a coral skipper gunship, or one of the seabird-like flyers known as a sikvai. A loud whining split the sky, and the four escapees submerged themselves in the filmy water to avoid detection. Thorsh surfaced a long moment later, dripping water and gasping for air. The baying of the bishops was louder, and now the sound of nimble footfalls and angry voices cut through the humid air. The temple was emptying. Search parties were being organized. Thorsh stood to his full height, spurring everyone into motion once more. They slipped and slid and otherwise fought their way through dense vegetation to the eastern bank of the wide estuary. By then, Selvaris's primary was cresting the horizon. Long horizontal rays of rose-tinted sunlight streaked through the trees, saturating the evanescing mist with color. Making haste for the water, one of the Bith sank to his waist in the liquid sand. It took the combined strength of all three of his teammates to yank him free, and more time than they had to spare. The coral skipper reappeared, rocketing out over the estuary and loosing molten projectiles into the jungle. Fireballs mushroomed above the treetops, sending thousands of nesting creatures into frantic flight. Captain Page never promised this was going to be easy, Thorsh said. Or dry, the quicksand-covered Bith added. Thorsh's long nose twitched, and his keen eyes scanned the opposite shoreline. We're not far now. He indicated a bird island in the middle of the estuary. There. They plunged into the brackish water and began to swim for their lives. The morning sky was black with frightened birds. The coral skipper made another pass, forging through the airborne chaos. Bird bodies plummeted, slapping the surface of the calm water and tinting it red. Thorsh and the others scrambled onto the island's narrow beach. They picked themselves up and sprinted for cover, squirming into the island's snarl of skeletal trees and thorny bushes. They stopped frequently to get their bearings. The Bith's olfactory organs were located in the parallel skin folds of their cheeks, but it was Thorsh's long nose that directed them straight to what the Rin had hidden months earlier. Two aged swoops, camouflaged by a mimetic tarpaulin. The repulsor lift swoop bikes were more engine than chassis, with sloping front ends and high hand grips. These two lacked safety harnesses, and their fairings were incomplete. Both were built for single pilots, but the saddle-like seats were long enough to accommodate passengers, assuming one was crazy enough to climb aboard. 
or assuming that one had a choice. Thorsh straddled the rustier of the pair and began to throw priming and ignition switches. Reluctantly, the swoop's engine shuddered to life, idling erratically at first but gradually smoothing out. We're juiced, he said. One of the bith perched behind Thorsh on the long seat. The shorter of his two comrades was appraising the saddle of the other swoop. Coordinates for the extraction point should be loaded in the Nava computer, Thorsh said, shouting to be heard above the throb of the repulsor lift engines. Coming up on the display now, the bith pilot said. Clearly, the third bith had grave misgivings about mounting the swoop, but his doubts disappeared when the coral skipper grazed the treetops, searching for signs of the escapees. Thorsh waited for the wedge-shaped assault craft to pass before saying, We're better off splitting up. We'll rendezvous at the rally point. Last one there, his passenger started to say, only to let his words trail off. The Bith pilot revved the swoop's engine. Let's hope for a tie. The game is effectively over, C-3PO told Han Solo. I suggest that you surrender the rest of your players now, rather than risk further humiliation. Surrender? Han jerked his thumb at the golden protocol droid. Who's he think he's talking to? Leia Organa Solo raised her brown eyes from the game table to glance at her husband. I have to admit, things do look pretty bad. C-3PO agreed. I'm afraid you can't win, Captain Solo. Han scratched his head absently and continued to study the playing field. That's not the first time someone's told me that. The three of them were seated at the circular degeric table in the forward hold of Millennium Falcon. The table was in fact a hologram projector with a checkered surface etched in concentric circles of green and gold. At the moment, it was displaying six hollow monster pieces, some legendary, some modeled after actual creatures, with names that sounded more like sneezes than words. Squatting on the graded portion of the compartment deck sat Cockmame and Miwal, Leia's Nogri protectors. Agile bipeds with hairless gray skin and pronounced cranial ridges, they were unnervingly predatory in appearance, but their loyalty to Leia knew no bounds. In the long war against the Yuzhan Vong, several Nogri had already given their lives to safeguard the woman they still sometimes referred to as Lady Vader. Don't tell me that you are actually contemplating a move, C-3PO said. Han looked at him askance. What do I look like I'm doing? Stargazing? But Captain Solo, quit rushing me, I tell you. Really, Threepio? Leia intervened in false sincerity. You have to give him time to think. But Princess Leia, the game timer is nearing the end of its cycle. Leia shrugged. You know how he is. Yes, Princess, I know how he is. Han glared at the two of them. What is this, some kind of tag-team match? C-3PO started. Certainly not. I'm merely... Remember, Han said, thrusting his finger out. It's not over till the hut squeals. C-3PO looked to Leia for explanation. The hut squeals? Han cupped his scarred chin in his hand and took in the board. Early on, he had lost a broad-shouldered Kintan strider to C-3PO's venomous corrugated chlor slug then a pincer-handed Nagak to the droid's lance-wielding Sakoran monarch. Han's quadrant of the board still showed a hunchbacked, knuckle-dragging, green-hided Mantellian savrip and a bulbous-bodied guck, but his alloy opponent had not only a claw-handed, trumpet-snouted Grimtash and a four-legged, sharp-toothed Haujix, but also two rainbow-skinned Alderanian Molotars waiting in the wings. Unless Han could do something to prevent it, C-3PO was going to send the Grim Tash to the board's center space and win the game. Then it hit him. A sinister laugh escaped his closed lips and his eyes sparkled. Leia regarded him for a moment. Uh-oh, 3PO. I don't like the sound of that laugh. Han shot her a look. Since when? 
I understand completely, Princess, C-3PO said on alert. But really, I don't see that there's anything he can do at this point. Han's fingers activated a series of control buttons built into the rim of the table. With Leia and C-3PO gazing intently at the board, the hulking Mantellian Savrip sidestepped to the left, took hold of the guck, Han's other remaining piece, and held the suddenly screeching creature high overhead. C-3PO might have blinked if he had eyes in place of photoreceptors. But you've attacked your own piece. He turned to Han. Captain Solo, if this is some kind of trick to distract me, or some attempt to instill compassion? Save your compassion for someone who needs it, Han cut in. Like it or not, that's my move. C-3PO watched the squealing, seemingly betrayed guck struggle in the Savrip's vice-like grip. Most infuriating creature, he said. Still, a victory is a victory. The droid lowered his hands to the control panel and commanded the grim Tash to advance to the center. But no sooner did the snouted creature take a step than Han's Savrip tightened his hold on the guck, squeezing the hapless thing so hard that hollow drops of the guck's much-prized skin oil began to drip onto the playing field, creating a virtual puddle. Tasked, C-3PO's grim tash continued to move forward, only to slip on the guck's skin oil and fall hard onto its back, cracking its triangular-shaped head on the checkered board and de-resolving. Ha! Han said, clapping his hands once, then rubbing them together in anticipation. Now who's losing? Oh, three PO, Leia said sympathetically, hiding a smile behind her hand. C three PO's photoreceptors were riveted to the board, but disbelief was evident in his response. What? What? Is that permitted? He looked up from the table. Princess Leia, that move can't possibly be legal. Han leaned forward, his eyebrows beetled. Show me where the rules say different. C-3PO stammered. Bending the rules is one thing, but this... This is a flagrant violation not only of the rules, but also of proper game etiquette. At the very least, you have performed a suspect move, and very likely a rogue one. Good choice of words, 3PO, Leia said. Han leaned away from the table, interlocking his hands behind his head and whistling a taunting melody. I suggest we allow Princess Leia to be the final judge, C-3PO said. Han made a sour face. Ah, you're just a sore loser. A sore loser? Why, I never... Admit it and I'll go easy on you for the rest of the game. C-3PO summoned as much indignation as his protocol programming allowed. You have my assurance that I've no need to emerge victorious from each engagement, whereas you, on the other hand... Han laughed sharply, startling the droid to silence. Threepio, if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. You always have to be ready for surprises. Pompous man, C-3PO said. When Cockmame and Mewal added their gravelly comments and guttural laughs to the merriment, he threw up his hands in a gesture of defeat. Oh, what's the use? Abruptly, a warning tone sounded from the engineering station across the hold. The Nogri shot to their feet, but Leia propelled herself from the Dejeric table's arc of padded bench and beat both of them to the communications display. Han watched expectantly from the game board. A surprise, he asked, when Leia turned from the displays. She shook her head. The signal we've been waiting for. Han rushed from the table and followed Leia into the starboard ring corridor, where he nearly tripped over a pair of knee-high boots he had left on the step. Early in his career as a smuggler, the Falcon had been the only home he knew, and now, this past year especially, it had become the only home Han and Leia knew. Whether in their living quarters or in the forward hold, personal items were strewn about, waiting to be picked up and put away. The mess was just that, in desperate need of cleaning, maybe even fumigating. And indeed, the dented and bruised exterior of the old freighter, with its mishmash of primers and fuse-welded borrowed parts, was beginning to resemble that of a house 
well-loved and lived in, but too long neglected. Hans slid to a halt, just short of the connector that accessed the cockpit and swung to the nogri. Cockmaim, get to the dorsal gun turret, and this time remember to lead your targets, even though I know it goes against your grain. Meanwhile, I'm going to need you here to help our packages get safely aboard. In the outrigger cockpit, with its claustrophobic surround of blinking instruments, Leia was already cinched into the co-pilot's chair, both hands busy activating the Falcon startup systems and console displays. Han slid into the pilot's seat, strapping in with one hand and throwing overhead toggles with the other. Can we locate them yet? They're on the move, Leia said, but I've got a fix on them. Han leaned over to study one of the display screens. Lock their coordinates into the tracking computer, and let's get the topographic sensors online. Leia swiveled to the comm board, her hands moving rapidly over the controls. Take her up, she said a moment later. Awakened from what amounted to a nap, the YT-1300's engines powered up. Han clamped his hands on the control yoke and lifted the ship out of its hiding place, an impact crater on the dark side of Selvaris's puny moon. He fed power to the sublight drives and steered a course around the misshapen orb. Green, blue, and white Selvaris filled the wraparound viewport. Han watched Leia out of the corner of his eye. Hope you remember to look both ways. Leia shut her eyes briefly. We're safe. Han smiled to himself. The Yuzhan Vaughn couldn't be sensed through the Force, but Leia had never had any problem sensing trouble. I just don't want to be accused of making any more illegal moves. She looked at him. Only daring ones. Han continued to watch her secretly. Through all the rough-and-tumble years, her face had not lost its noble beauty. Her skin was as flawless now as it had been when Han had first set eyes on her, in a detention cell of all places. Her long hair retained its sheen, her eyes their deep inviting warmth. Han and Leia had experienced some troubled months following Chewbacca's death, but she had waited him out, and wherever they traveled now, no matter how much danger they put themselves in, mostly at Han's instigation, they were completely at home with each other. To Han, each and every action felt right. He had no yearning to be anywhere but where he was, with his beloved partner. It was a sappy thought, he told himself, but undeniably true. As if reading his thoughts, Leia turned slightly in his direction, lifting her chin a bit to show him a dubious look. You're in a good mood for someone setting out on a dangerous rescue mission. Han made light of the moment. Beating 3PO at Dejeric has made a new man of me. Leia tilted her head. Not too new, I hope. She placed one hand atop his on the yoke, and with the other traced the raised scar on his chin. It's taken me thirty years to get used to the old you. Me too, he said, without humor. Exhaust ports ablaze, the Falcon rolled through a sweeping turn and raced for Selvaris's binary-brightened transitor. Chapter 3 Bent low over the swoop bike's high hand grips, Thorsh threaded the rocketing vessel through concentrations of saplings and opportunistic Yuzhan Vong plants, under looping vines and over the thick trunks of toppled trees. He hugged the fern-covered ground when and where he could, as much for safety's sake as to spare his spindly passenger any further torture from thorned vines, sharp twigs, and the easily disturbed hives of barb flies and other bloodsuckers. But Thorsh's best efforts weren't enough. When do we get to switch places? The Bith asked over the howl of the repulsor lift. Thorsh knew that the question had been asked in jest, and so replied in kind. Hands at your sides and no standing on the seat. Taking into account only the difference in heights, the Bith should have been the one in the saddle, with Thorsh scrunched down behind him, fingers clasped on the underside of the long seat. But Thorsh was the more experienced pilot. Having flown swoops on several reconnaissance missions where speeders hadn't been available, 
His large wedge-shaped feet weren't well suited to the foot pegs, and he had to extend his arms fully to grasp the hand grip controls, but his keen eyes more than made up for those shortcomings, even when streaming with tears as they were now. Thorsh kept to the thick of the large island, where the branches of the tallest trees intertwined overhead and provided cover. The swoop was still running smoothly, except when he leaned it hard to the right, which, for some reason, caused the repulsor lift to sputter and strain. He could hear the other swoop, to the east and somewhat behind him, weaving a path through equally dense growth. The four escapees would have made better progress out over the estuary, but without the tree cover they would be easy prey for coral skippers. One skip had already completed to return passes, paying out plasma missiles at random and hoping for a lucky strike. The morning air was thick with the smell of burning foliage. Flat out, the swoop tore from the underbrush into a treeless expanse of salt flats, pink and blinding white, the nighttime sleeping grounds for flocks of Selvaris's long-legged wading birds. Determined to reach cover before the coral skipper showed up again, Thorsh gave the accelerator a hard twist and banked the swoop for the nearest stand of trees. Thorsh had just re-entered the jungle when a clamor began to build in the canopy. His first thought was that another coral skipper had joined the pursuit. But there was a different quality to the sound, an eagerness absent in the deadly sibilance of a coral skipper. Thorsh felt his rider sit up straight around the seat, in defiance of the hazards posed by overhanging branches. "'Is that what I think it is?' the humanoid asked. "'We'll know soon enough,' Thorsh yelled back. Again he twisted the accelerator. Wind screamed over the swoop's inadequate fairing, forcing another flood of tears from his eyes. But his actions were in vain. The objects responsible for the escalating tumult passed directly overhead, silencing the racket of the swoop, then outracing it. Lav Peck! the Bith screamed. Thorsh knew the term. It was the Yuzhan Vong name for netting beetles, voracious and meticulous versions of the winged sentinels that had roused the prison guards. Lav Peck were capable of creating webs between trees, bushes, or just about any type of barked foliage. Typically the beetles arrived in successive fronts, the first fashioning anchor lines, and those that followed feeding on bark and other organics to replenish the fibers needed to complete the filigree. A well-constructed web could ensnare or at least slow down a human-sized being. The strands themselves were tenaciously sticky, though not as adhesive as the enemy's blorash jelly. The Biff's hunch was verified as the swoop raced through the vanguard wave of the swarm. Within seconds, the down-sloping front cowling was spattered with smashed beetle corpses. Thorsh plucked several from his fur-covered forehead and threw them aside. Just ahead, thousands of lav peck were plummeting into the jungle, tearing through the leafy canopy like hailstones. Thorsh ground his teeth and lowered his head. As strong as the strands were, they were no match for a swoop in the right hands. Fifty meters away, the first web was already taking shape. Thorsh squinted in misgiving. More tightly woven than any he had seen on other worlds, the web actually obscured the trees. It took only a moment to realize that Salvaris's species of netting beetle was special. While half the swarm was flying horizontally at various levels, the other half was flying in vertical rows. The result was a warp and weft weave, a veritable curtain that, for all Thorsh knew, could snare the swoop as easily as a spider web might a nightfly. Extending his legs behind him, he flattened himself over the surging engine. With a distressed cry, the Bith followed suit, pressing himself to Thorsh's back. Thorsh cranked the accelerator for all it was worth, aiming for what he thought might be an area of relatively few trees. The swoop ripped through the webs at better than two hundred kilometers per hour, each successive curtain parting with loud cleaving sounds that sometimes resembled screams. Rear guard beetles struck the cowling with the force of malleable bullets, and the bith yelped in pain time and again. The swoop wobbled, and the repulsor lift began to howl in protest. Thorsh fought to hold on to the hand grips as they were yanked from side to side by the viscous strands. He risked an ascent, only to learn the hard way that the situation was even more perilous in the upper reaches of the trees, 
where the branches fanned out and the leaves were home to clouds of insatiable needle flyers. Refusing to give a centimeter, he demanded every last bit of power from the struggling machine. Then, all at once, the swoop tore through the final web. Sticky strands cooked on the superheated engine, sending out an acrid smell. Thorsh coughed strands from his throat and pawed others away from his stinging eyes. He brought the swoop to a halt just long enough to clear the exhaust ports and fan housing. His swearing passenger might have been wearing a long white wig. Thorsh had his right hand back on the accelerator when a pained shriek erupted from the jungle, punctuating the cacophony of bird calls. He heard a familiar roar, and not a moment later, the second swoop bobbed into view, bearing only the pilot. The nets got him, the Bith pilot shouted over the irregular throb of a choked engine. He twisted the accelerator to keep the swoop idling. I'm going back for him. Thorsh spit web from his mouth and scowled. Don't be a fool. He's alive. Better that you are. Thorsh interrupted. He jerked his bearded chin to the west. The estuary. Get going. Thorsh spurred the swoop through a quick circle and darted off into the trees, the biff hanging on to what was left of the Janet's flight jacket. Punching through the dense jungle that grew along the shore of the island, they found themselves back in the blinding light of Selvaris's double suns. Coaxing more speed from the rapidly failing engine, pilot and passenger leaned the swoop through a sweeping turn that carried them out over brackish water, inky with organics leached from the trees. They soared at top speed a few meters above the calm surface, racing past narrow meandering channels of pellucid fresh water, bubbled up from the planet's underground, and teeming with brilliantly colored fish. From the far shore came the urgent woofing and snarling of bissop hounds, galloping through swamps and across berms of scalpel grass. The harsh barks were accompanied by the war cries of Yuzhan Vong chase teams running behind the pack. Thorsh banked just in time to avoid a horde of thud and razor bugs that whirled out of the trees, passing within centimeters of the swoop and tearing into the opposite shoreline. Drawn by the commotion, schools of sharp-toothed predators, showing multi-finned backs and serrated tails, leapt from the water to gorge on the airborne weapon bugs. Wide-winged raptors with huge wingspans left the fungus-filled cavities of dying trees to glide down and grab whatever bugs the aquatic behemoths missed. Thorsh pulled at the hand grips and sent the swoop into a steep climb. The saline water grew more agitated beneath them as the mouth of the estuary came into view, a line of white where curling waves broke against the marshy shore. Hundreds of white-cliffed islets, straight as towers and draped with vegetation, rose from out of the aquamarine ocean. On the horizon, a volcano mounded from the water, great clouds of smoke billowing from its crater and bleeding a thick river of lava that turned part of the sea to steam. Thorsh scanned the otherwise clear sky for signs of the coral skipper. A kilometer away to the east, the other swoop was paralleling him. Gaining altitude, the two machines sped out over the breaking waves, making for the narrow channel that separated the islets closest to shore. Heads up, the Bith said into Thorsh's right ear. His long-fingered hand shot out, indicating an object in the western sky. Thorsh tracked it and nodded, muttering a curse. The Yuzhan Vong called it a Sikvai. Reminiscent of a seabird, it was an atmospheric search craft, its neck sac inflated and bright red as a signal to other craft in the area. Powered by a gravity-sensitive Dovin basil, the monstrosity had a transparent blister cockpit, flexible wings, and gill analogs that made it whine in flight. Thorsh threw his weight against the hand grips and leaned hard against the steering auxiliaries, slewing the swoop toward the closest island, intent on keeping as close to the white cliffs as he dared. The sick vi was not unnerved. It dived for its small prey, whining and releasing several thin, cable-like grasping tendrils. Thorst dropped back to the turbulent surface, swerved, and cut across the channel for the neighboring islet, running full out, a meter above the waves. The search craft was following him down, prepared to make another grab, when something nailed it from behind. 
Thorsh and Bith watched in bafflement as the Sikvi veered off course, one wing blown off, and spiraled out of control. It struck the sea with a loud splash, skipped twice on the waves, then crashed nose first and began to sink. Out of the eastern sky, dazzled by sunlight, something large and dull black was approaching at supersonic speed. Another Yuzhan Vong vessel, Thorsh decided, whose pilot had just shot down one of his own craft to get to the swoop. Twitching the braking thrusters, he spun the swoop around in midair, hoping to race away from the mystery vessel before it could draw a bead on him. Even so, he waited for the fireballs to start falling. When they didn't, he glanced over his shoulder in time to see a twin-mandibled old freighter come streaking out of the cloudless sky. Thorsh felt crackling heat wash over him as the ship made a low, ear-splitting, teeth-rattling pass, its dorsal laser cannon loosing green hyphens of energy at a trio of pursuing coral skippers. The freighter signaled the swoops with a rocking motion, then banked into a long, sweeping turn to the south. Looks like our ride's here, Thorsh said, and in worse trouble than we are. A flurry of well-placed bursts from the freighter's top gunner caught the lead coral skipper head-on and sent it boiling into the sea. The other two enemy craft continued to pummel the freighter with plasma missiles. Perhaps frustrated by the ship's seemingly impenetrable shields, one of the skip pilots took aim on the Bith-piloted swoop. Caught in midair by a single lava-hot projectile, the machine disappeared without a trace. Thorsh clenched his jaws and steered the swoop for deeper water. The swoop was grazing the white crests of five-meter waves when something enormous rose from beneath the heaving surface. Cockmaid's getting to be a pretty good shot, Hans said over the sound of reciprocating quad-laser cannon. Remind me to up his pay, or at least promote him. Leia glanced at him from the co-pilot's chair. From bodyguard to what? Butler? Han pictured the Nogri in formal attire, setting meals in front of Han and Leia in the Falcon's forward cabin. His upper lip curled in delight, and he laughed shortly. Maybe we should see how he does with the rest of these skips. The YT-1300 was just coming out of her long turn, with Selvaris's double suns off to starboard and an active volcano dominating the forward view. Below, green-capped, sheer-sided islands reached up into the planet's deep blue sky, and the aquamarine sea seemed to go on forever. Two coral skippers were still glued to the falcon's tail, chopping at it and holding position through all the insane turns and evasions, but so far the deflector shields were holding. His large hands gripped on the control yoke. Han glanced at the console's locator display, where only one bezel was pulsing. Where'd the other swoop go? We lost it, Leia said. Han leaned toward the viewport to survey the undulating sea. How could we lose? No, I mean it's gone. One of the coral skippers took it out. Han's eyes blazed. Why that? Which one of them? Before Leia could answer, two plasma missiles streaked past the cockpit, bright as meteors and barely missing the starboard mandible. Does it matter? Han shook his head. Where's the other swoop? Leia studied the locator display, then called up a map from the terrain sensor, which showed everything from the mouth of the estuary clear to the volcano. Her left forefinger tapped the screen. Far side of that island. And he skips after it? A loud explosion buffeted the falcon from behind. We seem to be the popular target, Leia said, just the way you like it. Han narrowed his eyes. You bet I do. Determined to lure their pair of pursuers away from the swoop, he threw the freighter into a sudden ascent. When they had climbed halfway to the stars, he dropped the ship into a stomach-churning corkscrew. Pulling out sharply, he twisted the ship through a looping rollover, emerging from the combo headed in the opposite direction with the two coral skippers in front of him. He grinned at Leia. Now who's in charge? She blew out her breath. Was there ever any doubt? Han focused his attention on the two enemy craft. Over the long years, Yuzhan Vong pilots faced with impossible odds had surrendered some of the suicidal resolve they had displayed during the early days of the war. Maybe word had come down from Supreme Overlord Shimra or someone that discretion really was the better part of valor.
Whatever the case, the pilots of the two skips Han was stalking apparently saw some advantage to fleeing rather than re-engaging the ship their plasma missiles had failed to bring down. But Han wasn't content to send them home with their tails tucked between their legs, especially not after they had killed an unarmed swoop pilot he had come halfway across the galaxy to rescue. Cockmain, listen up, he said into his headset mic. I'll fire the belly gun from here. We'll put him in the money lane and be done with them. Money lane was Han's term for the area where the quad lasers' firing fields overlapped. In emergency situations, both cannons could be fired from the cockpit, but the present situation didn't call for that. What's more, Han wanted to give Cockmain the chance to hone his firing technique. All Han and Leia had to do was help line up the shots. From the way the coral skippers reacted to the Falcon's sudden turnabout, Han could almost believe that the enemy pilots had been eavesdropping on his communication with the Nogri. The first skip, the more battered of the pair, showing charred blotches and deep pockmarks, poured on all speed, separating from his wingmate at a sharp angle. Smaller and faster, and seemingly helmed by a better pilot, the second skip shed velocity in an attempt to trick the Falcon into coming across his vector. That was the skip that had taken off the swoop, Han decided, sentencing the pilot to be the first to feel the Falcon's wrath. Leia guessed as much and immediately plotted an intercept course. Exposed, the skip pilot went evasive, moving into the gun sights and out again, but with mounting panic as the Falcon settled calmly into kill position. The dorsal laser cannon was programmed to fire three beam bursts that, all these years later, still had the ability to outwit the Dovin basils of the older, perhaps more dim-witted coral skippers. While the enemy craft was quick to deploy a gravitic anomaly that engulfed the first and second beams, the third got through, blowing a huge chunk of Yorick coral from the vessel's fantail. Han tweaked the yoke to place the skip in the money lane, and his left hand tightened on the trigger of the belly gun's remote firing mechanism. Sustained bursts from the twin cannons whittled the skip to half its size. Then it blew, throwing pieces of coral wreckage in every direction. That's for the swoop pilot, Han said soberly. He turned his attention to the second skip, which, desperate to avoid a similar fate, was jinking and juking all over the sky. Zipping through the showering remains of the first kill, the Falcon quickened up and pounced on the wildly maneuvering skip from above. The targeting reticle went red, and a target lock tone filled the cockpit. Again the quad lasers rallied, catching the vessel with burst after burst, until it disappeared in a nimbus of coral dust and white-hot gas. Han and Leia hooted. Nice shooting, cock mame, he said into the headset. Score two more for the good guys. Leia watched him for a moment. Happy now? Instead of replying, Han pushed the yoke away from him, dropping the falcon to within meters of the surging waves. Where's the swoop? he asked finally. Leia was ready with the answer. Come around sixty degrees, and it should be right in front of us. Han adjusted course, and the swoop came into view, streaking over the surface, bearing two seriously dissimilar riders. In pursuit, and just visible beneath the surface, moved an enormous olive drab triangle, trailing what appeared to be a lengthy tail. Han's jaw dropped. What is that thing? Leia said. Thrapio, get in here! Han yelled, without taking his eyes from the creature. C-3PO staggered into the cockpit, clamping his hands on the high-backed navigator's chair to keep from being thrown off balance, as had too often happened. Han raised his right hand to the viewport and pointed. What is that? he asked, enunciating every word. Oh my, the droid began. I believe that what we're looking at is a kind of boat creature. The Yuzhan Vong term for it is Van Gogh, which derives from the verb to submerge. Although in this case, the verb has been modified to suggest, skip the language lesson and just tell me how to kill it. Well, I would suggest targeting the flat dome, clearly visible on its dorsal surface. A headshot. Precisely, a headshot. Han, Leia interrupted, four more coral skippers headed our way. Han manipulated levers on the console, and the Falcon accelerated. We gotta work fast. Threepio. 
Tell Meewal to activate the manual release for the landing ramp. I'll be there in a flash. Leia watched him undo the clasps of the crash wedding. I take it you're not planning to land. He kissed her on the cheek as he stood up. Not if I can help it. The swoop fought to maintain an altitude of eight meters, but that was enough to keep it from the snapping jaws of the Yuzhan Vong Van Gogh that had almost snagged it on surfacing. Thorsh might have opted to head inland if the Yuzhan Vong search parties and their snarling beasts hadn't reached the marshy shore. Worse, four specks in the northern sky were almost certainly coral skippers, soaring in to reinforce the pair the YT-1300 was chasing. Instead, the Genet had the swoop aimed for deeper water out toward the volcano where the waves mounted to a height of ten meters. Thorsh and his rider could feel the sting of the saline spray on their scratched and bruised faces and hands. Behind them, the Van Gogh was rapidly closing the gap, but if it had weapons other than torpedo analogs, it wasn't bringing them to bear. An unsettling vociferation from the Bith broke Thorsh's concentration. The Van Gogh's gone. It's emerged. Thorsh didn't know whether to worry or celebrate. The Van Gogh put a quick end to his indecision. Breaching the surface in front of the swoop, the dull olive triangle spiked straight up out of the waves, venting seawater from blowholes on its dorsal side and opening its tooth-filled mouth. Thorsh demanded all he could from the swoop, climbing at maximum boost, but there was no escaping the reach of the creature. He heard a surprised scream, then felt his flight jacket rip away. Lightened, the swoop ascended at greater speed, only to stall. Thorsh threw a distraught glance over his shoulder. The bith was pinned between the Van Gogh's teeth, mouth wide in a silent scream, black eyes dull, Thorsh's jacket still clutched in his dexterous hands. But there wasn't time for despair or anger. The repulsor lift came back to life, and Thorsh veered away even as he was falling. A roar battered his eardrums, and suddenly the YT-1300 was practically alongside him, skimming the waves not fifty meters away. The quartet of coral skippers began firing from extreme range, their plasma projectiles cutting scalding trails through the white-capped crests. The old freighter's landing ramp was lowered from the starboard docking arm. It was clear what the ship's pilots had in mind. They were expecting him to come alongside and hurl himself onto the narrow incline. But Thorsh faltered. He knew the limitations of the swoop and, more important, his own. With the coral skippers approaching and the Van Gogh submerged who knew where beneath the waves, it was unlikely that he could even reach the freighter in time. Additionally, and despite what were obviously military-grade deflector shields, the freighter was being forced to make slight vertical and horizontal adjustments, which only decreased Thorsh's chances of clamoring aboard. His grimace disappeared, and in its place came a look of sharp attentiveness. As sole bearer of the secret intelligence contained in the hollow wafer, he had to give it his best try. Tightening his grip, he banked for the sanctuary of the Matt Black ship. Crouched at the top of the extended ramp, Han peered down at the rushing water not twenty meters below. Wind and salt spray howled through the opening, blowing his hair every which way and making it difficult for him to keep his eyes open. Captain Solo, C-3PO said from the ring corridor, Princess Leia wishes you to know that the swoop is approaching. Apparently the pilot feels confident that he can complete the transfer to Millennium Falcon without suffering too much internal damage or perishing in the attempt. Han threw the droid a wide-eyed look. Perishing? Certainly the odds are against him. If he were piloting a speeder bike, perhaps. But swoops are notorious for going out of control at the slightest provocation. Han nodded grimly. A former swoop racer, he knew that C-3PO was right. Taking in the situation now, he wondered if even he could make the jump. I'm going to the bottom, he shouted. C-3PO canted his golden head. Sir? Han made a downward motion. The bottom of the ramp. Sir, I have a bad feeling. The wind drowned out the rest of the droid's words. Han crabbed down to the base of the ramp, where he could hear the falcon's belly turret slicing through the agitated peaks of the waves. 
a distinctive throbbing sound captured his attention. The swoop was beginning to angle for the ramp. The pilot, a genet of all species, took his right hand off the hand grips just long enough to signal Han with a wave. Considering that even that slight movement sent the swoop into a wobble, there was simply no way the genet would be able to let go completely, especially not with the falcon adding to the turbulence of the sea itself. Han reconsidered, then swung around to see 3 po 3 po tell Leia we're going with Plan B. The droid raised his hands to his head in distress. Captain Solo, just the sound of that makes me worry. Han raised his forefinger. Just tell Leia, 3 po she'll understand. Plan B? That was precisely my reaction, C-3PO said in an agitated voice. But does anyone ever listen to my concerns? Don't worry, 3 po I'm sure Han knows what he's doing. That is hardly a comforting thought, Princess. Leia swung back to the console and allowed her eyes to roam over the instruments. Plan B, she mused. What can Han have in mind? She placed him squarely in her thoughts, then smiled in sudden revelation. Of course. Her hands slid switches while she studied the displays. Then she sat away from the console in contemplation. Yes, she decided at last, she supposed it could be done though it would mean relying largely on the attitude and braking thrusters and hoping that they didn't stall or fail. She looked over her shoulder at C-3PO, who had evidently followed her every move and manipulation. Tell Han I've got everything worked out. Oh, dear, the droid said, turning and exiting the cockpit. Oh, dear. The four coral skippers were closing fast, lobbing plasma missiles into the blustery stretch of water between the swoop and the freighter. Thorsh dipped his head instinctively as one fireball plunged into the waves not ten meters away. The ferocity of the impact geysered superheated water high into the air and sent the swoop into a sustained wobble. The freighter held to its course regardless, its top gunner keeping the coral skippers at bay with bursts of laser fire. A human male was crouched at the base of the landing ramp, his left arm wrapped around one of the telescoping hydraulic struts, and the fingers of his right hand making a gesture that on some worlds implied craziness on the part of its recipient. Just now, the twirling gesture meant something else entirely, though craziness was still a large part of it. Thorsh swallowed hard, just thinking about what the pilots were about to attempt. The human waved and scurried back up the ramp. Decelerating slightly, Thorsh fell in behind the freighter, giving it wide berth. Above the strained throbbing of the swoop's repulsor lift, he heard the sudden reverberation of the YT-1300's retro and attitude thrusters. Then, scarcely surrendering momentum, the freighter began to rotate 90 degrees to starboard, bringing the boarding ramp almost directly in front of the tottering swoop. "'Take the jump,' Han said, mostly to himself. "'Now!' He was back in the pilot's chair, his hands tight on the control yoke, when Leia feathered the thrusters, cheating the Falcon through its quarter turn. Flying sideways, Han could see the coral skippers that had a second earlier been behind the ship, as well as the swoop, which was flying just off the blunt tip of the starboard docking arm. Hoping to minimize the chances of the pilots overshooting his mark and smashing headlong into the bulkhead at the top of the ramp, Han adjusted the Falcon's forward speed to match that of the swoop. He's accelerating, Leia said. 3PO, me wall, Han yelled over his right shoulder. Our guest's coming aboard. Glancing out the right side of the viewport, he saw the genet leap the swoop toward the ramp, the Falcon's narrow but open mouth. Now, he told Leia. Deftly, she fed power to the attitude thrusters, allowing the ship to complete a full clockwise rotation, even as a series of crashing sounds were echoing their way into the cockpit from the ring corridor. Han winced and scrunched his shoulders with each clang and crash, mentally assessing the damage, but keeping his fingers crossed that the Janet pilot was faring better than the interior of the docking arm. No sooner did the ramp telltale on the console flash red, indicating that the docking arm had sealed tight, than Han yanked back on the control yoke, and the Falcon clawed its way into Selvaris's open sky, dodging volleys of molten fire from pursuing coral skippers. 
the quad laser replied with packets of cohesive light, brilliant green, even against the backdrop of the heaving sea. Captain Solo, he's alive, C-3PO called with dramatic relief. We're all alive. Exhaling slowly, Han sank back into the seat, but without lifting his hands from the yoke. The coral skippers were already lagging behind when the falcon rocketed over the summit of the volcano, straight through dense clouds of gritty smoke, climbing rapidly on a column of blue energy. The ship was halfway to starlight when the shaken Janet appeared at the cockpit hatchway, one bare arm draped over Miwal's shoulders, the other around C-3PO's. "'You must have a hard head,' Han said. Grinning faintly, Leia looked at her husband. He's not the only one. Han glanced at her in false chagrin, then nodded his chin to the female Nogri. Take our guest to the forward cabin and provide him with whatever he needs. I'll get the med pack, Leia said, leaving her chair. She set her headset on the console and looked at Han again. Well, you did it. We, Han amended. Casually, he stretched out his arms. You know, you're never too old for this sort of thing. You haven't outgrown it, that's for sure. He studied her. What, you have? She placed her right hand on his cheek. You're a danger to yourself and everyone around you. But I do love you, Han. He smiled broadly as Leia hurried from the cockpit. Chapter 4 in a leafy bower that supplied the only pool of shade in the prison yard, Yuzhan Vong commander Malik Kar permitted himself to be fanned by two reptoid chazrak whose coral seed implants bulged from their foreheads. Exceedingly tall and thinner than most of his peers, Kar wore a bone-white skirt and patterned headcloth, the tassels of which were braided into his long hair, forming a tail that reached his waist. His glory days as a warrior were evidenced by the tattoos and scarifications that adorned his face and torso, though the most recent of them revealed for all to see that he had once held a more lofty rank. Even so, the prison guards were unfailing in the deference they showed him out of respect for his steadfast devotion to the warrior caste and to Yun Yamka, the god of war. Moving briskly and in anger, Subaltern Sito approached the bower and snapped his fists to the opposite shoulders in salute. Commander, the prisoners are awakening. Carr looked over to the center of the yard, where Major Kraken, Captain Page, and some fifty other officers sat on their haunches, their hands secured behind them to wooden stakes that had been driven into the soft ground. Indeed, eyelids were fluttering. Heads were nodding and swaying, lips were smacking in thirst. Selvaris's sons were almost directly overhead, and heat rose from the glaring sand in shimmering waves. Sweat had plastered the prisoners' soiled clothing to their scrawny bodies. It fell in fat drops from unshaved faces and matted fur. Carr pushed himself upright and stepped into the unforgiving light. Sieto and a dozen warriors flanking him as he crossed the yard and stood with his hands on his hips in front of Kraken and Page. A priest joined him there, black head to toe with dried blood. Carr refrained from speaking until he was satisfied that the two prisoners were attentive and aware of their circumstance. I trust you enjoyed your naps, he began. But look how long you've slept. He raised his face to the sky, pressing the inner edge of his right hand to his sloping forehead. It is already midday. He clasped his hands behind him and paced in front of the prisoners. As soon as our sentinel beetles alerted us to the fact that some of you were outside the walls, I ordered that census slugs be placed in all dormitories. It is never an agreeable experience to awaken from their sleep-inducing exhalations, the headaches, the nausea, the irritated nasal membranes. But I take some comfort in assuming that each of you luxuriated in pleasant dreams. Stopping in front of Bearded Page, he allowed some of his anger to show. There will come a time when even your dreams won't provide you with escape. 
and you will look back on your days here as blissful. On first learning of the pre-dawn escape, Carr had nearly hung a ticken around his neck and prodded the living garrot to choke off his life. It was because of his failure at Fondor more than three years earlier that he had been demoted to the rank of commander and placed in charge of a prisoner of war camp at the remote edge of the invasion corridor. Worse, on distant Yuzhan Tar, his former peers, Nas Choka, Eminence Harar, Noma Nor, had been escalated and made members of Supreme Overlord Shimra's court. The prospect of further indignity had filled Carr with such self-loathing that he wasn't sure he could go on. Ultimately, however, he decided that if he was careful, and if he could keep War Master Nas Choka from hearing of the escape, or at the very least maintain that it was part of his plan to obtain information on local resistance groups, he might yet be released from the prison fate had fashioned for him. Toward that end, he had been relieved to learn that the search parties he had dispatched had been partially successful. Two escapees had been killed, and a third had been captured. But a fourth had been whisked off-world by an enemy gunship. Carr turned to Sieto. Fetch the prisoner. Sieto and two other warriors saluted and rushed off to the front gate. When they returned a moment later, they were dragging behind them a near-naked Bith, who, from the look of him, had fallen victim to a lav-pack web. It pleased Carr no end to see expressions of surprised dismay flare on the faces of Page, Kraken, and the rest. Even when those expressions were quickly transformed to scowls of hatred for the warriors who dropped the captive unceremoniously onto his face in the sand. Carr stood over the Bith, whose hairless cranium was scratched and bleeding, and whose arms and legs were shackled. This one, Carr began, along with three others who failed to survive. Deliberately, he let his words trail off, if only to observe the effect of the lie on the assembled prisoners. Well, he started again. It's a pity, isn't it? So much effort expended for so little gain. Still, I can't help but be impressed. A well-engineered escape tunnel, carefully concealed flying machines. It's almost enough to make me forget what cowards you were for allowing yourselves to be captured in the first place. He caught Page's eye and returned the stocky captain's glower. You sicken me. You bring your spouses, your mates, your spawn with you into battle. You yield rather than fight to the last. You are crippled, yet you display no shame. You persist, but without clear purpose. He gestured to the Bith. At least this one showed that he still retains some shred of courage. Carr began to pace again. But I admit to a certain curiosity. From what I know of the Bith species, he probably could have sustained himself in the jungle subsisting on the natural foodstuffs I have permitted to be brought inside these walls. The question is, why would he choose to endanger the rest of you by his show of disobedience? It can only be that all of you conspired in his escape, perhaps to deliver a message of some import. Was such the case here? Carr waved his hand in dismissal. We'll return to that shortly. Beforehand, those who were truly responsible must be punished. He looked hard at Kraken and Page, then swung to Sieto. Subaltern, order your warriors to form two rows, the smaller in one row, the taller in the other. Sieto relayed the order in Yuzhan Vong, and the warriors obeyed. Now, Carr continued, the smaller warriors will execute the larger. Sieto saluted, then nodded gravely to the warriors. Those sentenced neither protested nor defended themselves as they were run through with kufis or struck with amphistaffs. One by one, they collapsed, their black blood draining into the sand. Tongue-like ungdins oozed from niches in the Yorick coral walls to sop up what the porous ground didn't absorb. Carr waited for the creatures to finish their work before striding over to the bith and lowering himself to one knee. 
after the act of courage you displayed. It would pain me to condemn you to an artless death. Why not escalate yourself in the last moments of your life by telling me why you tried to escape? Don't force me to extract the truth from you. Go ahead, Clockdor, Posh Kraken said. Tell them what you know. He was following orders, Page added, gazing at Carr. If you want to punish someone, punish us. Carr almost grinned. In due time, Captain, but I suspect that if you know what this one knows, you would have been the one to escape. He walked back to the bower. From beneath the seat, he pulled out the ticken he had nearly draped over his own neck that morning. Carrying the thick-bodied biote to the bith, he arranged it around the prisoner's thin neck. This is a ticken, he explained for the benefit of the captives. Normally, it is a docile creature. When provoked, however, it registers its displeasure by coiling itself around the object on which it rests. Allow me to demonstrate. Carr prodded the ticken with his sharp forefinger. Page and the others cursed and struggled in vain against their bindings. The Bith began to gasp for air. Carr watched dispassionately. Unfortunately, the ticken cannot be persuaded to relax its grip once it has begun to contract. It has to be killed. Again he kneeled alongside the Bith. Tell me why you were so desperate to leave this wonderful home we've provided for you. Recite the information you carry. The Bith cocked his head to the side and spat at Carr. Not unexpected, Carr said, wiping his face. Again he prodded the ticken, which contracted its body. The Bith's black eyes bulged, his wrinkled face and dome of a head turned color. I will gladly kill the ticken if you tell me what I wish to know. The Bith crawled forward, then flopped on the sand like a fish out of water. Carr poked the ticken a third time. A rasp issued from the Bith's throat. Then he began to recite a formulaic series of numbers. Interested suddenly, Carr bent down to place his ear next to the Bith's lips. He glanced up at the priest. What is this? A calculation of some sort. A mathematical equation, perhaps. There it is, Page shouted. He told you. Now kill that blasted thing before it's too late. Carr firmed his scarred lips. Yes, he's telling me something. But what? The Bith repeated the formula. Is it a code? Carr asked him. Listen to your commanders. You've already been a hero. You've no further need to prove your dedication. All color drained from the Bith's head, and a prolonged rattle escaped his puckered mouth. Carr shook his head back and forth, as if in sadness. He drew a kufi from the belt that cinched his skirt and plunged it into the ticken, which straightened briefly then died. Standing up, he looked directly at Page. Your comrade appears to have taken your secret to his grave. Page had murder in his eye, but Carr only shrugged and turned to Shito. Escort the prisoners to the immolation pit, where we incinerated their infernal machines. Fill it to the top and make certain that they remain inside until midday tomorrow. We'll let Salvaris's sons sort out which of them are worthy of continued life. A brigade of guards hurried into the yard. Carr waited in the shade for the prisoners to be hoisted to their feet. Then he followed the procession through the prison gate to the pit where the dozens of droids had been slagged. Subaltern, it's obvious that our captives had help engineering the escape. Carr said, Take a complement of warriors and execute everyone in the surrounding villages. Sieto saluted and trotted back through the bone gate. Captain Page insisted on being the first to walk the wooden plank that extended out over the deep hole. A moment, Captain, Carr said from the edge of the pit. I offer you a final chance to pass this night on a bed of leaves rather than atop the skeletons of your droids. Page snorted. I'd sooner die. Carr nodded pensively. You'll die soon enough in any case. Without another word, Page dropped into darkness. Carr turned away from the pit and set out for his grashel. A code, he told himself. 
He was certain of that much, but deciphered what information would it reveal. He gazed at the blinding sky, wondering where the rescue ship was bound. Chapter 5 Proximity alarms hooted insistently in the cockpit of the Millennium Falcon. Irritated by the distraction, Han muted the speakers, while Leia concentrated on making certain that the ship steered clear of the cause of the alarms. Seismics? Han asked. Leia shook her head. Hapen pulse gravity interdiction mines. The latest thing. Seen through the curved viewport, the explosive devices might have been asteroids basking in starlight. The Falcon scanners had said differently, though they had only reinforced Han and Leia's initial hunch. Beyond the rocky field appeared the bright side of a brown and blue world, circled by satellites and gifted with two fair-sized moons. Yes, you can't be too careful nowadays, Han said. Especially this close to the Perlemian trade route, Leia added. Han pointed to an orbital facility of spherical modules and multiple docks, the shipyard. It looks abandoned. Deliberately would be my guess. Weaving a sinuous path through the minefield, they maneuvered the Falcon closer to the planet. The freighter was midway between the moons when a voice issued from the comm. Millennium Falcon, this is Contrum Control. On behalf of General Aaron Kraken and the rest of the command staff, allow me to be the first to welcome you. Contrum was the home world of Aaron Kraken and his equally illustrious son, Posh an industrious planet with ore-smelting plants and a modest shipbuilding franchise, it was often touted as being the most core-like world outside the core. In a class with Ariadu, though not nearly as ecologically devastated, certainly there was no planet in this part of the mid-rim to rival it. The fact that it had thus far escaped enemy attention was nothing short of marvelous that Khan Trum had continued at its own peril to contribute generously to the war effort, had rendered the planet a model of courage and sacrifice. Sirs, General Kraken is eager to know if you were successful in retrieving any of our lost merchandise. Leia answered for them. Tell the General we're returning with only one of four that were originally available for pickup. Two were lost and there is reason to believe that one may have ended up back at its point of origin. We're very sorry to hear that, Princess. That makes it unanimous, Han said. Millennium Falcon is cleared for entry. Would you care to have us take you in, Captain? I'd rather fly, if it's all the same to you. Of course, sir. Routing and landing coordinates are being transmitted to your navigation computer. Han and Leia watched the flight data come on screen, then Leia enlarged the routing map. Han laughed shortly. Figures. Can't be too careful. Han adjusted the Falcon's course. Outside of a few harmless-looking ships, lazing in stationary orbit, local space was almost free of traffic. Instead of bearing straight for the planet's heavily populated equatorial band, he banked the freighter for Contrum's innermost moon, a silver sphere dimpled with impact craters and crusty with mountain ranges. The large crater just to starboard, Leia said. Han tapped the control yoke. Got it. There was nothing to mark the crater as a berthing space, nothing to mark the moon as a military base. Han lowered the falcon toward the crater, close to its upthrust eastern rim. Leia shook her head in wonder. You could almost believe it's empty. Holla projection masking a magnetic containment field, Han said. That technique hasn't been used in a long time. She nodded sadly. There hasn't been need for it. The falcon passed through what appeared to be the rocky floor of the crater and into an enormous hollow below, ultimately settling down on a hexagonal landing platform emblazoned with well-worn markings and numerals. The interior of the hidden base hummed with activity. A nearby transport bore the name Twelve Ton after a beast of burden indigenous to Contrum. Han recalled that the sleekly designed destroyers, once produced by the now-abandoned shipyard, had typically been given virtuous-sounding names, temperance, prudence, equity. 
It took several minutes to get the Falcon shut down. Leia asked Cockmame and Miwal to remain aboard with C-3PO, who took the request as a personal affront. Then she, Han, and Thorsh, the Jennet they had rescued, headed for the landing ramp. At the top, Han paused briefly to assess the minor damage done by the swoop, which had been jettisoned above Selvaris shortly before the Falcon had made the jump to light speed. An escort detail was waiting for them on the landing platform. Security personnel, metatechs, and a medical droid, and a sturdy, dark-complected young woman who introduced herself as General Kraken's adjutant. The metatechs quickly surrounded Thorsh, inspecting his limbs, gently palpating his torso, and examining his vaguely leonine head. "'You look like you were dragged through a field of thorns,' one said." Thorsh sniffed in sardonic derision. More like propelled. But thanks for noticing. We did what we could for him, Leia said. The same metatech glanced at her. Any battlefield medic would be proud to have done as much. The droid finished its scans with a concluding melody of chitters and tones. Malnourished but otherwise fit, it announced in a deep voice. Major Amar, Kraken's adjutant, nodded in approval. I don't see any reason why we can't proceed directly to debriefing. Han turned to Thorsh and smirked. Good job, Thorsh. We'll buy you lunch some other time. Thorsh shrugged. We all play our parts. I go where I'm sent, I do what I'm told. And the rest of us are the better for it, Leia said. She put her hand on Thorsh's bristly shoulder. I can't begin to guess at what you're carrying, but it must be vitally important. Thorsh shrugged again. I wish I could say. Hans surmised that the Jennet wasn't holding back for security's sake. Thorsh really didn't know what intelligence he had locked away in his memory trap of a brain. Han and Leia hadn't gone far when a speeder pulled up alongside them. On the bench seat behind the hover vehicle's Rodian driver sat General Wedge Antilles and Jedi Master Kenth Hamner. Wedge, Leia said in delighted surprise, as the handsome, dark-haired human climbed from the speeder. She hugged him in greeting while Han pumped Wedge's extended hand. Wedge nodded to Han. Boss. The two men had known each other for almost thirty years since the Battle of Yavin where Wedge had flown with Luke Skywalker against the Death Star. At Endor, Wedge had been instrumental in destroying the second Death Star, and during the fledgling years of the New Republic, he had distinguished himself in countless operations with Rogue Squadron and other units. Like a lot of galactic Civil War veterans, he and his wife, Iela, had come out of retirement to fight the Yuzhan Vong. At Borlias, Wedge had formed a secret resistance force called the Insiders, whose membership, including Han, Leia, Luke, and many others, had agreed to borrow some of the tactics the Rebel Alliance had employed against the Empire. Han had always liked Wedge, and what with Jaina's growing closeness to Wedge's nephew, Jagged Fell, there was an outside chance that the Solo and Antilles families would end up allies of an even deeper sort. "'Good to see you again, Wedge,' Han said. "'Any word from on high?' "'Only that Admiral Saab sends his gratitude for what you and Leia have done. "'Nice to know that we're all still on the same team.' "'Han threw Wedge a wink and turned to Kenth Hamner, "'who was wearing the homespun brown robe of a Jedi. "'New look for you, isn't it?' "'Kenth allowed a grin. "'Formal attire, a show of solidarity between the Jedi and the Galactic Alliance military.' Times change. That they do. Kenth, any communication from Luke? Leia asked with some urgency. Nothing. Leia frowned. It's been more than two months now. Kenth nodded. And nothing from Corin or Tahiri, either. Leia studied him for a moment. What could have happened? Kenth tightened his lips and shook his head slowly. We have to assume that they're still in the unknown regions. We'd know if something went wrong. Han grasped that Kent's we was meant to include Leia, since before the fall of Coruscant, the Jedi, and Leia by extension, had honed their abilities to stretch out with thoughts and feelings, to meld minds and intuit at great distances. 
We're considering dispatching a search party, Kent added. Like Han and Wedge, the tall and pleasant-looking Jedi was Corellian, though unlike them he was an heir to wealth. Han had always considered him the most military-minded Jedi. Kian Farlander and Kyle Katarn notwithstanding, and a year earlier Kent had been named to Chief of State Cal Omas' Advisory Council, along with Jedi Masters Luke, Kip Duran, Silgal, Tracina Lobi, and Jedi Knight Saba Sabatine. Luke had placed Kent in charge of the Jedi when he, Mara, and several others had embarked on a quest for the living world of Zonama Seacoat. Since then, Kent had done his best to coordinate missions for the Jedi in Luke's absence, but as was true with Alliance Command, his best efforts had been undermined by the Yuzhan Vong's unexpected success in disabling the Holonet, which had long been the basis of galactic communications. You'd better be organizing a large party if you're intending to search the unknown regions, Han said. Kent found no humor in the remark. We were able to obtain origin coordinates of the transmission Luke and Mara relayed through the Esfandia beacon. And, Leia said, we've been transmitting to those coordinates for the past couple of weeks, without response. With the Generis communications array destroyed by the Yuzhang Vong, Esfandia was the only beacon capable of reaching Chiss space and the unknown regions. Two months earlier, a desperate battle had been fought at Esfandia, but the beacon had been saved, thanks in large part to Grand Admiral Gilad Pelion's Imperial forces, with a helping hand from the able crew of Millennium Falcon. Maybe Zonama Seacoast moved, Han said. I mean, that is what it's known for. Kent rocked his head in purposeful evasion. Among other things... Leia looked hard at him. Could Zonama Seacoat be returning to known space? We can hope. The four of them fell silent for a long moment. Wedge gave Han a covert glance, then heaved his shoulders in a shrug. When they had all climbed into the speeder, Wedge, in the front seat, turned to Leia and Han. Tell me about Selvaris. Not much to tell, Han said. The escapees signaled us. We flew down and managed to rescue one of them. Wedge looked to Leia for elaboration. She blinked and smiled. Just like he said, it was that simple. Han leaned forward in a gesture of confidence. What's all this about, Wedge? Not that we ever need an excuse to rescue anyone, but why from Selvaris of all worlds? Most people I know couldn't point it out on a star chart. Wedge's expression turned serious. I've got a special stake in this, Han. Han's forehead wrinkled in interest. How so? You can hear for yourselves. General Kraken has requested that you attend the debriefing. At the turbo lift, Leia and the three Corellians caught up with the medical team that was escorting Thorsh. The Genet and the Meds exited three levels down. Leia and the others rode to the bottom on the shaft, emerging on a secure level, where two human intelligence officers coded them into a stuffy room. Han had expected the usual mix of spies and officers, maybe a single chair for the subject, but the cabin felt more like an examination room. The only intelligence operative in attendance was Bindi Drayson, whom Han, Leia, and Wedge knew from Borlias and other campaigns the lean and sharp-featured daughter of a former intelligence chief. Drayson was considered an expert tactician and almost two years earlier had participated in a Wraith Squadron infiltration mission to Yuzhan Vong-occupied Coruscant. For company just now, she had a red R2 unit and a given. Exoskeleton humanoids with tubular limbs, large triangular eye sockets, and gaping mouths set in what appeared to be a perpetual frown of dismay, given were a remarkable species. Not only were they capable of surviving in the vacuum of space, but they could also perform complex hyperspace navigation without having to rely on navicomputers. 
Shipbuilders on a par with Verpine and Duros, they were obsessed with calculations, probabilities, and mathematics. Many believed that if the meaning of life were ever to be reduced to an equation, a given would be the first to do so. Before anyone had time for proper introductions, Thorsch was led into the room. Absorbing the tableau in a glance, he said, I'm ready when you are. With the astromech droid standing by his side, the given seated himself opposite Thorsch. Thorsch closed his eyes and began to speak, surrendering the hollow wafer data he had memorized in an instant on Selvaris. A complex and utterly baffling sequence of numbers and formulas spewed from the genet without pause or inflection. No one in the room stirred. No one interrupted him. When Thorsch finished, he loosed a long exhale. Glad to be rid of that. The given was nodding his scary head. No soft body could have composed such elegant work. I recognize the mind and hand of a given in coding the message contained in this equation. You want him to repeat any of it? Bindi Drayson asked. The given shook his head. That won't be necessary. She nodded in satisfaction. Then I guess we're done here. Han glanced around in bafflement. That's it? That's the debriefing? Wedge nodded his chin to the given and the droid. The rest is up to them. Han and Leia had just found seats in the mess hall when Major Amar brought word that General Kraken was ready to conduct the briefing. So much for a real meal, Han said. Leia sighed. I'll have three people prepare us something later. The perfect appetite suppressant. By the time the Solos arrived, the base's tactical information center was filled to capacity with intelligence analysts, ship's officers, and wing commanders. Kraken's adjutant escorted Han and Leia down the amphitheater's broad carpeted stairs to seats in the front row. On the rostrum sat Wedge and three colonels, two Bothans and a Sullustan. Seventy-five-year-old Aaron Kraken, whose intelligence briefings had literally given shape to the Rebel Alliance during the Galactic Civil War, stood at the lectern. First, I want to thank all of you for reporting at such short notice. If there was time, I would have included this information in tomorrow's scheduled briefing. But with Holonet transmissions disabled, we'll need to dispatch couriers immediately if we're to pull this operation together. Kraken activated a switch on the lectern's slanted top, and a hollow projection appeared to his left, detailing an unidentified sector of the galaxy. Kraken used a laser pointer to indicate a star system in the upper right quadrant, which expanded as the pointer's red beam touched the hollow's sizing node. The Tantara system, Kraken continued, looking core word from Bill Bringy. The principal stars are Centus Major and Renant, the closest habitable world presently occupied by the Yuzhan Vong is Selvaris. Kraken nodded at Han and Leia, then gestured to them. Captain Solo and Princess Leia have just returned from Selvaris. There they were successful in rescuing a prisoner who escaped from an enemy internment camp constructed on the surface. Among those we have been able to identify as fellow prisoners in the camp are Captain Judder Page of Coralag and my own son, Major Posh Kraken. Murmurs of genuine surprise swept through the room. How come nobody told us that? Han asked Leia out of the corner of his mouth. She shushed him gently. Let's at least hear Aaron out before we make a fuss. Okay, Han said slowly but just this once. A resistance group operating on Selvaris was able to obtain important intelligence and pass that intelligence along to Captain Page and Major Kraken, who are currently the highest-ranking Alliance officers in captivity at the camp. The intelligence was encrypted as a complex mathematical formula, which was memorized by the Genet escapee and decrypted only two hours ago. It provides us with details of a Peace Brigade mission to transport to Coruscant 
several hundred Alliance officials and high-ranking officers who are being held on Selvaris and in more than a dozen such camps along the fringes of the Yuzhan Vong invasion corridor. We now know when the pickups are to be made, and we know the route the Peace Brigade convoy plans to use in reaching Coruscant. We don't yet know the reason for this mass relocation, but we have a good guess. No wonder Wedge said he has a stake in this, Han whispered. Some of the officers Kraken is talking about were probably captured during the attempt to retake Bill Bringy. Wedge stepped to the lectern and took over for Kraken. Alliance spies placed inside the Peace Brigade have alerted Moon Calamari Command that a Yuzhan Vong religious ceremony of great significance is scheduled to take place on Coruscant sometime within the next standard week. The purpose of this ceremony is unclear. It could mark the anniversary of some historical event, or its purpose could be to quell the rising tide of discontent that continues to plague Coruscant. The purpose is immaterial in any case, since it is our belief that the prisoners being transported to Coruscant are to be sacrificed at this ceremony. Separate conversations broke out throughout the amphitheater. Leia tuned them out to absorb the tragic news in silence. Almost since the start of the war, the seditious Peace Brigade had transported everything from hibernating amphistaffs to captives for sacrifice. Mixed species renegades, there wasn't anything they wouldn't do for credits and the freedom to move about the galaxy as they wished. But there was small profit in being a brigader any longer. Those who weren't hunted down and killed by alliance operatives or loyalists had usually ended up dying at the hands of the Yuzhan Vong themselves. And no matter which way the war went, they were going to end up on the losing side. Useless to the Yuzhan Vong, traitors to the alliance. That didn't seem to matter, however. They lived for the moment, the credits, the thrill, the spice. Everyone here knows that countless lives have ended on Yuzhan Vong's sacrificial pyres, Wedge was saying. But it is imperative that this convoy be prevented from reaching Coruscant. In the past, whenever and wherever possible, we have attempted to save lives. That has always been our mandate. We have frequently failed because of erroneous intelligence or overwhelming force. Some of you are probably asking yourselves, why this convoy? The answer is simple, because many of the prisoners, Captain Page and Major Kraken among them, are desperately needed to rally support for planetary sectors on the verge of acquiescing to the enemy. In addition, because their cover will be compromised, those agents operating within the Peace Brigade, who helped provide this intelligence, will also have to be extracted. And we are faced with having to execute this rescue without the advantage of coordinating operations through the Holonet. Wedge waited for the amphitheater to quiet. Salvaris is the last stop before the convoy jumps to Coruscant so our ambush must wait until the prisoners have been transferred. Given the devastating losses the Peace Brigade sustained a year ago at Elysia and Duro, it's reasonable to assume that the convoy will be escorted and complemented by Yuzhan Vong war vessels. Admirals Sav and Krife have already seen fit to allocate Black Moon, Scimitar, Twin Suns, and other starfighter squadrons to the mission. The starfighters will lend support to our gunships, as well as protect the transports needed to house those prisoners we rescue. Captain Solo and Princess Leia have volunteered Millennium Falcon for the latter purpose. Leia cut her wide-open eyes to Han. When did that happen? I uh, might have said something to Wedge earlier. You didn't even know what the mission was going to entail. Han smiled crookedly. I basically said that he could put us down for whatever they had in mind. Leia took a breath and faced front. Much to her mounting unease, Han had gotten into the habit of accepting every dangerous assignment dreamed up by Galactic Alliance Command. It was as if the successes in the Kornacht Cluster at Bakara and at Esfandia had merely primed Han's pomp, or had been nothing more than warm-up exercises for some grand mission during which he would defeat the Yuzhan Vong single-handedly or at least in partnership with Leia. 
But the war had taken a toll on both of them, beginning with Chewbacca's death and culminating with the tragic events at Mirkur. Where their youngest son, Anakin, had died, their older son, Jason, had been captured, and their daughter, Jaina, had forged her grief into a sword of vengeance that had pushed her to the edge of the dark side and nearly cost her her life. Leia knew in her heart that she and Han were more unified than they had ever been. But the constant missions had been exhausting, and lately there had been too many close calls. At times she wished that she could gather her scattered family and spirit everyone to some far corner of the galaxy, untouched by the war. But even on the remote chance that such a corner existed, Han wouldn't consider absenting himself for a moment. Especially now, with Holonet communications down, and the need for gifted pilots with fast ships. Before that safe corner could ever be found and claimed as their own, before the galaxy could know enduring peace, Leia and Han would need to see the war through to the bitter end. She came back to herself just as Wedge was concluding his remarks. We are committed to this operation for an added reason of equal importance. That is, in the hope that a rescue of such magnitude will spoil the impending sacrifice. Wedge's expression turned hard as he scanned the assembly. Any thorns we can drive deeper into Shimra's side will further destabilize Coruscant and provide us with the window we need to rebuild our forces and safeguard those worlds the enemy has thus far been unable to vanquish. Chapter 6 It was raining insects on Yuzhan Tar, the former Coruscant, once bright center, now dimmed, defiled by war, transformed by the Yuzhan Vong into a riotous garden. A seeming mishmash of ferns, conifers, and other flora blunted what only two years earlier had been technological Sierra. Verdant growth nudged through mist in valleys that had once been canyons between kilometer-high megastructures. Newly formed lakes and basins, created by the fall of mighty towers and orbital platforms, were filled to overflowing with water, initially brought by asteroids, but since delivered with regularity from a purple sky. To some, Yuzhan Tar, Kresh of the Gods, was a world returned to its bygone splendor, lost and rediscovered, more alive for having been conquered, its orbit altered, tweaked sunward, three of its moons steered away and returned, and the fourth pulverized to form a braided ring, a bridge of supernatural light along which the gods strolled in serene meditation. And yet insects were raining down on Supreme Overlord Shimra's rainbow-winged world ship Citadel, his holy mount rising from a Yorick coral cradle to tower over what had been the most populous and important precinct of the galactic capital. An unrelenting tattoo of falling bodies that sounded like a thousand drummers pounding out different rhythms. The stink beetles spattered the dome of the Hall of Confluence and the stately organiform bridges that linked the hall to other hallowed places. The plague had been born on the other side of Yuzhan Tar, because of a mistake by the world brain, an overbreeding, and now the creatures were dying because of yet another mistake by the Doryam. The air around the citadel reeked, and the ground was slippery with smashed bodies. The atmosphere inside the great hall was somber. A place of assembly for the Yuzhan Vong elite, it was defined by a curving roof supported by pillars sculpted from ancient bone. Broad at the four palpating portals, where the high caste entered, the hall attenuated at the opposite end, where Shimra sat on a pulsing crimson throne, propped by clusters of how polyps. Dovin basils provided a sense of gravity, of uphill walking, increasing the nearer one came to Shimra's spike-backed seat. And yet the atmosphere inside the hall was moody and silent. A kneeling gathering of priests, warriors, shapers, and intendants waited for the supreme overlord to speak. The brooding silence was fractured by the sound of insects striking the roof, or being swept from the fronting causeways into the accommodating mouths of a dozen maulur. 
You are asking yourselves, where have we erred? Shemra said at last, Does the fault lie with our cleansings, our sacrifices, our conquests? Are we being tested by the gods, or have we been abandoned? Is Shimra still our conduit, or has he become our liability? You are preoccupied with fears concerning balance and derangement. You wonder if all of us haven't become shamed ones in the eyes of the gods, spurned, disdained, ostracized because of our pride and our inability to prevail. Shimra paused to look around the hall, then asked, Do you think that your distrust in me, your whispered doubts, benefits our noble cause? If I can hear you, what must the gods be thinking when they look into each and every one of you? I will tell you what the gods are saying to one another. They have lost faith in the one we set upon the polyp throne, and in doubting the supreme overlord, our yoke to them, they doubt us. And so the gods visit plagues and defeats on their children, not to castigate me, but to demonstrate where you have failed, where you have failed them. Shimra's black and gray ceremonial robes were the flayed and preserved flesh of the first supreme overlord. His massive head was scarified with design, his features rearranged to suggest a godly aspect, eyes widened, mouth decurved, forehead elongated, earlobes stretched, chin narrowed to a point, like the hall of confluence itself, and blazing from his eye sockets, umcocked implants, which changed color according to Shimra's mood. The fingers of his huge right hand grasped a fanged amphistaff that was the scepter of power. Below the York coral throne sat his shamed familiar, Onimi, part pet, part speaker of truths few dared to voice. It had reached Shimra's ear, through a network of eavesdropping biotes and actual spies, that some of his opponents and derogators were gossiping that he had fallen out of favor with the gods. A speculation more ironic than dangerous, since Shimra had long ago abandoned real belief in any power other than that which he wielded as supreme overlord. Even so, there were undeniable reasons to fear that he had fallen out of favor. The slow progress of the conquest, a plague itching that had commenced with his arrival on Yuzhan Tar, the still unabated heretical movement, the disastrous defeat at Ebak 9, the treachery of the priestess Angala, the attempt on Shimra's life. Many believed that all these reversals had been engineered by the gods as a warning to Shimra that he had become grandiose and proud. He who had proclaimed the galaxy a chosen realm for the long-wandering homeless Yuzhan Vong. As an appeasement to the concerned members of the elite, Shimra had agreed to allow his proclamations and utterances to be analyzed by a quartet of seers, one from each caste, one for each primary god. Black midnight hags who sat close to the throne and spoke in contradictions. Not that they dared challenge Shimra, in any case, except with hand-wringing, prayers, and other gestures meant to implore the gods to look kindly on Yuzhan Tar. You disgust me, he told them. You think I'm spouting sacrilege. You recoil and grovel because you know that I speak the truth, and that truth rattles you to the core of your being. You do well to chop off more of yourselves in penance and devotion. Give all of yourselves, and it won't be enough. He looked down at Onimi. You think I speak in riddles, like this one? Onimi's deformities owed not to birth, but to rejection by the gods. Once a shaper, he was now little more than a misshapen jester, one eye drooping below its mate, one yellow fang protruding from a twisted mouth, one portion of his skull distended, as if the shaper's va tumor had failed to seat itself properly. Long and slender, his arms and legs twitched continuously, yanked about by the gods as they might do a puppet. Shimra made a sound of angry impatience. 
Come forward, Van Shul of Domain Shul, and Melan Nar of Domain Nar. The two consuls, mid-level intendants, advanced a few meters on their knees. I have pondered your grievances with each other, Shimra said when the throne's Dovin Basil had forced the faces of the consuls to the floor. And I now decree that you put them aside. I decree further that you redirect the energy that fuels your wrath into serving our common cause. Each of you claims that your troubles with each other began here, on Yuzhan Tar, as have so many other petty rivalries between this domain and that one. But this is merely camouflage. I know that your dispute had its roots during our long migration through intergalactic space, and that that dispute has resurfaced here. But you are not entirely to blame. Absent wars to wage, what did we do but turn upon ourselves, sacrifice one another, compete for the favor of my predecessor, Quarial, or snipe behind one another's backs? The gods were forgotten. You lost patience. You worried. You thought then that the gods had abandoned us, because our long-sought home was nowhere to be found, and that is precisely what you are doing now. Prefect Dagara and the Praetorite Domains. What did their blasphemous actions earn them but ice graves on what little remains of Helska for, a world so far removed from Yuzhan Tar, it might as well be in the galaxy we left behind? None less than Warmaster Chu Kong La refused to believe me when I avowed that the promised realm was within reach. And what did that earn him but death in battle? like his son, who burned so strongly with hatred for the Jedi that he allowed himself to be drawn into an engagement he couldn't win. Shimra paid no attention to the bitter grumblings from some of the warriors, all of whom wore ceremonial Von Doon crab armor. Instead, his piercing gaze fell on Warmaster Nas Choka, noble in appearance despite his modest stature, with fine black hair combed straight back from his face, and a wispy beard. Choka had been escalated in the wake of Savong La's death, but was not yet universally revered, despite his numerous victories in hut space. Learn from the mistakes of your precursors, Warmaster, and all will go well for you. Fail me as Domain La did, and I will personally make an example of you that future war masters will be forced to consider before they accept escalation. Nas Choka inclined his head in a crisp bow and struck the points of his shoulders with the opposite fists. Now Shimra glared at the fretting warriors. Many of you would like to hold Prefect No Manor responsible for what happened at Ebak 9, because of the disinformation to which he fell victim. I myself accepted that for a time, but the real failure was Savong La's, for allowing himself to be gulled by the enemy. Savong La thought he died an honorable death, but I say that he shamed us all. Eyes downcast, many a warrior squirmed in place. Shimra's gaze found High Priest Jakan adorned in red, and High Prefect Drathul sheathed in green. There are others whom I might chastise and remind of their obligation, but I will reserve that for another occasion. A Dovin basil cushion floated Shimra out of his throne to the ring of flower petals that encircled it, where he dismounted the cushion. Ankle deep in the flowers, he raised his long-toothed scepter of rank. All can be made right by the coming sacrifice, but we must take care against interference. The heretics, August Lord, a priest said. Shimra waved his empty hand in dismissal. The heretics are nothing more than a pestilence, a plague of stink bugs we can eradicate at any time. I speak of interference from the unconverted who move silently among us, those who survived the planetary bombardment and world-shaping, the slaves who escaped the maimed seed ship that delivered the world brain to Yuzhan Tar, the resistance fighters who profane our holy ground, and the Jedi. As if on cue, Onimi scrambled to his feet and followed Shimra along the flowered ring, reciting, 
The shamed are not but nuisance flies, at least as seen through Shimra's eyes. The Jedi are the ones he mourns, edged and sharp as Senelac thorns. When Shimra swung about, Onimi bowed in mock gallantry. Great Skylord, if the Jedi force is nothing more than enhanced ability, why have our shapers not created worthy opponents from the warrior caste? Shimra frowned and aimed a finger at his familiar. You spoil my surprise, Onimi. But so be it. He turned to face the white-robed, tentacle-handed shapers. Let us not keep our company in suspense. Display your handiwork. One of the spotlessly adorned shapers rose and hastened from the hall. Moments later, entering through both the priest and warrior portals, marched a group of ten males. Shorter even than Nas Choka, they carried restless amphistaffs and wetted kufis. Stang's talons sprouted from their robust bodies, which were smeared black with dried blood. The ten were unlike the special breed of warriors known as hunters, who were privileged to sport the photosensitive, mimetic cloak of noon, but something new and disconcerting, and the female seers were the first to voice their dismay. What desecration is this? Armed as warriors, yet clothed as attendants to the gods. What shaper is responsible? Onimi gambled over to them and adopted a haughty posture. To prove the force of farce indeed, Shimra's will the shapers heed. Birthing troops of mingled caste, great Nas Choka, they will outlast. One of the seers made a futile grab for Onimi, while the others continued to shout dire warnings. No shaper other than myself is responsible, Shimra said, silencing them. By my injunction do these warriors come to be. Our Jedi, charged with guarding the life of your supreme overlord, as well as with rooting out our enemies and exterminating them. At their disposal, they will have coral skippers of unique design, with advanced weaponry and the ability to travel through dark space unassisted. Shimra paused, then added, They shall be called Slayers, in honor of Yun Yamka, lest he feel uncomfortable about mingling with priests. They have the look of shamed ones. Shimra whirled on the warrior who said it. Shamed, you say? By my mandate were they created, Supreme Commander Chan, by divine edict. If the gods had disapproved, would these warriors not bear the markings of pariahs? Supreme Commander Chan stood his ground. Shamed ones shaped to resemble those who have been embraced by the gods, great lord, concealing the deformities that would signal their unworthiness. Is it too much to ask that we be shown proof of their status? Shimra grinned diabolically. Cursed you are by your own request, Commander. Step forward with ten of your warriors and do your best against these. Fearsome Shimra. Doubt flew from your mouth like a sick vi, Commander. If too quickly, then retract your words, or do as I say and stand against these. Chan snapped his fists to his shoulders and summoned ten warriors to their feet. Kufis, shields, tridents, and amphistaffs woke to the challenge. At the same time, the warrior priests spread out, but only two stepped forward. Two against eleven, Chan said in sudden consternation. This is vulgar. Dishonor either way. Shimra returned to his throne and sat. Then we will be pleased to see you humble them, if only to demonstrate that our shapers have failed in their task. Carve them, Commander, as a dish fit for the gods. Chan saluted crisply. At his curt nod, the ten warriors attacked, two groups of four moving to outflank their opponents, and the remaining two rushing forward immediately to engage and distract. The reactions of the warrior priests were almost too fast to follow. They turned slightly to the side, almost back to back, wielding weapons in both hands, meeting the frontal attack and the flanking attack simultaneously. The amphistaffs of the attackers struck seemingly unarmored flesh without finding purchase. Kufis cut and sliced, and yet almost no blood flowed. What little did congealed instantly. 
The melee weapons of the defenders were no less enhanced than were the small muscular warrior priests who wielded them. The specially bred amphistaffs snapped the heads off their lesser cousins and stabbed with enough force to paralyze even through armor. The slayers, Shimra's Jedi, leapt to great heights, twisting in mid-flight and landing behind their attackers, then rushed in, arms windmilling in a blur, gouts of black blood flying in all directions. One by one and sliced to pieces, Chan's warriors dropped to the floor. Silence gripped the hull as the elite of all castes watched with a mix of awe and dread. Shimra was already powerful enough without this royal guard. Now he was no match for any domain that might think to thwart him. The fight was over almost as quickly as it began, with the ten warriors and Chan felled and bleeding, and the two warrior priests unmoved by what they had done, their slender amphistaffs badged with blood. The shaper who had escorted the group into the hall stepped forward to appraise the warriors and address Shimra. Our taller warriors kept rejecting the implants. The faster metabolic rate of our shorter warriors is better suited to the rapid cellular activity of the implant biotes. Onimi scampered over to one of the dead warriors and prodded him. Most impressive, done with flair. But against a Jedi, how will they fare? Shimra nodded to Master Shaper Kila Quad. Show him. Few members of the elite were as fearsome to gaze upon as Kila Quad. But the object she held in her eight-fingered cephalopod hand made her writhing snake's headdress and bulging cranium seem positively ordinary. The weapon of the Jedi, one of the warriors shouted. More sacrilege, another said. Hold your tongues or forfeit them, Shimra snapped. This is the energy blade taken from the Jedi who killed you in great numbers in the well of the world brain. The one whom so many of you hold in reverence. Ganner. Think of the blade not as an abomination then, but a holy relic of that warrior's might. Master Shaper Quad has desecrated herself, a seer said. If you take issue with her familiarity with the stillborn technology, Shimra replied calmly, then denounce as well the contrivances Master Quad and her shapers created to foil the enemy's shadow bombs, their decoy Dovin basils, and their Yamask jammers. Condemn, too, the Mabagat Khan that have ingested the enemy's deep space communications arrays, and have enabled us to subjugate more worlds in a clacket than had been conquered in the time since my arrival in the Outer Rim. He gestured to the lightsaber. For this energy blade is powered by one of our own lambent focusing crystals. Hence, it has already been sanctified. The remark was enough to quiet everyone in the hall. Shimra nodded again. Carry on, Master Shaper. Moving directly to one of the slayers, Kila Quad ignited the lightsaber, raised it to her opposite shoulder, and with a slashing motion drew the violet blade diagonally across the slayer's chest. The smell of burned flesh wafted through the hall. Shimra turned slightly to face the commanders. Only a furrow where any one of you would lie in two pieces on the floor. There are more Von Doon crab than Yuzhan Vong, High Priest Jakan muttered. Shimra seethed. Von Doon crab, Dovin basil, Yamask, warrior. Need I remind you of all people that we are all grown from the same seed? Nome Anor, slightly taller than the average human, disfigured by ceremony and by his own hand, fitted with a false eye that could spit poison, waited uneasily at the entry to Shimra's private chambers in the rounded crown of the sacred mountain. Three sullen slayers stood stiffly to one side of the membranous curtain, and a pair of priests to the other, purifying Nomanor with clouds of fragrant vapor puffed from the dorsal scent gland of a well-fed but skittish thamash. 
he hadn't been summoned to private audience with the Supreme Overlord since his return from Zonama Seacoat, and he wasn't sure what to expect. The membrane shimmered and parted to reveal Onimi, gesticulating to no manor. Enter Prefect. Shimra's pet said, affecting a supercilious tone. No Manor edged past him into the spacious circular chamber. Shimra sat in the center of the room, atop a circular dais, in a high-backed seat that lacked the pomp of his public throne. A blood moat encircled the seat, and off to one side a Yorick coral staircase with a finely wrought railing spiraled into the summit. A hardened module of the world ship, Shimra's inner sanctum, like the well of the world brain, could be detached from the citadel if necessary and launched into deep space. Did you not wonder when we three would meet again? Onimi asked softly as Nomanor passed. Nomanor ignored the question and approached the throne, genuflecting at the edge of the foul-smelling moat. From an inner pocket of his green robe, he removed the lightsaber that had stirred so much strife in the Hall of Confluence earlier on. Dread Lord, your desire was that this be delivered to you. Nome Anor kept his gaze lowered while Shimra took the weapon from his hand. He looked up with alarm when he heard the distinctive snap hiss of the lightsaber's energy blade. The mere sound of the weapon evoked jarring memories of an incident in the Well of the World Brain a year earlier, when Jason Solo and Verger had held a similar blade to his neck before they had made their escape from Yuzhan Tar. Noma Noor had spent countless moments since, wondering how his life might have gone had the two Jedi agreed to take him with them. As a source of invaluable intelligence, he might not have been executed by the so-called Galactic Alliance. Perhaps after weeks of debriefing, he would have been allowed to don an Uglith masker and relocate in secrecy to some remote world in the Outer Rim, where he would have been able to live out his days in contentment. No larger than a votive candle, in the grip of Shimra's right hand, the lightsaber thrummed as it cleaved the air. Answer me honestly, Prefect. Do you believe in the gods? Shimra brought the violet blade close to Noma Nor's neck. Bear in mind, honestly. High Prefect Drathul's predecessor, Yug Skell, who had died by Noma Nor's hand, had once warned Noma Nor never to lie to Shimra. Now he swallowed and found his voice. August Lord, I... Remain open to belief. If there was some benefit to believing, you mean. I follow the example set by the priest's lord. Shimra's eyes bored into Noma Nor's single orb. Are you suggesting, Prefect, that our priests are not acting out of the goodness of their hearts? Lord, I have seen many hearts, and few showed evidence of goodness. Clever! Shimra said slowly, That's the word everyone who knows you or who has had dealings with you uses. Clever. To Nome Anor's relief, Shimra deactivated the lightsaber. In another scenario, Nome Anor might have remained prophet of the heretics and even then be attempting to topple Shimra from the throne. He had faced that choice in the unknown regions. How telling. Only to decide... Better by Shimra's side than overlord to a multitude of outcasts. What does one like yourself make of the whisperings that circulate among the elite? Shimra asked from his simple chair. That the gods have become angered by my decisions, as far back to my deciding to tip Quarial from his throne, usurp his position as supreme overlord, and pronounce this galaxy our new home. Nomanor risked adopting a cross-legged posture on the floor. From the far side of the moat, Onimi watched him with visible delight. May I speak freely, Lord? You had better, Onimi said. Shimra glanced from Onimi to Nomanor, then nodded his enormous head. I would answer that many of the high caste failed to grasp that the actions you took were a tribute to the gods. 
actions no less bold than those taken by Yun Yuzhan when he gave of himself to bring the universe into being. Shimra leaned forward. You impress me, Prefect. Continue. Noma Nor grew more confident. Many of us had accepted as fact that the generations of wandering through the intergalactic void had been a test of faith, which, as you yourself pointed out, we failed miserably. By quarreling among ourselves and worshipping false gods, weakening the hinges of our own gates. Shimra nodded sagely. Any group without opposition falls inexorably into decay and tyranny, or both. But you, Dread Lord, saw the arduous journey for what it was, a consequence of our previous failures. You understood that our shapers were fast approaching the limits of traditional knowledge that they were essentially powerless to repair our deteriorating world ships, that our priests were likewise unable to rescue our society from the depths to which it had sunk, that our warriors, left without a war, had nowhere to turn but upon one another. We were dying in the void, Lord, and were it not for your toppling of Quoriel and his cautious followers, the Yuzhan Vong might have ended there. Shimra stared at him. Oh, you are a dangerous person, Prefect. He glanced at Onemi. But as my familiar knows well, I have a liking for danger. He paused, then added, I will educate you about the gods. The question is not whether they exist, but if we have any further need of them. Their fall began during our long journey, when they failed to come to our aid. As you have undoubtedly learned, Prefect, one cannot keep loyal servants if one neglects them. So the fault lies with them. Absent our bloody support, absent our solicitations and praises, what would they be left with? The gods may have created us, but it is we who sustain them through worship. Now they are bereft because the roles are reversed. They are angry because they have been forced to recognize that their hour has arrived, that the time has come to surrender power to Shimra and the new order. Again, Shimra ignited the lightsaber and waved it about, as if to emphasize his remarks. This is the greater war, Prefect, the Yuzhan Vong against the gods. Nom Anor gulped. War, august lord? Nothing less, because the gods guard their power jealously. But surely you recognize this prefect. Would you go quietly into retreat, or would you fight to the last to preserve your status? Abandon all the consuls who now answer to you? Murder even high prefect Drathul, if necessary, to hold your ground? I would fight, dread lord. Nom Anor said, more forcefully than he intended. And I would expect no less of you. But there is a problem inherent in all this, for we find ourselves surrounded by true believers, and to some extent they pose a greater threat to the future of the Yuzhan Vong than that posed by the gods themselves. Nom Anor smiled inwardly. The gods have their place, Lord. Indeed they do. Religious ritual keeps the priests and intendants busy. It keeps the shapers from becoming too ambitious. It keeps the warriors at bay. It keeps the workers from discarding the caste system. And it keeps shamed ones from rising up in open revolt. Therefore, if I am to remake this world, I must tread carefully. Shimra's words only reinforced Nomanor's belief that faith was an extravagance, and that true believers were the easiest to manipulate. I must tread carefully, Shimra repeated, almost to himself. When faith is under assault, and the social order is cracking apart, the weak do not want explanations. They want reassurance, and someone to blame. He laughed quietly. Ah, but I'm telling you what you already know. Look what wonders this worked with the shamed ones who have turned to heresy on Yuzhan Tar and our other worlds. Do they want explanations? No. They cry out for my blood. 
Despite his best efforts, Noma Nor began to quiver. I see that my remarks frighten you, Prefect. Perhaps you think they smack of heresy, such as the prophet preaches to his blind following. Would you lump me in with our own Mejan Quad and Nen Yim, or Shadao Shai and his sad devotion to the embrace of pain? I know little of those things, Dread Lord. Naturally. No Manor didn't like the sound of it. Executions came easily to Shimra, who was easily displeased. He had had Shaper Chagang Hul killed because of Hul's seeming failure to govern the world brain and prevent the itching plague. He had also executed Commander Ekam Val, who had discovered, or rather rediscovered, Zonama Seacoat. Nomanor himself had been targeted for execution because of his gullibility regarding Ebak Nine. In the days since, his dreams of power and glory had been fulfilled, but what if Shimra should decide to safeguard the secret of Zonama Seacoat by having Nomanor killed? Just as Nomanor had killed Nen Yim and the priest Harar to safeguard his secret. Shimra was contemplating the lightsaber. A curious weapon, is it not? It requires the wielder to close with an enemy in personal combat. Were it not for their misguided beliefs, the Jedi might actually be deserving of admiration. There may yet be a way to incorporate their doctrines into our religion. We must be careful not to repeat past mistakes. Perhaps we need to look for ways to conquer the hearts and minds of the species that dominate here. He looked at Noma Nor. Have the Jedi never been defeated, Prefect? As Noam Anor recounted what he knew of the Jedi Purge, he considered what killing Shimra might have meant for the Yuzhan Vong. By assassinating Emperor Palpatine, the Rebel Alliance had unleashed decades of turmoil with local warlords and incessant battles with hostile species. Tell me of the young Jedi who learned the true way, only to betray it, Shimra said. Jason Solo. Shimra knew the name. The same who lured Savong La to his death. I have been blaming the Shapers for not being able to supervise the world brain, but I begin to suspect that this Jedi is somehow responsible. When I interact with the brain, I sense its reluctance, its miseducation. I have had to instruct the brain as one would a disobedient child a child of warriors who has been mistakenly raised in the crash of the priests. Shimra rolled the lightsaber between his hands. And the Force, I have heard it described by heretics as the lingering exhalation of Yun Yuzhan. Noma Nor's words to his followers returned to haunt him. I would not grant it such importance, August Lord. The Force is merely a power the Jedi have learned to draw from, over twenty or more generations. But not the Jedi alone. A group called the Sith also made use of the power, and were perhaps responsible for the purge that occurred, even while we, you, were finalizing our invasion plans. Shimra folded his arms across his chest. High Priest Jakan has made mention of these Sith. Are they in hiding? No Manor shook his head. Sadly, their flame has gone out of this galaxy, Dreadlord. The heretics claim that in the Jedi are combined all aspects of the gods. But in fact, the Jedi are not flawless, nor are they beyond being outwitted and defeated. They have been captured, killed, almost turned to our own purposes. As you yourself demonstrated at Zonama Seacoat... Shimra's mood became dark. I am eager to deliver an end to our enemy before that planetary nemesis undoes us. He sharpened his gaze on Nomanor. Are we safe, Prefect? Nomanor mustered his courage. With any luck, dread lord, Zonama Seacoat is a dead world. If not, it certainly has no sense of where it is, let alone where we are. Chapter 7 
Luke and Mara Jade Skywalker stood in the trapezoidal entrance to the cliff dwelling that had been their home and shelter on Zonama Seacoat for what had felt like three standard weeks. The span of time was only a guess based on human circadian rhythms. Because the days had been anything but regular since the living world's abrupt jump to hyperspace, lasting anywhere from fifteen to forty hours, as Zonama's governing intelligence struggled to reassert control. Torrential rain continued to lash the middle distance, driven by gales powerful enough to snap and topple the giant Boris and strip the reddish trees of their globular leaves. The sky was an inverted silver bowl, with massive storm clouds stacked high in all directions, deep purple to black, and incandescent with continuous flashes of lightning. Peals of thunder resonated from the bare rock walls of the chasms that housed the cliff dwellings. As if from deep below the surface came a hollow moan, like breath across the narrow mouth of a container. Many believed that the sound was caused by wind rushing across Zonama Seacoat's 300-meter-high hyperdrive veins. Caught in an updraft, Three sheets of lamina building material spiraled up from the floor of the chasm and disappeared over the rim. This place is coming apart, Mara said. Luke nodded but said nothing. He had his right arm around Mara's shoulders, and the side of her face was pressed to the soft weave of his dark cloak. The persistent gusts whipped Mara's red-gold hair about her face and across her mouth. To Luke's left stood R2-D2, emitting a steady stream of mournful chirs and chatterings, his status indicator flashing from red to blue, and his third tread extended to keep himself from being blown over. Luke put his left hand on the astromech droid's hemispherical head. Don't worry, R2. We'll come through this all right. R2 swiveled his primary photoreceptor to Luke and warbled in renewed hope. Mara snorted a laugh. What a guy! Always a kind word for pets, small children, and droids. The cliff dwelling, walls of tightly fitted stones enclosing two small spaces, was located in the canyon's middle tier of natural ledges. Cavities in the bare rock face opposite were likewise partitioned into hundreds of separate dwellings, but many of the vine and lamina suspension bridges that had joined the community's two halves were gone as were the pulleyed platforms the Pharaohans used for vertical transportation. Two kilometers below raged a ribbon of muddy water, dammed in places by knots of fallen Boris and other detritus. Word had it that similar conditions prevailed throughout the middle distance, which was the name given to the equatorial region where the Pharaohans had settled more than seventy-five years earlier, when Zonama Seacoat had resided on the other side of the galactic plain, in the outer rim of known space. Corn is coming, Luke announced in a matter-of-fact tone. Mara slipped out of his embrace and leaned out the entrance to gaze around, one hand clasping her long hair. Where? she said, just loudly enough to be heard. I don't see. She interrupted herself when she saw his head poke above the rungs of a wooden ladder that rose from a lower tier. Soaked to the bone, Corin held his jacket closed at the neck. Water dripped from his furrowed face and the graying beard and mustache that framed his mouth. His limp hair was pulled into a short tail at the back. He smiled when he noticed Mara and hurried for the cliff dwelling, using his free hand to sluice some of the water from his forehead. Jason and Saba's airship has been spotted down valley, he shouted into the wind. They should arrive any minute. Luke stepped out into the rain and wind to glance at the landing platform that jutted out over the canyon. They might need some help. We'd better be on hand to meet them. He looked back at R2, who was whining in apprehension. Stay here, R2. We'll be right back. The three Jedi hurried for the ladder. Whereas Luke and Mara had been on Zonama Seacoat for almost three months, Corin had arrived only three weeks earlier, in the company of Tahiri Vela and three Yuzhan Vong agents. Two of the Yuzhan Vong were now dead, and the third was believed to have escaped from the living world, short of the act of sabotage that had hurled it through hyperspace. 
First to reach the edge of the wind-tossed walkway that accessed the landing platform, Mara came to a sudden halt. Is this thing safe? Luke regarded it for a moment. It'll hold. Corin frowned. Could you be a bit more specific? Luke squeezed past him out onto the swinging walkway where he jumped in place twice. See? Mara threw Corin a look. You can take the kid from Tatooine. Leaving the remark unfinished, she dashed after Luke. Corin was only steps behind when they reached the platform itself, square and cantilevered by thick timbers anchored in the cliff face. From down valley, and drifting to and fro in the wind, appeared a cluster of what might have been balloons, holding aloft an oblong wooden gondola with an aft cabin. There she blows, Corin said. You're not kidding, Mara said. She looked at Luke. They'll never be able to land. They will. They have the force at their backs. Luke set himself in the near horizontal rain and focused his attention on the approaching airship. Through the force, he could feel Mara and Corin join him, and he could also feel the tremendous power Jason and Saba were exercising to prevent the airship from being blown where the howling wind wanted to take it. Confidence surged through him. The Jedi were working not against the natural forces, but in harmony with them, availing themselves of just those gusts that would maneuver the airship to the destination they had chosen. Had there been better forewarning of the trap the three Yuzhan Vong agents had sprung, Seacoat also might have been able to maneuver Zonama through hyperspace to a safe landing. But the jump to light speed had been inadvertent, though fortunately in place of the planned destruction of the planet. When Zonama Seacoat first emerged from transit, conditions were even worse than those that followed. Luke could remember staring into an unfamiliar night sky. Then at daybreak, an enormous sun ballooning on the horizon like an explosion, too brilliant to regard, and radiating such heat that huge expanses of Tom Posse had burst into flame. Seismic events had opened yawning, zigzagging fissures on the high plateaus, and gigantic slabs of rock had been thrust from the parted ground. Forest fires filled the already scorching air with smoke, cinder, and ash. As protection from the dangerous rays of the star, in whose clutches Zonama had been thrown, Seacoat had engineered cloud cover from what moisture it could suck from the planetary mantle. But the damage had already been done. Breathable air was in short supply, and the plasma cores of the hyperdrive engines were dazed. Then, just when Luke had feared the worst for everyone huddled in the shelters and deep in the canyons— where the air was slightly cooler, if no less oxygen-deprived, Zonama had jumped again. Whether because of further misfortune or at Seacoat's direction, no one could say. But rain had been falling ever since. Under the guidance of the five Jedi, the airship completed its descent and made a satisfactory landing on the platform. Luke, Mara, and Corin had the ship tethered to its docking cleats even before Jason and Saba emerged from the small cabin. "'Welcome back,' Luke said, clapping his nephew on the shoulders, then hugging him. Jason's brown hair was combed back and fell almost to his shoulders now, but he had recently shaved his beard. His cloak was stiff with dried mud. Saba, in contrast, wore minimal garments, and her black reptilian skin glistened. You're shivering, Mara said to Jason while she was hugging him. I'm fine. No, you're not. She nodded toward the cliff dwelling. Let's get you inside. We have a fire going. R2-D2 was chirping in excitement when the waterlogged Jedi filed through the trapezoidal entrance. A nourishing fire blazed in the center of the room, smoke escaping through a natural chimney. Elsewhere were glow sticks, sleeping rolls, gear, and provisions— moved there from Jade Shadow. "'Are either of you hungry?' Mara asked Jason and Saba when everyone had warmed themselves. "'Starved,' Jason said. The Barabel Jedi nodded. "'This one as well.' Mara glanced around. "'Anyone else?' Corin shrugged. "'I'm not about to turn down a home-cooked meal.' Luke took off his wet cloak and hung it by the fire, 
then sat down opposite Jason and Saba. Tell us everything. With a nod of her round head, Saba deferred to Jason. Conditions in the south are worse than here, the young man began. The forests are scorched beyond recognition, the trails are impassable, and the rivers are too swollen to navigate. A lot of the boris are completely leafless, and the wildlife has been shocked into hibernation. Most of the pharaohans reached the shelters in time, but hundreds died. When they can, Ol, Darek, Roll, and others have been scouring the area for survivors, but they haven't found any. There's no word on the Gentari, because no one has been able to reach them. Cybernetic organisms bred by the planet's early magisters, overseers and liaisons with seacoat, the Gentari were the carvers and assemblers of Zonama's once-celebrated living starships. Some pharaohans are saying that the southern hemisphere is every bit as traumatized as it was when the far outsiders attacked, Jason continued. Saba nodded. This one has rarely seen such devastation on an inhabited world. Far outsiders was the pharaohan term for the Yuzhan Vong, who had found and engaged Zonama Seacoat some fifty years earlier, when first scouting the galaxy they planned to invade. The far distance is melting, Jason said. The area where Obi-Wan and Anakin landed has broken away from the ice shelf and is adrift in the northern sea. He paused to consider his words. I guess I should say southern sea, since Zonama Seacoat is now upside down. Mara interrupted the conversation to pass out bowls of stew sweetened with rogir bone fruit, which Jason and Saba devoured ravenously. Were you able to learn anything about Widowmaker? Luke asked after Jason had set his bowl down. Jason shook his head sadly. It's gone. It didn't make the jump to hyperspace with Zonama Seacoat. The sudden silence was broken only by the crackling of the fire. Jade Shadow's escort since leaving the remnant, the Imperial frigate had been commanded by Captain Arian Yage, whom the Jedi had come to regard as a close friend rather than a mere comrade in arms. There's more bad news, Jason said finally. Some of the Pharaohans are holding us accountable for what happened. Mara compressed her lips in anger. Luke warned Seacoat that the Yuzhan Vong might return. Luke shook his head. It doesn't matter. I'm sure the Pharaohans are thinking that if it took only three Yuzhan Vong to reopen wounds fifty years old, nothing less than annihilation can come of Seacoat's pledge to enlist in the war against them. That is precisely what the Pharaohans are thinking, Saba said, showing her sharp teeth. Jason sighed. Darek told me that in the past, visitors could remain on Zonama Seacoat for only sixty days, and that our time is up. Luke studied his hands and shook his head back and forth. All those weeks of persuading Seacoat and the Pharaohans of the rightness of their participation, undone in an instant. He looked up at Jason and Saba. Has anyone seen Jabitha? Not since the day Zonama caught fire, Saba replied. Seacoat's humanoid interface with its sentient residence, Jabitha was Zonama's current magister, the third in the planet's history. During her brief appearance following the planet's emergence from hyperspace, Jabitha had said only that Seacoat had desperate need of her elsewhere and that she would return when she could. Present at the appearance, Luke and the other Jedi had quickly discerned that the Jabitha who spoke to them was merely a thought projection of Seacoat. That fact had been borne out later when Jabitha's entranced body had been discovered in her dwelling place. We'll just have to go back to the beginning, Mara said in a determined way. Luke looked at her. We won't know until we speak to Seacoat. In front of the hearth, an apparition appeared, gradually manifesting as a tall, wide-eyed, dark-haired, and faintly blue-skinned woman, wearing a black robe decorated with green medallions that sparkled in the light of the fire. Chabitha, Luke said, coming to his feet. 
Of a sort, Mara said quietly as she joined him. Seacoat wishes to reassure you that Zonama will persevere. The thought projected Jabitha said without preamble. Since perseverance will necessitate significant alterations to Zonama's present orbit and spin, it would be best if everyone remained in the shelters for the time being. Luke drew in his breath, only to sense that his relief was premature. I am also charged with advising you that Seacoat needs time to reassess the possible consequences of returning Zonama to known space. As caretaker of the living force, as defined by the Potentium, the continued existence of Zonama Seacoat is of utmost importance. Luke and Mara traded looks of disappointment. Founded in the pre-Palpatine Republic by would-be Jedi, the order known as the Potentium professed belief in a force that was not divisible into light and dark. Birthed from Zonama by the Founders and under their tutelage as it evolved from egolessness to full self-awareness, Seacoat had come to accept the tenets of the Potentium as fact. Luke hung his head momentarily. Back to the beginning, just as Mara had said, and perhaps worse. Seacoat was turning away from involvement in the war. Seacoat preferred the sanctuary provided by a gas giant like Mobus over open space and exposure to whatever harm might find the planet. Seacoat has some idea where we are, Jabitha was saying. It's possible that Zonama Seacoat passed close to this star system during the crossings from known space. Luke motioned across the room to R2-D2, who was standing silently against the wall. Tell Seacoat that R2 can help compute the location as soon as we can see the stars. The astromech droid tootled in reinforcement. I will tell Seacoat, Jabitha said, dematerializing. Mara sat down next to Luke. That was Jabitha's voice, but I think we just heard directly from Seacoat. It's possible. The five Jedi had yet to emerge from reflection when someone hurried out of the storm into the dwelling's anteroom. Danny, Luke said, even as he was turning toward her. Danny Quee's blonde hair hung loosely around her face, but her green eyes shone with excitement. Tekli and Tahiri, she said in a rush. Mara shot to her feet. What's happened? Danny motioned behind her, as if to something just outside the entrance. They're with him now, the Yuzhan Vong priest, Harar. She blinked and stared at Mara and the others. He's alive. Chapter 8 Giving in to what had become a routine of self-loathing, Malik Kar thought back to his arrival at Abroa Sky in the early days of the invasion. There he had met with Commander Tla, the priest Harar, tactician Raf, and Nomanor. Ever faithful to Yun Harla, the trickster goddess, Harar and Nomanor had hatched a plot to surrender a female member of Deception Sect to the New Republic government as a means of infiltrating the Jedi and assassinating as many of them as possible. Carr had had grave misgivings about the plan, but had given his blessing nevertheless, in part because of something Eminence Harar had said to him. The success of our plan will result in your being escalated to the rank of Supreme Commander, with a space vessel of your own to wield against our newfound enemy. From this, too, I will be permitted to sit at the right hand of Supreme Overlord Shimra, on recreated Yuzhan Tar. That was before Elon had been killed and Harar had been recalled to the Outer Rim, and what was to have been a surprise attack on the enemy shipyards at Fondor had ended in failure, another of No Manor's plots, but for which Nas Choka and Malik Kar had been forced to shoulder the blame. And yet since then, Nas Choka had been escalated to War Master, Harar to High Priest, and No Manor, against all odds and the better judgment of many, to Prefect of Yuzhan Tar. 
As for Malik Kar, a custodian of enemy captives, stripped of his rank, a mere passenger in a vessel commanded by a warrior to whom he was once superior. I want one thing understood, Malik Kar. Commander Bu Fath was lecturing him from the high seat of the war vessel, Sacred Pyre. The prisoners are our first priority. Supreme Overlord Shimra holds them in even greater regard than any of the relics and idols our convoy bears to Yuzhan Tar. Standing stiffly in the murky green light of the command chamber, Carr managed to remain abject and straight-faced despite the fact that only days earlier more than fifty of the prisoners in his charge had suffocated in Selvaris's immolation pit. Carr snapped his fists to his shoulders in salute. I understand, Commander. The prisoners, first and foremost. The convoy was made up of thirteen ships, most of them property of the Peace Brigade, but under the escort of five Yuzhan Vong war vessels, the largest of them carrying two broods of coral skippers apiece. A circumstance that would have been unthinkable at the start of the war, the convoy was not accompanied by a Yamask. Worse, Foth's vessel was tethered to a brigader ship by an Oka membrane to facilitate the transfer of prisoners collected from Selvaris to Sacred Pyre. Some of the captives transported from internment camps distant from Selvaris would remain aboard Peace Brigade ships until the convoy reached Yuzhan Tar. Commander, Carr said as he prepared to take his leave. Are you satisfied that the Peace Brigaders have a similar grasp of the priorities? Having met with some of them, I would suggest that their only allegiance is to the spice they smuggle from Elysia and dose themselves with. Foth grunted. He was exceedingly tall and corded with muscle, but was seldom granted the fealty such size would have guaranteed another. In times like these... We are forced to ally with scoundrels and villains, he said in a tired voice. And by Supreme Overlord Shimra's decree, do our vessels fraternize. But this won't be long. Another year, perhaps two, and we will be sufficiently reprovisioned with warriors and vessels to dispense with the need for peace brigaders or other would-be allies. Warmaster Naschoka has given me his personal assurance. Carr fought to keep from betraying the anger that consumed him. He was the one who had welcomed Nas Choka to the war, and had allowed an escalation ceremony to take place aboard the vessel in his command. He wondered if Nas Choka would so much as deign to gaze on him now, especially should the war master learn of the escape of a Selvaris prisoner. The mere possibility of that made the present assignment all the more important, for any untoward incident would surely doom Carr to further demotion. But no, he told himself, he would sooner drape a ticken around his neck than suffer additional shame. He shook off his concern. Even though still visible through a transparency in the command chamber, Selvaris was behind him. Soon the convoy would accrue adequate acceleration for the transition to dark space, and the next stop would be Yuzhan Tar. Saluting Foth a final time, Carr began to back out of the chamber. He had just reached the membrane hatch when Foth's communication subaltern swung away from the Villop choir he supervised. Commander, enemy vessels detected. On the approach. Foth rose halfway out of his chair. What? Warships and starfighter squadrons, the subaltern elaborated. Carr turned to the transparency. A score of ships were streaming out from behind Selvaris's small moon. In advance of the convoy, others had emerged from what the enemy called hyperspace. He could almost hear the war cries of the starfighter pilots. An ambush, Foth said in confused disbelief. A stout peace brigader burst into the command chamber. We were told this route was secure. How did the Alliance learn of our plans? Foth gaped at the human. This, this can't be. The man snorted in scorn and pointed out the transparency. Take a look, Commander. 
Unless you do something fast, we're as good as space dust. Foth shot to his feet and hurried to the chamber's tactical niche, where a host of hovering blaze bugs were arranging themselves into a battle display. Lacking a Yamask to chaperone them, the best they could manage was a representation of the disposition of the vessels and warships, without providing information on weapons capacity or attack vectors. Carr, meanwhile, took a moment to study himself, for he knew exactly what had happened. The escaped prisoner, the mathematical equation spewed by the captive, what he guessed had been code. Commander Foth, he said without thinking, change the villips to spread word of our plight. Deploy Dovin Basils to protect our vessels. Order the Peace Brigade ships into defensive formation while we launch coral skippers. Foth's subaltern looked to his commander for authorization. Foth swallowed hard. Yes, yes, do as he says, quickly. The human narrowed his eyes in favor. Thank the gods someone is doing the thinking around here. Carr glared at him. It's a rescue operation. Stop your muttering and see to it that the rest of my prisoners are transferred to sacred pyre. Once the Oka membrane is retracted, order your people to go to weapons. Still grinning, the peace brigader tapped his forehead with the edge of his extended fingers. On my way, Commander. Carr reveled in the sound of the honorific, but only for a moment. Then he turned back to Foth. Are you confident you can tackle this? Foth lowered his gaze in uncertainty. I am here by dint of accident, Supreme Commander. You belong here. Carr approached him in fury. Boo, Foth, the honorific belongs to you unless you do something foolish to forfeit it. Foth raised his eyes and nodded. Command the prisoner ships to go to dark space immediately, Carr said. We can't afford to have them remain in the arena and engage. Foth's eyes opened wide. Flee in dishonor? Carr took hold of Foth's command cloak. Priorities, Commander. Supreme Overlord Shimra will honor you more for safeguarding his captives than for your enthusiasm to do battle. He let go of the cloak. Experience teaches one to distinguish between wisdom and eagerness. Foth swung to his subalterns and conveyed the order. Now launch the coral skippers, Carr instructed. The subalterns didn't bother to wait for authorization. Foth's proudly scarred face was ashen. But without a Yamask! Carr cut him off with a wave of his hand. If the pilots under the cognition hoods of the coral skippers don't know how to engage the enemy by now, they will never know, and they'll pay for their ignorance with dishonorable death. He motioned Foth to the Villop choir. Tell them so. Stir their hearts. Inflame them. Foth swallowed and nodded. I will. But where will you be? Carr tipped his head to one side. Did you not command me to take charge of the prisoners? Foth straightened to his full height. I did. Carr placed his hands atop Foth's broad shoulders. Command tests our will. Hold fast to your faith in Yun Yamka. Rise above the storm. But should the battle back you into a corner, you know where to find me. Foth snapped his fists to the opposite shoulders, following it with a gesture of us rock, a sign of gratitude and loyalty. Belek Chu, Supreme Commander. Weapons were already flaring in space, the enemy's laser cannons and proton torpedo launchers. Carr spun on his heel and rushed from the command chamber. This day would see him exonerated or dead. Twin Sun's squadron of battle-seasoned X-Wings emerged from hiding with wingtip lasers charged and stabilizers locked in attack position. The convoy of pod-shaped Peace Brigade freighters and their escort of war vessels was strung out in a long line that trailed past Selvaris's moon almost to the planet itself. A few of the freighters sported retrofitted turbolasers and other ranged weapons, but most were patched together and defenseless. Three of the Yuzhan Vong vessels were 120-meter-long spearheads of reddish-black coral, pitted with Dovin basal launchers and plasma-spitting weapons emplacements.
The pair of larger vessels were oval-shaped carrier analogs, equally well-armed, and sporting clusters of coral skippers affixed like shellfish to their bone-white hulls. Ensconced in Twin Suns 1, Jaina Solo flew point for the three squadrons under her command. Gloved hands gripped on the X-Wing's control stick, she chinned her helmet calm. All flights, form up on your leaders and keep your battle channels open for instructions. Scimitar leader, do you copy? Copy, Twin One, Colonel Ijix Harona said. Yellow Tanab leader, do you copy? Wes Jansen calmed back. Loud and clear, Twin One. The X-Wing's sensors painted blue and yellow bezels on the cockpit displays. Scimitar leader, your squadron has the number one carrier. Tanab leader... Those forward gunships are yours. Twin Sons will take the carrier umbilical to the brigade freighter. The rest of the convoy vessels are designated to Dozen, Black Moon, and Vanguard fighter squadrons. Named by Luke Skywalker for his double-starred homeworld of Tatooine, Twin Sons was made up of T-65A2s and XJ-3 X-Wings. Ijix Harona's scimitars were wedge-shaped A-Wings. Black Moon was E-Wings, and the Tanab Aces, a volunteer squadron, were yellow snub fighters adorned with black stripes. The dozen had originally been formed by Kip Duran, the vanguard by Jagged Fell and his Chiss comrades. The flanks of Jaina's white fighter still bore faint traces of running Voxin, Jedi hunting beasts bioengineered by the Yuzhan Vong, that had been added years earlier. Off to her right flew starfighters and armed transports that had decanted from hyperspace only moments earlier. She switched over to the command net. You there, Kip? Colonel Fell? Captain Saz? Affirmative, Colonel, Saz said from Black Moon One. Perched on your right shoulder, Kip Duran replied. The Nova Suns on the fuselage of his X-Wing were as faded as Twin Sun One's Voxin. Good to see you, he sent through the force. Acknowledging the extrasensory greeting, Jaina felt Kip join the force meld she shared with Lobaka and Alima Rar. The Wookiee and the Twi'lek were piloting Twin Suns 5 and 9, respectively. The meld was powerful, though nothing like the twin bond Jaina shared with Jason, even across the stars. Where's Jag? Colonel Fell, she asked. I thought the Chiss were going to participate. Vanguard was held back at Mon Calamari, Kip said. Something big is brewing. He sends his love, the Jedi Master added. The sending caught Jaina by surprise, and her face took on sudden color. Kip's remark couldn't have been better timed. Twin Sons, Scimitar, and the Yellow Aces are tasked, she told the recent arrivals firmly. Don't feel shy about asking for help if the gunships put up a fight, Black Moon Leader. Saz laughed. Thanks for the vote of confidence, Colonel. From its socket behind the X-Wing's canopy, Jaina's R2B3 unit, Cappy, relayed an urgent message to the cockpit. She studied the translation display screen and chinned her calm again. All pilots, sensors are showing intensifying hyperdrive emissions in the Peace Brigade freighters. Copy, Twin One, Harona said. They're ramping up to make the jump to light speed. Jaina reached for the throttle. They're not leaving without our permission. All flights move in to intercept and obstruct. Target hyperspace drives and shield generators. Be precise with your shots. We don't know where the prisoners are being held. Jaina watched Peace Brigade ships break formation, the lead freighters veering to either side, and midline vessels angling for cover behind Selvaris's moon. Elements of Kip's Dozen and Black Moon swept in to cut off the enemy ships. Jaina pulled back on the yoke and sent her craft into a predatory bank that would have knocked the wind from her in atmosphere, but here, with the inertial compensators enabled, felt like nothing more than a slow glide. Laser beams and molten projectiles streaked from the convoy escort ships, tearing into the ranks of starfighters. Two X-wings disappeared in globular explosions. Kip's dozen broke into four shield trios, accelerating in an attempt to overtake the fleeing freighters. 
Some of the Peace Brigade ships were faster than they looked. Thrusters blazing, they raced rimward, even with Black Moon and Scimitar starfighters hanging on their tails, raking fire across their hulls and engine nacelles, but the pursuit was ill-timed. I count one, two, three brigade ships away, Harona said, as the freighters made the jump to hyperspace and vanished. Should we go after them? Negative, Jaina said quickly. Their orders were to rescue as many prisoners as possible, not chase the enemy clear to Coruscant. Just make sure no others get past us. Kip's dozen hurtled forward to make sure that none did, paying out concussion missiles and torpedoes as necessary to corral the fleeing freighters. Poorly shielded, the unwieldy ships heaved two, one of them already immobilized. The carriers, however, were quick to react. Skips away! Harona's voice boomed in Jaina's headphones. Jaina slewed to starboard in time to see the enemy fighters drop from the undersides of their carriers and form up in clouds around the remaining freighters and Yuzhan Vong gunships. Perlescent red wedges of Yorick coral, the enemy fighters were nimble and lethal. The sight might have sent her heart racing had she not grown accustomed to the enemy's tactics. Still, she knew from personal experience not to underestimate the vitality of the coral skippers or the single-mindedness of their pilots. She allowed her sense of exhilaration to run its course, then eased back into the force meld. Lobaka, Alima, and Kip acknowledged their readiness. One flight, she said, changed to course 101 ecliptic. Set lasers for out-of-phase fire. Remember to toggle your grab safeties if Dovin Basils pull your shields. Lobaka and Alima touched her briefly through the force as their separate four-fighter contingents altered vectors accordingly and began to accelerate toward the tethered carrier. Following the route of Savong La's forces at Ebak 9 and almost a year of modest victories in remnant space, the Kornacht Cluster... Bakara and elsewhere, the war should have long been over. Galactic Alliance commanders Sav, Krife, Brand, Kian Farlander, Garmbel Iblis, and others were certain that they had dealt the Yuzhan Vong a death blow, and that subsequent engagements would be limited to mop-up operations. All the while, though, Yuzhan Vong shapers had been busy cooking up ways to re-establish parity, and slowly they had discovered the means to counter the weapons the Alliance had grown to rely on. Laser stutter fire, Yamask jammers, decoy Dovin basils, shadow bombs, and the rest. Then the Yuzhan Vong had gone a step farther by unleashing a horde of specially designed Dovin basils to gobble up or otherwise incapacitate Holonet relay stations throughout the galaxy. While the Alliance had tried valiantly to reinstate instantaneous communications, resorting to stationing warships in deep space to double as transponders, world after world had fallen to the enemy, conquered or surrendered without a fight. Finally, there had been the disastrous attempt by combined Alliance and Imperial Remnant forces to reclaim Bilbringi. The title of trickster was back in the hands of Supreme Overlord Shemra, and Jaina was only the sword she had been named on Moan Calamari in the Jedi knighting ceremony that had preceded the battle at Ebak 9. Make every shot count, she said. Reserve torpedoes and concussion missiles for the carrier. An organic-looking cofferdam still linked the Yuzhan Vong vessel to a Peace Brigade freighter. Between twin suns and the leashed ships, local space was target-rich with coral skippers. Begin your hull runs, Jaina commanded, straight down the convoy line. The X-Wing's sensor screens grew noisy with battle static as bursts of green coherent light streaked from the starfighter's weapons. Singularities fashioned by the coral skippers engulfed most of the bursts, but a few beams pierced the enemy defenses and found their targets. Spherical explosions blossomed, sending asymmetrical masses of Yorick coral spinning off into space. At the end of the first run, Jaina powered Twin Sun 1 through a tight turn, accelerated, and rocketed back into the thick of the fighting. Superheated ejecta surged from the Coral Skipper's volcano-like launchers, whipping past her canopy like fiery meteors. She wreathed through a tight grouping of enemy fighters, responding in kind, 
One skip scudded clear of her carefully timed bursts, but a second she caught off guard with steady fire, destroying it completely. She boosted power and chased the one that got away, her wingmate coming alongside her. The craggy lump of Dovin basil-driven coral climbed, then looped and descended, throwing everything it had at them. Twin Sun Three yawed hard to port, but not fast enough. The skip's Dovin basil lurched for the starfighter's shields. At the same time, two molten missiles were catching up with it. Overwhelmed, the deflectors failed, and the X-wing blew to pieces. One thing Jaina hadn't grown accustomed to was losing her teammates. At this point in the war, with every available veteran leading his or her own squadron, most of the pilots assigned to twin sons weren't much older than she was, and each and every death tore her apart. Anger flared in her, but only for a moment, before evanescing in the force. In eerie calm, she veered and pounced on the coral skipper while its organic defenses were preoccupied. Two precisely placed shots disabled it, and a third finished it. The skip coughed fluorescent puffs of vaporized coral, then disappeared in a short-lived ball of flame. Peeling away from the fireball, Jaina prowled for new targets. With the playing field leveled, courtesy of the enemy's aptitude for innovation, fighter engagements had become as ferocious as they had been at the start of the war, before effective countermeasures had come into play. Alliance forces held a slight advantage when coral skippers were flying without the assistance of a Yamask, but enemy pilots now had more authority over their ships than ever before, and were no longer as easily outwitted or outmaneuvered. Jaina ignored the displays of her rangefinder and computer-aided sights, and relied on the force to guide her to targets of opportunity. The battle channels were noisy with chatter. We can't clear a path for the transport with those skips hugging the carriers, Haruna was admonishing Scimitar Squadron. Three flight, you've got to take out that dorsal plasma launcher. Two flight, see if you can draw those skips away. We're trying, Scimitar Leader, but they won't take the bait. Copy that, then we'll just have to take the fight to them. Jaina saw that the same situation applied to the tethered carrier. The coral skippers were intent on protecting the vessel at all costs, or at least until it could detach from the Peace Brigade freighter. Close in, Twin Sun's two-flight salvoed, opening wrens in the Yorick coral ridges that shielded the vessel's drive Dovin basil. Jaina had the rest of her squadron tighten up their ragged formation and press the attack. When the X-wings began to score hits, the coral skippers reacted by dispersing. With patent disdain for evasionary tactics, the lead skip launched itself at Jaina. Then the entire swarm sallied forth from their protective positions. Twin one, single skip on your right wing, Alima warned. Thanks, Nine. Jaina wheeled away from a flurry of missiles, rolled, and came about. She and the opposing flight leader squared off and bored in on each other, their respective wingmates falling back too busy holding position and adapting to their leader's actions to do any firing. The skip opened a void directly in front of Jaina, but she managed to twist free in the nick of time. The X-wing bucked, then righted itself. Jaina thumbed the trigger of the lasers, pouring fire into the gravitic hole. The Dovin basil rushed to absorb the energy, leaving the coral skipper momentarily unprotected. It was all the time Jaina needed. The X-Wing's starboard lasers hammered the skip mercilessly, splitting it down the middle. Long plumes of incandescence streamed from the rend. Then the skip vanished in blinding light. Two and three flights were meeting with similar success. All discipline forgotten, the coral skippers were streaking away from the carrier in a flurry of maneuvers, even while crisscrossing lines of destruction probed for them. Off toward what was the head of the convoy, the first carrier had gone belly up. Off to both sides, Kip's Dozen and Black Moon were flying circles around three Peace Brigade ships whose laser cannon turrets were smoking ruins. And now Alliance gunships and transports were on their way into the arena, keen on filling themselves to bursting with liberated captives. Jaina ordered one and three flights to surround the umbilical carrier. She asked Lobaka to drop two flight back to field any skips that might attempt to break through the line. Kip calmed her. Just learned that Alliance agents have sabotaged the hyperdrives on all but one of the freighters. They're ours now. That's great news, Jaina said. 
Here's an even better piece. Your parents are here. Jaina smiled. I felt them. Her eyes followed a blip on the display screen that could only be the Millennium Falcon. It was headed her way. She hadn't seen her parents in weeks and had learned only the previous day that they had not only been responsible for providing intelligence on the convoy, but also volunteered for the rescue mission. Not that that surprised her in the least. She sent a greeting through the force. Her mother would know who it was from. It wasn't long before she could see the Falcon with her own eyes. Her parents were maneuvering the ship as deftly as if she were an X or Y wing, top and belly quad lasers, dispatching coral skippers unlucky enough to be in the way. A sleek alliance picket, bristling with weapons, flew in the Falcon's wake. As the two ships closed on the number two carrier, the picket fired a harpoon directly into the nose of the Peace Brigade freighter at the other end of the carrier's intestine-like cofferdam. Knock out harpoon, Twin Suns 4 said, like a giant hypodermic syringe filled with coma gas. By the time our people board, the brigaders will be out cold. Chapter 9 Transparent respirators clamped over their faces, and C-3PO shuffling behind them, Han and Leia emerged from the crippled freighter's docking bay into the large cargo hold beyond. Everywhere they looked, peace brigaders of various species were passed out on the deck or slumped unmoving against bulkheads. The cargo area was already filled with three squads of Alliance strike troops whose ship had harpooned the freighter and who'd been the first to board. The strike troops wore mimetic enviro suits and black helmets with tinted face bowls. Each was laden with blaster rifles, bandoliers of flash grenades, thermal detonators, half-meter-long vibroblades, and survival gear. Specialists in rapid deployment and infiltration, strike troops were a relatively new addition to the war and most of the ones in the cargo hold had participated in months of familiarization drills aboard captured Yuzhan Vong vessels. Han was certain that other squads had already penetrated deep into the ship. Three troopers were slapping manacles on the unconscious brigaders. He and Leia scarcely had time to take stock of the situation when a hatch in the forward bulkhead pocketed itself, and a Klatuinian stepped into the hold. Twenty blaster rifles swung to the green-complected, scrunch-faced humanoid before he could so much as raise his taloned hands in surrender. I'm Habyo, he said. A breather mask dangled around his thick neck. The one who sabotaged the hyperdrive. Surprise party, he added. Surprise party. A human colonel signaled everyone to lower their weapons. Next time, give the code words first, before you come barging into a secured area, he snapped. You're lucky you didn't get yourself killed. Habio relaxed somewhat. You won't find any prisoners aboard the freighter. They were transferred to the Yuzhan Vong carrier. Which way? the colonel demanded. The Klatuinian pointed to port. The umbilical is attached to the cargo hold adjacent this one. Leaving several soldiers behind to tend to the stirring brigaders, the colonel motioned the rest into the broad passageway that separated the holds. Satisfied that it was safe to do so, Han pulled off his respirator and almost gagged. What the heck are they transporting? he asked through the hand he clasped to his mouth. Rotten eggs? Leia took a quick whiff and snugged her mask back in place. Is that the coma gas? Habio shook his head. The stench comes from the Vong cofferdam. Air circulators carry the smell throughout the ship. But you get used to it. Speak for yourself, Han said. He motioned with his chin to the passageway. You coming? As soon as I provide identities of the peace brigaders. Han nodded and waved to C-3PO. Let's go, Goldenrod. The droid started. Sir, wouldn't it be best if I remained aboard Millennium Falcon? Cock, Mame, and me, Wall, can take care of the Falcon. We might need you to translate. Translate? But, Captain Solo, I'm far from fluent in Yuzhan Vong. In fact, I'm still trying to comprehend the conditional subjunctive tense. Han made a face. You've never had trouble making yourself understood, 3PO. Now get going. He and Leia led the way into the portside cargo hold. 
Hans spied the cofferdam entrance and ran for it, only to stop short at the mouth, then half-turn and flatten his back against the bulkhead. "'You really don't want to see this,' he said as Leia approached. She studied him in puzzlement. Han was a bit wide-eyed and shaking his head back and forth. "'What are you talking about?' she asked. "'Remember that time on Dantooine, when I got the Balmora flu? "'Well, this thing,' he jerked his thumb toward the cofferdam opening, "'is what I figure the inside of my nose must have looked like.' Leia smiled dubiously and stepped around him. "'It can't be that bad.' She froze. "'Why, it's an Oka!' C-3PO said, standing somewhat akimbo at the entrance. The word derives from the proboscis of a Yuzhan Vaughn pack animal. The floor is what is sometimes referred to as a microbial mat, and the viscous liquid drooling from the ceiling actually houses the bacteria that engineered the entire tube. I told you he'd come in handy, Han said. C-3PO disappeared into the organic coffer dam, sloshing along the puddled floor, his voice echoing wetly. Oh, yes, tiny white arachnids, similar to those that can sometimes be found inhabiting volcanic vents. Han was staring at Leia. I hate microbial mats. Maybe there's another way. I don't think so, Han. He firmed his lips. All right, you first. Just don't touch anything. They covered the hundred meters in record time, eyes forward and arms straight at their sides. By the time they emerged in the Yuzhan Vaughn carrier, Leia's legs were drenched to the knee in foul-smelling liquid. They could tell which way the strike troops had gone by the gaping holes the soldiers had blown in membranous interior bulkheads and iris portals. Bioluminescent lichen lent a cheerless green light to the carrier's meandering internal passageways. Fluid seeped from gently pulsing walls and strands of connective tissue where passageways intersected. The air was rich in oxygen but pungent. They stepped through a torn membrane into a spacious hold whose Yorick coral deck might have been pink ferrocrete. Leia ignited her lightsaber. From the ships forward came the sounds of war cries and muffled shouts, blaster fire, and the dull thudding of amphistaff strikes. I guess coma gas doesn't work on the Yuzhan Vong, Leia said. Yeah, too bad about that. They sprinted toward the sounds of battle, rounding a corner to see allies and enemies down, smears of red and black on the floor, refreshment for a host of tongue-like creatures that were gorging on the spilled blood. Han shot from the hip, dropping a Yuzhan Vong warrior with a kufi dagger in each hand. With a downward slash, Leia cut the legs out from under another who had launched himself at her. Hands pressed to his head, C-3PO issued a litany of mirthless exclamations and laments. They followed the strike troops farther forward. The soldiers held their blasters at high port, sweeping them from side to side. They advanced in leapfrogging squads, waving signals to one another, overwhelming amphistaffs with continuous bursts, or concentrating blaster fire on Von Doon crab armor weak points. Then searing the exposed flesh beneath. With or without weapons, with or without their living arthropod armor, the enemy warriors continued to attack, always choosing death over surrender where there was an option. Stepping over sprawled bodies, Han, Leia, and a squad of troops reached another intersection. The squad leader was trying to decide which fork to take when Habio finally caught up with him. The prisoners are on the upper deck, in a hold aft of the command chamber. The Klaatuanian edged his way into the intersection and gestured. This way! A steeply sloped corridor led up to the carrier's command deck. At the top of the slope, two strike troops had a peace brigader in custody. A strong smell of glitter stim spice wafted from the human's uniform. He says that most of the warriors took to coral skippers when we attacked, the tallest of the soldiers reported. The only ones left on board are the officers. The brigader led the rest of the way to the forward hold. There, squashed together inside a sticky net, sat three Yuzhan Vong. One wore a command cloak that hung from bony implants on the tops of his shoulders. The strike troop's colonel was circling them proudly, with his hands planted on his hips, thumbs backward. We took these three by surprise and webbed them before they knew what hit them. 
Across the hold, fifty or so Alliance prisoners of various species were stuck to the deck in a pool of blorash jelly. Han! Leia! One of them called out. The speaker was a thick-set human with pleasant, if undistinguished, features and a full salt and pepper beard. Judder Page, Han said, grinning as he approached. He scanned other faces in the crowd. And Posh! Kraken nodded his head in greeting. Rescued by celebrities. I'm positively humbled. Leia glanced at the Blorash jelly and folded her arms across her chest. We're not out of this yet. Han squatted down in front of Captain Page. If we'd known you were on Salvaris, we wouldn't have left without you. Page shook his head in bafflement. You were at Salvaris? We picked up one of your escapees, Han explained. A Janet. Garbin. Thorsh. Kraken said in obvious relief. How else do you think we knew about the convoy? Thank the Force, Page mumbled. Wedge sends his regards, Han said. He says he's sorry about Bill Bringy, and even sorrier that rescuing you took as long as it did. Page mustered a smile. I'm going to kiss him when I see him. I'd be careful about that, Han said. He might just send you back. Leia studied the Blorash jelly. We need to get you out of this. Habio dragged the stout Peace Brigader forward. He knows how the stuff works. The man's spice-clouded eyes darted to the captured Yuzhan Vong officers and widened in fear. You'll have to kill me, because if you don't, they will. Leia went to him. We'll make you a better offer. We'll take you with us. You'll stand trial, serve time for your war crimes, be rehabilitated, and released in twenty years. Otherwise, we leave you here, and we give the Yuzhan Vong every reason to believe that you were the one who tipped us off about the convoy. Maybe they won't kill you right away. Maybe they'll even take you with them. But you're going to find it a lot harder to get glitter stem on Coruscant than in a Galactic Alliance prison. And you know how excruciating withdrawal can be. The human gulped and found his voice. All right. He nodded to the Blorash pool. Arson salts. Han stepped close to Leia. Your mind tricks are a lot more subtle than your brother's. Leia smiled. I win by guile. You don't have to tell me. The strike troops searched their utility belts, broke open capsules of arson salts, and began to sprinkle them over the pool. When Han and Leia had yanked Captain Page free of the liquefying mass, he walked directly to the netted Yuzhan Vong and went down on his haunches in front of the one with the longest hair. Something you want to say to this one? Han asked in interest. Because our droid speaks fluent enemy. C-3PO protested. Captain Solo, I... Not necessary, Han. Page interrupted. Molly Carr speaks fluent basic. He was commander of the Salvaris camp has a particular fondness for subjecting prisoners and droids to immolation pits. Han proffered his blaster to Page. No one here will think any the less of you. Page shook his head. I know how important we were to Shimra, and Malik Carr is going to show up on Coruscant empty-handed. He grinned. He'll get his due from his own kind. Unless, of course, he kills himself in dishonor beforehand. A strike troop officer hurried into the hold. Enemy reinforcements coming out of hyperspace. We need to move. The colonel looked baffled. So soon? The Vong must have gotten off a distress call, sir. Have the transports docked? One or two. Han stepped forward. We can cram eighty or so aboard the Falcon. He looked at the colonel. Can you take the rest? We'll have to. Captain Page, Malik Carr called out. I'll live to see you on a sacrificial pyre before Yuzhan Tar completes a quarter orbit round its star. Page approached him once more. On the off chance we do meet again, keep this thought tucked into that warped brain of yours. Fifty of my people died because of you, and the next time I won't be nearly as charitable with you as I was here. In a mad dance, Jaina circled the stricken Yuzhan Vaughn carrier, dueling coral skippers with each dive and traverse. The battle rolls had been reversed. 
Now starfighter squadrons were the defenders and skips the aggressors, surging forward to harry and engage at every opportunity. Harona's scimitar and West Jansen's yellow aces were similarly deployed around Carrier One, with several of the Peace Brigade freighters incapacitated by Alliance gunships. Black Moon and the dozen were flying escort for the rescue transports. Millennium Falcon had followed a strike troop gunship into the docking bay of the freighter tethered to Carrier Two, but almost an hour had passed and neither ship had emerged. A transport was on its way to docking, but had suddenly stopped, adding to Jaina's vague sense of unrest. She reached out for her mother, but all she felt in return was rushed activity and deep concern. In conversation with veterans of protracted wars, Jaina had been advised to accept that the final stage of any conflict was often the worst. More dislocating than the initial periods of surprise and chaos, and more dispiriting than the intermediate periods, after the deaths had begun to mount up, and it could seem as if the killing might go on forever. But it was the end stage that was most dangerous. A period of improbable alliances and unexpected reversals, some owing to overconfidence, others born of fear and desperation. Jaina gave scant attention to any of this, except during the lulls in battle, when her thoughts sought escape from the tableaus of fiery explosions and crippled ships. As the Minoc flew, Bill Bringy was almost a neighbor of Selvaris, and the recent battle there was almost emblematic of the odd pairings and reversals Jaina had been warned to expect. The operation had been the first since Esfandia that combined alliance and imperial elements, and the disabling of the Holonet had been one of the war's biggest surprises yet. Now, with Luke, Mara, Jason, and other Jedi incommunicado, she was waiting for the other boot to drop. She thought about her parents, and returned her gaze to the docking bay of the freighter. There was still no sign of the Falcon. She was about to calm mission control for an update when the X-Wing's tactical screens came alive with enemy blips. Heads up, she said over the battle channel, vessels decanting from hyperspace. That was why the transports had stopped, Jaina told herself. Everyone had been expecting reinforcements to show up, but not so soon. She waited for the authenticators to display data on what the sensors had picked up. They appear to be coral skippers, Harona said. Approaching from starward of Selvaris. I make it three stacked triangles of six skips. Jaina shook her head. Coral skippers lacked the ability to travel through hyperspace unassisted. Scimitar leader, that can't be right. Twin sons one, West Jansen said. These blips don't match anything in the battle log. Tanab one, my instructions agree, Jaina calmed. We should have visual in a matter of seconds. What the long-range scanners showed made her sit up straighter in the X-Wing's contoured seat. The fighters, if indeed that was what they were were made up of three Yorick coral triangles joined apex to base. The leading two triangles showed mica-like canopies, while the third and largest was flared at the rear and sported a long, up-curving tail, perhaps to augment Dovin basal impulsion, which in a coral skipper was often located in the nose. From the forward segments of the scaled fuselage sprouted six legs, three pairs to each side, veined in blue and tipped with launcher ports for plasma missiles. Twin Sun Three whistled in surprise. They look like Azarin sting crawlers. More like Foxin, Jaina thought. Close ranks and form up on me, she said quickly. Anyone short on firepower to the center. Stick with your wingmates until we see what these things are capable of. Enemy is breaking formation, Harona announced. Here they come. The formations of snarling skips surged forward with incredible speed, their sextets of launchers disgorging plasma in steady streams. Deliberately, Jaina placed herself in the path of one projectile and was immediately sorry she had. Cappy shrieked in distress, and the X-Wing's shields fell to fifty percent. She tumbled away from second and third projectiles, allowing time for the shields to recharge. All pilots keep clear of these things. They pack a wallop. The warning did not come soon enough. The battle net grew frantic with exclamations. Twin six and seven are down. Scimitar reporting four casualties. 
Tanab 10, pull out. Divert power to your shields. Jaina glanced over her right shoulder and saw Twin Suns 2 fly apart. This can't be happening, she thought. Sting crawlers have broken through our lines, Twin Suns 6 said. They're going directly for the transports. Jaina pulled hard on the yoke, climbing back toward Carrier 1 at maximum boost. Twin Suns, disengage and regroup. Screen formation on my mark. She issued the command, and the remaining starfighters formed up once again. They chased the coral skippers flat out, wending through continuous volleys of incandescent fire. Scimitar's calling for backup at Carrier 1. Enemy fighters are taking up positions around our transports. We can't fire without risking collateral damage. All pilots, weapons on number one carrier are active. Repeat. The rest of Scimitar 3's words were erased by an agonized scream. Jaina hurtled into the fray, thumb pressed on the trigger, only to watch her stutter fire bursts disappear into the yawning mouths of enormous gravity wells fashioned by the skip's doven basils. Was the convoy a cleverly engineered ruse, she asked herself? Disinformation to lure the Alliance into a trap? But that couldn't be. If so, the Yuzhan Vong would have capital ships and a Yamask vessel. They would have struck before any of the prisoners had been rescued and transferred to the transports. Lobaka growled a warning. Four blazing missiles had Jaina's name on them. She slalomed successfully through the first three, but the fourth nicked the port stabilizer and sent the X-wing into a rapid spin. She calmed herself and regained control, emerging from the spin in time to see a transport explode directly in front of her. Sudden anguish kept her stunned for a moment. Then she swerved away from the fragment cloud and went searching for the guilty Skip. Kip and Alima Rar sent a sudden alert to her through the force. She rolled the X-Wing onto its back. The Falcon had launched from the freighter's docking bay and was making fast for clear space, a Galactic Alliance gunship right behind. Twisting free of engagements, four enemy fighters converged on the Falcon. Jaina tried to establish contact with her parents, but the battle channel was screeching with static. Mom! The Falcon was jarred by missiles her parents either hadn't seen coming or were unable to avoid. In her mind's eye, Jaina could see Han taking the ship through a repertoire of evasive maneuvers. And yet the enemy pilots of the Stingcrawler skips were clearly anticipating the Falcon's every move. Jaina, Alima, and Twin Eleven and Twelve flew to the freighter's rescue, battering the skips from behind. But the Yuzhan Vong fighters refused to be distracted from their target. In a moment of blind rage, Jaina dropped her guard and was struck from starboard. Slewing helplessly, she watched Eleven and Twelve shatter. The enemy was on a killing spree. All flights go to proton torpedoes. Brilliant orbs of energy streaked forward and disappeared. The sting crawler skip's singularities were swallowing four times what a normal skip was capable of dealing with. Jaina flinched with each Magna missile that hit the Falcon. The freighter shields were holding, but the Falcon was literally rattling around inside them. Three skips accelerated, determined to overtake their quarry. Quad lasers spraying fire in all direction, the Falcon tipped up on her starboard side, only to take a devastating blow to the belly. One skip sustained a broadside hit and went careening into a Peace Brigade ship, opening a ragged breach and sending the ship into a dizzying rollover. The Falcon and the gunship were almost clear enough to go to hyperspace. Jaina imagined herself in the outrigger cockpit, throwing switches and actuators, pushing the hyperspace lever forward. The sometimes unreliable Nava computer counting down before the ship could make the jump to light speed. Hurry, she said to herself, hurry. The detonation nearly threw Leia out of her seat harness. Han's hands were white-knuckled on the yoke. Cinched into the cockpit's high-backed rear chairs, Kraken and Page extended their arms to keep themselves upright. The other rescued officers were packed into the forward cabin and wherever else they could fit. How much more of this can the Falcon take? Page asked. As much as she needs to, Han growled, without meaning to. Leia thought she heard uncertainty beneath the bluster. Han adjusted his headset mic. Cockme, meanwhile, don't ease up on those guns. I don't care if they are overheating. Right now they're the only things keeping those skips away from us. 
Han sent the Falcon on edge to evade a trio of enemy ships, escaping with only a bone-rattling hit to the freighter's midsection. Streaking past the wraparound viewport flew two dual-piloted coral skippers. Han's jaw dropped slightly and he looked over his shoulder at Kraken. Posh, what kind of skips are those? I've never seen anything like them. Have you guys seen anything like them? Kraken shook his head. Never too late in the game for surprise, is it? Page said. Han blew out his breath. Guess not. The muffled report of an explosion reached the cockpit from aft. That didn't sound good, Leia said. Han's eyes darted to the display screens, then widened. It's worse than it sounded, but we're not done yet. Han reached forward to toggle switches, reallocating power to the rear shields. Can we make light speed? Kraken asked. While I have a breath in me. Away to starboard, punched by an enemy fighter, a Peace Brigade fighter cracked open, belching fire, atmosphere, and a whirlwind of debris. Han pounded the console with his fist. Nice shooting, cockmame. He paused, then said, All right, all right, the kill's yours, Miwal. He pivoted in his chair and smiled lopsidedly. They think this is some kind of... The cockpit turned blinding white. Han's words swirled to nothingness, and time slowed for an indeterminate period. A second explosion of intense light followed. A wave of concussive sound barreled into the cockpit through the sliding hatch, and Leia's ears popped. C-3PO let out a wail from somewhere aft. "'Shields are down to forty percent, she said when she could. Han could scarcely hear her. He reached over his left shoulder, his hand knowing precisely where to go, like that of a musician at a keyboard. Finished with whatever adjustments he had made, he smiled for show. Leia heard him mumble, "'Come on, baby, hold together just twenty seconds more.' He caught her watching him. "'Don't worry.' She shrugged. "'Who's worrying?' The Falcon took her worst hit yet. A tangle of blue energy danced over the Nava computer. A single rivulet of sweat coursed from Han's hairline to his set jaw. Leia faced forward, staring straight ahead. Now I'm worried. Without looking at her, Han counted down. Ten, nine, eight. Seven, six, five, four. Three was on the tip of Jaina's tongue when the Falcon was hit hard from behind, the force of the enemy projectiles practically kicking the freighter forward. The ion drives failed for an instant, and pieces flew from the stern, one of them streaking across the nose of Jaina's X-wing. Her mother's distress was palpable. Then the Falcon was gone, propelled into a hyperspace, but with four enemy skips following suit. As the Yuzhan Vong had first demonstrated at the Eclipse base years earlier, they were capable of tracking ships through hyperspace by means of a self-heating, vacuum-hardened fungus that forced tachyons from a ship in faster-than-light transit. All pilots, did anyone get a bearing on the Falcon? Negative twin one, came a chorus of replies. The Operation Rally Point was Mon Calamari, but Jaina recognized that the Falcon's jump to light speed had been desperate, and she doubted that the Nava computer had had time to plot an accurate trajectory. There were thousands, perhaps tens of thousands, of possible hyperspace exit points between Selvaris and Mon Calamari. Apprehension slowed her responses, even while her thoughts raced. Twin sons, fall back to protect the transports, she said when she had gotten hold of herself. We're taking them home. Chapter 10 Single file, Luke, Mara, Corin, Jason, and Saba trailed Danny Kui down into the canyon, where they hoped to find the Yuzhan Vong priest, Harar. With the vines that secured the platform hoists hopelessly tangled, they followed a circuitous route of ramps and ladders. Rain was still falling in rippling sheets, and the Jedi had their heads lowered and the hoods of their sopping cloaks raised. Below, partially concealed under a swirling blanket of fog, the swollen river roared. They were traversing the second tier when Danny stopped and gestured to a small cliff dwelling where light flickered in the crude window openings. It was unoccupied, so we didn't bother asking for permission to use it, she said, loud enough to be heard by everyone. 
They were twenty meters from the dwelling when a group of eight Faroan males stepped from the gloom of a natural cave to intercept them. Slender humanoids with pale blue skin, they were not indigenous to Zonama Seacote, but had been brought to the living world generations earlier. Their simple trousers and shirts clung to their bodies, and water ran from their angry faces. In his left hand, their apparent leader, Senshi, held a glow stick that cast a misty sphere of light around them. You captured a Yuzhan Vong, he said, breath clouds accompanying his words. Luke shook his head. He was found wounded and brought here to be healed. Not wounded by any of us, Senshi said, though deserving of whatever injuries he sustained for what he and the others caused to happen. Shortly after Luke and the other Jedi had first arrived on Zonama Seacoat, Senshi, at Seacoat's insistence, had helped carry out a counterfeit kidnapping of Danny Kui as a means of testing the Jedi. A farmer by trade, he had gold-speckled eyes and close-cropped hair that had darkened to gray-blue with age. Having lost several family members and friends during the crossings from known space, he was ambivalent about Seacoat's decision to return. We don't know yet who or what was responsible, Luke said. We're hoping the Yuzhan Vong will explain. He advanced a step, but no one in the group moved. You could hurl us aside with a thought, Senshi said, but you won't, if you're a true servant of the Force. Luke lowered his hood and gazed at him. And if you serve the Force... You'll allow us to pass. The Faroan gestured toward the cliff dwelling. As an enemy of Zonama Seacote, the Yuzhan Vong should be ours to deal with. To deal with how? Luke asked calmly. Will torturing or killing him return Zonama Seacote to Mobus? Have you asked yourselves how Seacote might react to your taking matters into your own hands? Look around you, Jedi, another pharaoh, and said, Have you ever witnessed Zonama thus? Not one of us has. For all any of us knows, Seacote could be unconscious, or worse. Luke considered mentioning Jabitha's spectral visit to his and Mara's dwelling, but decided that Seacote must have had some reason for not appearing to and reassuring the pharaohans as well. Give us a chance to talk with the Yuzhan Vong before you decide on a course of action, he said after a moment. The Pharaohans mulled over Luke's proposal. Only if one of us is present, Senshi answered for all of them. Which of you? Luke asked, glancing at everyone. A young man with white hair stepped forward. I will go. I am called Maid. Luke nodded. Then it's decided. The Pharaohans separated into two groups, allowing the Jedi unobstructed access to the cliff dwelling. Luke and the rest came out of the rain to find Harar seated on the floor by the hearth, his long legs stretched out in front of him. His face and body were battered, and his front teeth were broken. Tekli stood to one side, ministering to his injuries. Rodent-like, though bipedal, the Chadra Fan looked positively diminutive next to her tall, bandaged patient. Each of the priest's hands was missing two digits, but their absence had nothing to do with the injuries he had sustained on Zonama Seacoat. Thick as a mane, his glossy black hair draped over his tattoo-covered shoulders. Tahiri Vela, whose own forehead bore traces of Yuzhan Vong markings, was conversing with him quietly in Yuzhan Vong. Danny had assured Luke that Harar was unarmed. Tahiri was about to introduce Luke and the others when Harar cut her off with a motion of his hand. I will speak to them in your tongue. His drooping eyes darted briefly to Tahiri. Though I may look to you for clarification from time to time. His gaze returned to the Jedi, settling on each in turn. Luke regarded the priest for a long moment, then said, I am Luke Skywalker. This is my wife, Mara. Harar's eyes lit up in obvious recognition of the names. The master of the Jedi, and the one who fell victim to Kum spores, he added, referring to Mara, who had been cured of the disease only with the birth of her son, Ben. Luke continued. 
you've already met Tahiri and Corin, and by now Tekli and Danny. He gestured to his right. That leaves only Saba, Jason, and Maid, whose world you obviously came to destroy. Jason Solo, Harar said, in what might almost have been taken for awe. I have observed you from afar, young Jedi, figuratively and literally. Luke tucked his hands into the sleeves of his cloak and sat down opposite Harar on a short-legged stool. You seem to know more about us than we know about you. Perhaps you're willing to correct that. Perhaps. The rest of the Jedi and Maid sat down in a loose semicircle. You told Corin and Tahiri that you, Nen Yim, and the Prophet were seeking answers from Zonama Seacote. Nothing more. Harar nodded. We kept to ourselves that each of us had a separate agenda. He paused briefly. Nen Yim was a shaper, at one time apprentice to Mejan Quad, who attempted to remake Tahiri into one of us on the world you know as Yavin 4. Shimra had tasked Nen Yim to analyze an organic ship that was grown here, on Zonama Seacoat. In doing so, she made a remarkable discovery that appears in many ways to link this world with the Yuzhan Vong. She came here seeking verification of her theories. As for Yu Sha, the prophet, well, his alleged reason for accompanying us was to determine if Zonama Seacoat could be of some use to the heretical movement he helped organize among the shamed ones on Yuzhan Tar. And your reason? Mara asked. Of less noble principle, Harar said. I suspected that shaper Nen Yim was also a heretic, though of a different order. I suspected further that Shimra was aware of her unorthodox practices, which meant that he too was a heretic. Finally, I was interested in unmasking Yu Sha, and in determining whether or not he was genuine in his beliefs. The prophet killed Nen Yim and left you for dead, Luke said. Was that because you and Nen Yim succeeded in unmasking him? No. His purpose was to make certain that we didn't survive to share in the glory of destroying Zonama Seacoat. Harar looked at Luke. As it happens, you know him. Luke waited. He is none other than Nom Anor. It was nothing Luke hadn't already heard from Corin and Tahiri, but he had wanted to hear it from the priest. We know that, Mara said, breaking the silence. But something isn't right. Nome Anor may have come here masquerading as the prophet, but I can't accept that Nome Anor is the one who has been influencing the shamed ones to place their faith in the Jedi. I confess to being astonished as well, Harar said. But you must understand, because of what happened at Ebak 9, Nome Anor had little option but to place himself as far as possible from Shimra's reach, which is not an easy thing to do. In Yuzhan Tar's underground places, Nome Anor probably fell in with the heretics, and gradually saw some advantage to becoming their chief instigator and voice. Now that doesn't surprise me, Mara said. But he must have realized that Zonama Seacoat can provide an end to the war, Luke said. So why attempt to destroy it when his followers stood to gain the most? Harar shook his head. I can only speculate. Perhaps his actions here have enabled him to reintegrate himself with Shemra. For Shemra fears this world more than you know. It has always been Nom Anor's desire to be escalated and the possibility of escalation may have been reason enough for him to forsake the heretics who placed their trust in him. It's also plausible that Nome Anor has been working secretly for Shimra all the while, even as the prophet. Shimra may have wished to create a perceived problem on Yuzhan Tar to distract the elite from more pressing problems regarding the war and the rebellious nature of Yuzhan Tar's world brain or he may have planned to use the growing heresy as justification for ridding our society of undesirables and pariahs. 
Harar sighed with purpose. Nomanor is a consummate infidel. He thinks only of his own ambitions. He glanced around the small room, but it appears that he was unsuccessful in eliminating Zonama Seacoat as a potential threat to his and Shimra's plans. That remains to be seen, Corin said, either as a result of Nomanor's actions or as a way of protecting itself Zonama Seacoat jumped into hyperspace. To where? We've yet to learn. Maybe deeper into the unknown regions. Maybe closer to known space. If this rain ever stops, we may be able to figure out where we are. But so far, Seacoat hasn't seen fit to help us. Seacoat, Hara repeated. Zonama's guiding intelligence, Jason said. Hara absorbed it. Yet more similarities with Yuzhan Tar. Or Coruscant, as we like to call it, Corin said roughly. Harar glanced at him and smiled faintly. I speak not of your reshaped galactic capital, but of the primordial homeworld of the Yuzhan Vong. Well before she died at Nomanor's hand, Nen Yim had come to believe that this world is startlingly similar to the descriptions of Yuzhan Tar that have passed down to us in history and legends. The priest turned to Maid. More, that the Pharaohans are what we ourselves might have become. Deep sorrow tugged at Harar's scarified features. These realizations saddened and shattered Nen Yim's faith, as indeed they have shattered mine. We know that one of your early reconnaissance fleets Happened on Zonama Seacoat, Jason said, while it was still in known space. Happened on is hardly the proper phrase, young Jedi. As I said, there is much that links Zonama Seacoat to the Yuzhan Vong. Nen Yim discovered many similarities that cannot be attributed to coincidence. Zonama Seacoat and the Yuzhan Vong can only have had access to the same protocols in fashioning ships and other devices. Ships, yes, Luke said, but the engines that drive Seacoat and ships are not organic, Harar. The priest waved in dismissal, nor are they made of Yorick coral, but what matters is that they are grown. He shrugged. Untrained in the Shaper's arts, I can't provide the proof you desire, but I know in my heart what is true and what isn't. Why didn't you ever attempt to return to Zonama Seacoat after the first encounter? Jason asked. Because few knew of the encounter. Harar fell silent for a moment, then said, I will tell you things I didn't reveal to Nen Yim, or Nomanor if only to further an understanding between us. There were rumors during the final days of the reign of Quariel, Shimra's predecessor, that a living world had been discovered. Rumors, too, that Quariel's priests had interpreted the encounter as a sign that we should avoid contact with your galaxy. The ancient texts make clear the existence of a world that was anathema to us one that could well prove our undoing. You invaded anyway, Mara said. Harar nodded. We were dying. Shimra recognized this. Emboldened by his domain, he usurped Quariel's throne and directed the world ship convoy to continue as planned, granting his full blessing to the invasion, assuring everyone that the gods had informed him that your galaxy was to be our new home providing that we could cleanse it, or at least convert all of you to the truth. No mention was made of the living world. Those of less than elite rank accepted on faith that Shimra had received the divine word. Shimra is not one to be trifled with in any case. When the invasion progressed easily, many of us set aside our doubts. We convinced ourselves that Shimra's decision was correct, and that the gods were favoring us. Only of late has doubt reared its head once more. The heretical movement, the defeat at Ebak 9, the continuing problems on Yuzhan Tar. Harar looked at Jason, which I suspect owe something to you, young Jedi. 
and to Verger. You knew her? Jason asked in surprise. Better than you, and yet obviously not nearly as well. She was one of the samples returned to the world ship convoy by reconnaissance ships. She became the familiar of Priestess Falong, then eventually of Priestess Elon, of the Deception Sect, who served aboard my vessel. Harar smiled lightly when I had a vessel. Elon, Luke said with narrowed eyes. The priest took a moment to puzzle it out. Ah, yes, I'd almost forgotten about the plan to poison the Jedi with Boathouse. Foolishly devised. Whatever became of poor Elan? She died horribly. Of Boathouse poisoning, Mara said sharply. Verger was a Jedi, Jason said with some pride. Harar was unfazed. So I subsequently learned. He appraised Jason, then Luke, Mara, and the others. I have been preoccupied with you from the very start. Not in the same way Savong La was preoccupied, nor as Noma Nor continues to be. His gaze favored Luke. We are not as dissimilar as you would like to believe. Luke grinned lightly. I would like to believe that we are, in fact, very similar, and that you exist in the Force, as does all life. The enigmatic Force, Harar said slowly. But consider this, Master Jedi. We revere life as much, if not more, than you do. The Force gives you strength. The gods give us strength. Like you, we feel the craving to merge fully with life. To feel, sense, experience the interconnectedness of all things. As indeed is embodied by Zonama Seacoat. Luke was reminded of his rigorous conversations with Verger. There's one major difference between us. We accept that what doesn't take the Force into consideration is false. Harar shrugged. What doesn't take the gods into consideration is false. To us, you embody a dark power seemingly as the Sith did to the Jedi of old. And yet, if the Sith borrowed of the Force, much as you do, how then were they dark? Because they disagreed with your views? The Sith sowed destruction and chaos in service to dark designs. They exercised absolute power to achieve their ends. They didn't revere the Force. They had reverence only for the power it afforded them. They saw their way as the only way. As the Yuzhan Vong do, Harar said, and you aver not to. You worship pain, Mara said. Harar shook his head. If they could be persuaded to answer truthfully, Jason and Tahiri would tell you otherwise. We accept that birth into life is pain because it is separation from the gods, or the force, if you will. But since we would not exist without the gods and their sacrifice, we thank the gods by emulating them and giving of ourselves in their name. Pain is our means of reuniting with Yun Yuzhan. We wonder why the gods created us, only to have us suffer all our lives in order to return to them. But this is unknowable. The creative cannot but create, and this is what the gods do. These things are beyond our understanding, and we accept them as being beyond our understanding. If our teachings are false, then they will pass away. Until that time, we must abide by them. Perish by them, you mean? Corin said. Perhaps. But this is all so much talk. I fear that the gods now look upon the Yuzhan Vong with disfavor. I first realized this when Commander Kali La believed that Jaina Solo had become an aspect of Yun Harla, the trickster. Then I watched Supreme Commander Chul Kang La be taken in at Borlias by the so-called Operation Star Lancer, and now tens of thousands of shamed ones have allowed themselves to be beguiled by a self-serving heretic. Harar lowered his gaze and shook his head. Having appointed ourselves Yun Yuzhan's instrument, assuming the license to purge, to punish, and to sanctify, to kill by the millions those who do not share our world view, we have become blasphemers against our own religion. 
we have become a weak species, desperate to prove our strength to our gods. Luke leaned forward, resting his forearms on his knees. If Shimra understood this, could he be persuaded to end the war? Shimra hates the sound of reasoned words, nor would any of the elite be persuaded, save perhaps those who have secretly remained faithful to Quarial, and whose goal it has been to bring evidence of this world to Yuzhan Tar, and expose Shimra to demonstrate that he violated the taboo and invaded, and that his actions may have damned all of us. The priest fell silent for a long moment, then said, Answer one question for me. Can Zonama Seacoat help you defeat us? Is it indeed a weapon? Luke touched his jaw. It has that capability. Harar exhaled slowly and sadly. Then no wonder Shimra fears it so. It is as prophesied. He looked questioningly at Luke. Will you kill me now? Sacrifice me to the Force? That's not our way, Luke said. Harar's initial confusion gave way to resolution. Then if you would allow me, I wish to help bring about a resolution between your varied species and mine. Or do I begin to sound like Elon, promising one thing, but determined to deliver another? Mara, Jason, and the others were still trading looks of dumbfounded disbelief when Luke said, Perhaps you carry something even more deadly than Botaus, Harar, in the form of ideas. Harar pressed his few fingertips together and bounced them against his disfigured lower lip. Yun Harla is said to reserve her most cunning tricks for those most devoted to her. But we find ourselves here, together, for reasons beyond my comprehension. From here, then, we must at least attempt to mark a new beginning. Chapter 11 We're going to come out of this in one piece, right? Judder Page asked as Han was returning to the cockpit. In the adjacent chair, Posh Kraken repressed a smile. Millennium Falcon had been in hyperspace for just under five standard hours, most of which Han had spent elsewhere in the freighter, evaluating the extent of the damage and checking on the passengers who were crammed into every available cabin space. Han looked from Page to Kraken to Leia, who had remained in the co-pilot's chair throughout the light-speed transit. Didn't you tell them everything would be fine? She shrugged. Maybe they don't trust me. Han strapped into the pilot's chair and swiveled to the two Alliance officers. You can trust whatever she says. Page grinned. Well, that's just it, Han. She told us to ask you. Han frowned at Leia. Maybe it's time we reviewed our roles aboard this ship. I do the piloting. You reassure the passengers that the pilot always knows what he's doing. Of course, Captain, Leia said. Might I tell the passengers exactly where we're headed? Han swung to the Nava computer display. Unless we took a wrong turn at the last nebula, we should be coming up on Kalula any minute now. Leia stared at him. Kalula? In the Tyan hegemony? Could you have picked a more out-of-the-way planet? Hey, I got us away from those Vong skips, didn't I? You did. I had to make a judgment call. Han continued to make adjustments on the console and overhead instrument panels. Leia eyed the lubricant smears on his hands and a small bump that was forming on his right temple. Everything go all right in the back? She asked quietly while Kraken and Paige were engaged in a separate conversation. I thought I heard some cursing. That must have been 3PO, Han mumbled. He never was good with tools. Coming out of hyperspace, Han interrupted, reaching forward to prime the sublight drives and ready the subspace transceiver. The star line sharpened to points of light and the star field rotated slightly. The ion drives flared to life with a deafening whoomp and the ship began to lurch and hiccup. 
From aft came the sound of stressed alloy, then an indistinct severing as if some component had been torn away. What was that? Leia asked. Just another piece of us, Han said flatly. Nothing important, I hope. A distant object grew larger in the viewport, slowly defining itself as a linear array of geometric modules, linked by girder-like structural members and transparent tubular passageways. Docking berths extended from each module, many of them housing ion cannons and turbolasers in place of ships. Sprouting like a faceted mushroom cap from the center of the array was an enormous shield generator. Han relaxed into his chair. A thing of beauty if I ever saw one. Looks awfully beat up, Leia said dubiously. Han straightened somewhat. Yeah, now that you mention it. But the last time I passed through here, the station was stocked with aftermarket parts from Liana. How long ago was that? Han thought for a moment. A couple of years, I guess, but... A blast rocked the Falcon from behind, snapping everyone back in their chairs. Another piece of us? Leia asked, leaning in to check the sensor displays. Worse. Leia's eyes were big when she glanced back at him. What was that you said about outrunning those skips? Kraken raised his eyes to the overhead viewport. They couldn't have followed us through hyperspace. It can't be the same vessels. Han veered the Falcon hard to port, a second before two magma missiles raced past the ship's mandibles. Somebody's changed the rules. He leaned toward the intercom and called the two Nogri by name, then fell silent for a moment listening to their reply. I don't care if the targeting computers aren't responding. You've got eyes, haven't you? He growled to himself. Have to do everything myself around here. A molten projectile hit the Falcon broadside, and a wire-filled module dropped, sparking, from the cockpit ceiling. Han barrel-rolled the ship, then dived abruptly. Alarms were screeching even before he pulled out of the maneuver, and the authenticators began painting dozens of yellow bezels on the tactical display screens. Han and Leia looked up at the same time to find themselves squared off with a Yuzhan Vong battle group of capital vessels, gunboat analogs, tenders, and what was certainly a Yamisk-bearing cluster ship, similar to the one Han had helped cripple at Fondor. Sentry coral skippers were already streaking for the Falcon. You know you have a real knack for this, Leia said, while she called for a status readout on the shields. It's not me, Han protested. The Nava computer has itself convinced that trouble is the Falcon's default preference. A likely story. Han didn't alter course. Grab a hollow of that cluster ship. Download any drive signatures you can pick up and paste everything into the battle analysis computer. Then hold on to your stomach. He waited for Leia to carry out the tasks, then threw the Falcon into a near-vertical climb, continuing up and over in a loop that sent them racing back toward Kalula's orbital station. The quartet of curved-tailed, six-legged skips that had apparently chased the Falcon from Selvaris were directly below, spewing plasma missiles, even as they jinked and juked to evade incessant laser bursts from the dorsal and belly AG-2Gs. Leia swiveled to the comm board. Kalula Station, come in. Transmit our identification code, Han said. Kalula Station, this is Millennium Falcon. Please acknowledge. Say something, Han muttered. Call us a name, anything. The closer they came to the station, the worse it appeared. Many of the modules had been holed and scorched by fire. A pitched battle must have raged for weeks, unknown to Galactic Alliance Command because of the disabled holonet. Han wondered briefly how many other planets or orbital stations were in similar straits. Millennium Falcon, this is Kalula Station, a female voice said at last. Someone should have told us you were coming. Han clamped his right hand on Leia's left in relief. Kalula Station, even we didn't know we were coming, he said into the mic. We've got drive trouble, and a couple of coral skippers are hounding us. Any chance you could lower your shields long enough to take us in? Can do, Millennium Falcon, so long as you can guarantee that your ship's as fast as she's rumored to be. 
Pull in the welcome mat while we're making our approach, Han said, and the Falcon will still get us inside with time to spare. We won't hold you to that, Millennium Falcon, but come on in. First, we've got to lose these rock spitters. Rooting additional power to the main thrusters, Han firewalled the throttle and began to take the Falcon through a repertoire of stomach-churning evasive maneuvers. The tandem-piloted skips did their best to keep up, singeing the Falcon's stern with gouts of plasma. But as the Falcon neared the station, the enemy vessels had to contend also with laser beams and the sting of ion cannons. Don't worry. Leia assured Page and Kraken as Han continued to rocket for the small window Kalula Station had opened. Han does this all the time. The moment the Falcon soared into the station's embrace, the shield repowered. Repulsed by heavy fire, three of the skips peeled off and jagged for the protection of the battle group. The fourth kept coming, only to be stunned by the shimmering energy field, then fell prey to the station's powerful batteries. Leia swiveled to face Kraken and Page. See, that wasn't so bad. Color slowly returned to their faces, and they nodded. Steadying his shaking hand, Han cut power to the thrusters and allowed a tractor beam to convey the Falcon safely into a docking bay. Seat of the galactic government since the fall of Coruscant, the water world of Mon Calamari was nimbus with ships of all category and classification from twenty-year-old scallop-hulled Mon Cal cruisers to gleaming star destroyers fresh from the yards of Bathawi and distant Talan. The star system's inner worlds were similarly encircled, ever on alert that the Yuzhan Vong might one day decide to fold their myriad battle groups into a single armada and strike at Mon Calamari from the heart of the galaxy. Inbound from the hyperspace reversion point well beyond Mon Calamari's single moon, Jaina weaved her X-wing to Raul Roost, one of the largest and whitest of the ships in orbital dock, and was the last pilot of Twin Sun Squadron to drift into the fleet flagship's spacious though welcoming hold. A Bothan assault cruiser originally commissioned for the defense of Bathawi at the conclusion of the Galactic Civil War, Raul Roost was under the command of Admiral Triest Crefe, who had emerged from relative obscurity at the start of the Yuzhan Vong invasion to the position of second in command of the entire Alliance fleet. The transports had been the first to arrive from Kashiik, and many were already docked and disgorging their cargoes of freed prisoners. Despite devastating losses to the Starfighter squadrons, the mission had been deemed a success. Dozens of former New Republic officials and scores of commanders had been rescued, and most of Alliance Intelligence's double agents had been extracted. The operation might have gone far worse had the Stingcrawler Coral Skippers arrived sooner than they did, or had the deadly skips pursued the transports to Mon Calamari. But instead, they had remained at Salvaris to safeguard the Peace Brigade freighters that had yet to be unloaded, and to escort those prisoner ships to Coruscant. Seizing the opportunity, Chief of State Cal Omas's media team had spun the mission into a public relations event meant to send a message to the governments of threatened worlds to hold out, that unlike the fallen New Republic, the Galactic Federation of Free Alliances was not about to allow any more star systems to fall to enemy rule. As a result, Several hundred military personnel, civilians, and media representatives were on hand to greet the rescued. Booming applause erupted for each one to emerge from a transport. Weeping spouses rushed to embrace their returned partners. Children, clearly confused by all the commotion, wrapped their arms tightly around the legs or waists of their liberated mothers or fathers. Medics and droids worked side by side to move the injured onto repulsor gurneys, and hurried them off for back to treatment. Most of the rescued, of whatever species, needed little more than minor attention and a couple of hearty meals. Others were in critical condition. The fact that none had been implanted with surge coral was a constant reminder that they were to have gone to their deaths as sacrificial victims. Few civilians and no one from the media took notice of the battered starfighters that entered Raul Roost's hold in the wake of the transports. 
Jaina didn't mind, but she had to laugh. Not all that long ago, she had been a media darling. Because of her capture of a Yuzhan Vong ship and the brief role she had played as the trickster goddess, a weapon unto herself. Now she was just another weary pilot returning from a mission that had nearly gone completely wrong. Five twin sons pilots had died, but that was breaking news only to those who had survived. A human crew chief rolled a ladder up to Jaina's X-wing while the canopy was rising. Two crash team techs rushed in to effect repairs and check on carbon-scored Cappy. Welcome back, Colonel, the young woman said. Jaina descended the ladder, took off her helmet, and shook out her brown hair. Loosening the tabs on her flight suit, she put the helmet under her arm and began to circle the X-wing, her eyes scanning the hold for signs of Millennium Falcon. Not too far away... Lobaka, Kip, and Alima Rar were emerging from their craft. Has there been any communication from the Falcon? she asked the crew chief after she had completed a second circle of the starfighter. The woman unclipped a data pad from her belt and gave the small display screen a perfunctory glance. Not that I'm aware of, Colonel, but the Falcon might have been directed into one of the frigates. Jaina forced an exhale. When the crew chief started to move off, Jaina grabbed hold of her arm, forcefully, until she realized what she had done and relaxed her grip. Could you check on that? The woman frowned and rubbed her bicep. Please, Jaina added. This time the crew chief spent a long moment studying the data screen of her portable device. Sorry, Colonel. No sign of the Falcon anywhere. She smiled sympathetically. If I hear anything... I'll find you. Starfighters and gunships were still arriving, some on a wing and a prayer. Jaina moved to the edge of the balcony that overlooked the docking bay's Magcon field. Gazing out at all the moving lights, the octagonal shipyards, and the distant orbital fleet command annex, she stretched out with her feelings. At the edge of her awareness, she could sense that her mother and father were alive, but in grave danger. Her mind made up, she hurried back to the starfighter and clambered up the ladder to the cockpit. I'm going back out, she informed the puzzled crew chief. Sir? Jaina pulled her helmet on and settled herself in the seat. If anyone asks, I'm back at the Moon Aeron reversion point. The young woman grew flustered. But your ship, your droid. Jaina fastened her chin strap as the canopy was lowering. They're used to it. For all the world-shaping and geologic surgery performed on Coruscant, Westport, north of the former legislative district, remained a landing area. Its floating platforms, docking bays, and maintenance buildings had been slagged, and in their place stood grashels and other mollusk-like housings, scattered across a vast expanse of fused Yorick coral tableland, with room enough for more than ten thousand vessels. Though few would recognize it, the aerodrome had fared far better than Eastport, Newport, or West Champion. Royal Coral Craft had transported Shimra's retinue from the world ship Citadel, which rose to the east atop what had once been the Imperial District, to within a kilometer of Westport. Once back on the ground, the Supreme Overlord was conveyed the remaining distance by Royal Palanquin. The ornate and grotesque litter was held aloft by a pride of dedicated Dovin basils, and was both preceded and trailed by an entourage of servants and courtesans, as well as by the most recent additions to Shimra's company, the four female seers and members of the newly enhanced warrior sect known as Slayers. Strewn with flowers trampled to airborne fragrance by the bare feet of attendants, the winding path to the landing field meandered over the rounded summits of crushed edifices and across countless bridges that spanned those artificial canyons the Yuzhan Vong had been unable to fill or otherwise efface. Choirs of insects honored the gods with their twilling songs, and carrion birds picked at the vestiges of the plague of stink beetles. The sky was a radiant purple, with the rainbow bridge faintly visible halfway to apogee. But the flawless sky belied the melancholy nature of the procession, 
for all who formed it knew of the events that had transpired at Salvaris. The enemy had somehow learned of the Peace Brigade convoy that had ambushed it, recapturing many of the captives who were slated to be sacrificed at the imminent ceremony. Quick action on the part of the Yuzhan Vong commander had resulted in the escape of three Peace Brigade freighters, which had communicated the convoy's distress to Yuzhan Tar. A band of slayers had been dispatched and had performed brilliantly, much to the displeasure of many an elite warrior, who regarded the slayers as abominations to the caste system, and who fretted about the augmentative power they provided the supreme overlord. Noma Nor walked several paces behind the skull-adorned palanquin in a group that included High Priest Jakan, Master Shaper Kila Quad, War Master Nas Choka, High Prefect Drathul, and other elites. He had been worried about receiving blame for the Peace Brigade's failure. The backstabbing group was essentially his creation. But thus far, no one had been inclined to hold him responsible. His defense would have remained unchanged in any event. That acts of treachery were only as successful as the traitors who perpetrated them. The Peace Brigade freighters had not been allowed to land on Yuzhan Tar, but their non-Yuzhan Vong commanders and crews had been shuttled to the surface by Yorick Trema. With them had arrived the Alliance captives, along with the commanders and crews of Yuzhan Vong escort vessels. The latter groups were kneeling in ranks in an area of the landing field reserved for the naming, blessing, and tattooing of war vessels. Herded off to one side and immobilized by Blorash jelly were the Alliance captives, and in the center of the field, flung down on their faces, lay the Peace Brigaders. Nom Anor considered that Shimra might order the procession to trample the prostrate Brigaders, but instead the Supreme Overlord called a halt to the entourage when his palanquin had reached the center of the field. The mixed-species lot of already battered turncoats knew enough to remain face down on the rough ground, while High Priest Jakan's acolytes, joined by Onimi, circulated among them, anointing them with Pollock incense and Vanagel. Then Jakan placed himself among their midst, his hooded eyes surveying the lumps and welts that slayers had administered to the brigaders before they had been shuttled down to Yuzhan Tar. The high priest moved on to the Yuzhan Vong warriors and summoned their commander, Bu Fath. A towering warrior with inadequate skill for command, his escalation had come about only as a result of persistent petitioning by members of the domain Fath which included several important consuls. "'How many captives did you deliver, Commander?' Jakan asked. Bu Fath pivoted slightly to salute Warmaster Nas Choka. Six packets, nearly five hundred. Jakan shook his head in disappointment and glanced up at Shimra. "'Less than half the minimal amount required for a ceremony of such magnitude.' Shimra gazed stonily from the hard bed of his palanquin, but said nothing, even when the seers began to consult their divination biotes and moan in distress. Naschoka separated himself from the procession and gestured to Bu Fath and his subalterns. Our warriors acquitted themselves well by destroying many enemy fighters and reclaiming two of the ships that might have escaped with the rest. One warrior in particular is noted for having saved our own escort vessels from destruction, in addition to other acts of bravery. Bring this one forward, Shimra said, so I might cast my benevolent gaze on him. Commander Malik Kar, Nas Choka called. Nom Anor couldn't believe his ears. After the calamity at Fondor, Malik Kar had been demoted and removed from battle. Now here he was, standing in Shimra's gaze, a hero. Would everything reverse itself in due time? Kar genuflected to Shimra, then Nas Choka, and remained on one knee. At a motion from the warmaster, a subaltern hurried forward with a command cloak, which Nas Choka draped over the horns implanted in Kar's shoulders. Rise as Supreme Commander Malik Kar, Nas Choka intoned. 
reinstated because of his courageous actions at Selvaris. We will soon assign him to a command more worthy of his station. Malik Kar snapped his fists in salute and returned to the ranks. Dread Lord, Jakan said a moment later, occurring as they did in an arena of battle. The death of many infidels at Selvaris counts for something. But as I say, the captives on hand number too few to constitute an appropriate appeal to the gods. We must offer more than this paltry lot. Commander Bu Foth risked a forward step. My lord, could we not let these virulent peace brigaders substitute for those they surrendered? Foth's proposal met with a few shouts of approval, though mostly from members of his domain. Such acts of replacement are not without precedent, Jakan started to say when Shimra silenced him with a look. They are not worthy of honorable deaths, Shimra said. Not only did they allow their league to be infiltrated by enemy spies, but several of their ships also abandoned the arena at the first sign of engagement, taking with them supplies and a number of sacred objects that were en route from a broa sky. Shimra stepped down from the litter, causing a stir among warriors and priests alike, a group of whom unfurled a living carpet in advance of Shimra's steps. Onimi followed, capering as he trailed his master. On which worlds are we currently engaged in surface contest? Shimra asked Nas Choka. The war master thought before speaking. I could name twenty, great lord. Fifty. Shimra grew angry. Name one, war master. Coralag, then. Shimra nodded. Coralag, it shall be. See to it that the peace brigaders are implanted with surge coral and sent to the front to join the ranks of our human thrall. In battle, perhaps they will redeem themselves. Nas Choka saluted. Your will be done. Shimra turned then and beckoned to Drathul and Nomenor. Momentous plans require momentous ritual. Therefore, the sacrifice can neither be delayed nor interfered with. Make certain that the consuls and executors in your charge be advised that I will brook no further upsets. Should anything untoward occur, I will look upon you and your charges as I would any who seek to meddle in our holy venture. Understood. Drathul and Noma Noor responded in unison. Nas Choka waited patiently for Shimra to settle himself on the palanquin before saying, A suggestion, great lord. Shimra granted him a gaze. Proceed, war master. We are presently engaged in a campaign to occupy a world known as Kalula. If you would permit our efforts to be doubled there, the planet will fall, and many captives will be available to enrich our supply. Why not let the brave defenders of the orbital complex serve to compensate for our dearth of illustrious sacrifices? Kalula, you say. Distant from Yuzhantar, great lord, but vital to our ultimate designs. Shimra looked to Jakan, then the seers who nodded. Let it be done. Chapter 12 The damage looks much worse from out here, C-3PO said, staring up at the belly of Millennium Falcon from the foot of the landing ramp. Han glared at him from under the ship, where he, Leia, and a Kalula station mechanic were compiling a list of needed repairs. Who asked you, 3PO? The protocol droid adopted a posture of inquisitiveness. No one, Captain Solo. I was only remarking. 3PO, Leia cut him off. That's enough for now. Of course, Princess Leia. I know when I'm not wanted. That'll be the day, Han said. Kraken, Page, and the rest of the rescued officers were standing off to one side, fielding questions from several other Kalula mechanics who had dropped what they were doing to surround the Falcon the moment she had settled on her landing discs. The ship was blistered, dented, and punctured. She's a storyboard for the whole war, the mechanic said. Han nodded. You got that right. 
the mechanic wedged his forefinger into a hole in the underside of the outrigger cockpit. I'll bet this one's not half a meter from the pilot's chair. Han swallowed audibly. I've had closer calls. Leia glanced at the mechanic. You might have heard. He's a regular moving target. The mechanic grinned and clapped grit from his hands. Well, she's taken a bruising, but I figure she'll live. It's just a matter of pulling together replacement parts. Han looked relieved. He had his mouth open to thank the mechanic when a tall, purple-complected humanoid wearing military utilities approached him. Welcome aboard Kalula Station, Captain Solo. Before Han could reply, a silver-haired human officer stepped in and saluted him. Captain Solo, sir, I was with you at Endor. Han thought for a moment. Uh, Denov, right? The man beamed. I'm proud that you remember me, sir. Likewise, Captain. Leia folded her arms across her chest and stared at Han. That's the tenth person who's recognized you. What is this, a gathering of your fan club? Han frowned at her. Very funny. No, really, Han. Maybe you should have become an actor instead of a war hero. Just think of the following you'd have. Han grabbed hold of his own chin. You'd pay good credits to see this face blown up a hundred times normal size? Leia pretended to think about it. When you put it that way... Captain Solo, someone said. Walking briskly toward the Falcon was a portly but energetic human major general. Base Commander Garay, the man said, extending his hand to Han. Han shook hands and gestured to C-3PO and Leia. Our droid and my wife, Leia Organa Solo. Leia elbowed him gently in the ribs. Thanks for second billing, darling, she said through a clenched-jawed smile. Han caressed his ribs and eyed Leia. The droids generally well-behaved. He indicated Paige, Kraken, and some of the others, introducing them by name. Garay nodded his head several times. Glad to meet all of you. His gray eyes returned to Han. Captain Solo, please tell me Moan Cal Command sent you. Han compressed his lips. Wish I could, Commander. The truth is, we got hit hard during a rescue mission at Selvaris, and Kalula was the only place the Falcon could go. Garay's obvious disappointment was fleeting. We're proud to have you on board regardless, all of you. He turned to his even more portly adjutant. Chief, see that Captain Solo's passengers are treated for injuries and well-fed. The adjutant saluted. If you follow me, sirs, he said to Kraken and the others. Han kept silent until everyone had moved off. What's the situation here, Commander? Garay tilted his head to one side. Take a walk with me and I'll explain. He led Han, Leia, and C-3PO on a slow tour of the docking bay, in the strobing light of arc welders, past technicians and soldiers who looked every bit as scarred and patched up as the ships they were working on. Humans appeared to comprise the majority of Kalula's personnel, but mixed among them were Bridgians, Triani, Bims, Tamarians, and other species from star systems proximal to Kalula. Nearly every individual and craft reflected the war's years of savagery. Some of the ships combined so many disparate parts they were unrecognizable. The Yuzhan Vong showed up about a month ago, Garay was saying, and it's been steady fighting ever since. Our defense platform is history, and for the past local week we've been under constant siege. But it's become clear that the Vong want to occupy Kalula rather than raise it, or they'd have dropped a moon on it or poisoned it like they've done elsewhere. Occupation seems a good guess, Leia said. One of the ships we saw on our way in is a Yamisk vessel. Garay nodded. That's already been verified. Still, it's curious that the Yuzhan Vong would choose Kalula, Leia went on. I don't know a great deal about the Tyan hegemony, but I do know it lacks most of the resources that Yuzhan Vong usually come looking for. No argument, Princess. Kalula's mostly been a haven for scientists. Because of some sort of natural phenomenon that occurs down there every so often. Our best guess is that the Yuzhan Vong want to use Kalula as an entry point into the Tyan hegemony, 
and the corporate sector. Then there's the shipyards at Liana, though they haven't been turning out much since Sinar Systems pulled up stakes. Gary took his lower lip between his teeth and shook his head in exasperation. But the Vong have to go through us to get there. And, thank the Force, that hasn't happened yet. If they're looking at occupying the rest of the Tyan hegemony, they'd have concentrated their efforts at Liana, Han said. For one thing, it's closer to the Perlemian, which they pretty much control anyway, from Coruscant to the Cron Drift. He shook his head. They've got something else in mind. Maybe using Kalula as a staging area for an attack on Mon Calamari. We consider that, Garay said, but I don't have to tell you that Kalula's well removed from the easy space lanes. Mon Calamari's three micro jumps direct, or you return to the Perlemian by way of Delalt and Liana, which takes just as long. So what do the Yuzhan Vong want with Kalula? Leia asked. Gary looked at her while they walked. Captives. The Vong commander of the battle group even intimated as much. You've actually spoken to him? Tattooed head to toe, Gary said, and soon to be black with blood if we have anything to say about it. He promised us noble deaths and everlasting life. Tough offer to turn down, Han said. Gary snorted. Personally, I'll take the here and now. Where are you from, Commander? Leia asked. Abrogado Re. Han was surprised. You're a long way from the core. Why'd you leave? It was raining Vong fireballs, and I started to feel like I was in the way. Leia nodded contemplatively. There's no safe corner left. Gary sighed with her. Not if the Yuzhan Vong have their way. One more major push from them at this point. Well, who can predict how things will turn out, right? Expect surprises, Han said. There's a small resistance force operating downside on Kalula, but if this station falls, I don't see how they'll be able to hold out against a full-scale invasion. Just how bad off are you, Leia said. Well, you've seen our starfighters. They're held together with spit and glue, just like we are. Ever since the holonet went down, we've had to rely on courier communication with Moon Cal, and that takes anywhere from three to five local days. In fact, we dispatched a ship just hours before you arrived. Galactic Alliance Command hasn't been able to spare us any material in any event. So we're critically short on food, munitions, spare parts, back to. Many of the volunteers who came to our support are wounded. We've a lot of sick and dying. Gary paused, becoming more somber by the moment. I've been fighting the Yuzhan Vong for four years. I feel like I was a lot younger when this war started. We all were, Commander, Han said. He recognized Gary's type, done in by years of command, of sending soldiers to their deaths, a man who no longer needed to prove to himself that he was a hero. He was just doing his job and hating himself for it. Gary forced himself to brighten. But don't worry, we'll get the Falcon repaired and we'll have you on your way in no time. We don't want to take your personnel away from their jobs, Commander, Han said firmly. Leia and I will see to the repairs ourselves. He paused, then added, Between you and me, Gary, if Kraken and the rest weren't expected on Moon Calamari, we'd be staying behind to help you. Gary smiled. I appreciate that, Solo. Reinforces everything I've heard about you all these years. He glanced at Leia. Will the two of you join me for lunch? We'd be honored, Leia said. She deliberately fell behind Han to whisper, Everything he's heard all these years. One day they're going to build a statue of you. Han gestured broadly. These are the people who deserve statues. Every last one of them. They continued to walk and talk and bump into people who knew or recognized Han and Leia. Kaluda seemed to have drawn every celebrated soldier, mercenary, and ne'er-do-well from within a thousand parsecs. Commander Garay excused himself to attend to business, but promised he'd rendezvous with them in the mess hall. 
They were emerging from one of the transparent connectors that linked the station's separate modules when Han heard what he thought was a familiar voice. The source of the voice was a dark-haired man as old as himself, dressed in a worn gray flight suit that was cinched at the waist by a broad red belt. Of medium height but broad-chested, he was sitting cross-legged atop a cargo crate in a murky area of the module, between a golden-furred boffin and a tall calabop whose wings were folded behind him. Surrounding the trio stood roguish-looking human and alien warriors in similar gray flight suits, who might have made up a separate starfighter squadron or just as easily a criminal swoop gang from Nar Shadda. Another fan? Leia asked. Han rubbed his stubble jaw. I definitely know the voice from somewhere, but I can't place the face. So ask him. Han nodded and sauntered over to the soldiers, every one of whom monitored his approach with a mix of amusement and wariness. I'm Han Solo. Am I right that we've met? The man looked at him askance, almost as if to display the ragged scars on the side of his furrowed and somewhat dark-complected face. Not in the flesh, Captain, though we have come close. I guess that means that we're not entirely strangers. He extended a meaty hand. Hearn. Han tried out the name twice, then shook his head. Doesn't ring a bell. But you're sure we never served together? During the rebellion, maybe? Hearn shrugged. I have one of those faces that used to appear familiar to everyone. Han caressed his jaw. Ever been to Del Alt? Don't think so. Han nodded uncertainly, then tipped his head in parting and walked away. Leia waited until she, Han, and C-3PO were out of earshot of the group to ask, Did he mean familiar before the rebellion, or before all the scars? Han glanced over his shoulder and shook his head in ignorance. But any response was drowned out by the sudden blare of klaxons. Instantly, the station was thrown into managed chaos. Everyone knew precisely where to report and what to do, except Han, Leia, and C-3PO, who weren't sure whether they should go to the nearest battle station or simply stay out of everyone's way. Appearing out of nowhere, Garay put a quick end to their confusion. Enemy reinforcements have arrived, another entire battle group. Leia was astonished. They must be desperate to have Kalula to spare so many ships. Garay agreed. Our shield should hold. The commander's adjutant came running to report that the station's long-range scanners had zeroed in on something unusual. Gary led everyone to the nearest display screen, on which the adjutant called up a holocam view of what looked to be a colossal space slug, with a wedge-shaped head, a dorsal pouch, and a mouth that had to be eighty meters wide. Gary narrowed his eyes to slits. What in the galaxy am I looking at? Leia loosed a troubled exhalation. That commander is what the Yuzhan Vong call an Ichna. The one they deployed at Duro practically ate an orbital city. Gary stared at her, scarcely able to speak. The klaxons began to trumpet a more dire alert. Commander, an ensign said, enemy vessels on the attack. Han looked at Leia. Guess we will be hanging around after all. Studious person that you are, or at least claim to be, you no doubt took to heart the Supreme Overlord's admonition that nothing untoward should interfere with the coming sacrifice, High Prefect Drothul Hector Nomanor, given especially the diminished number of victims. Former Prefect of the world ship Harla, Drothul had a wide and broad-browed face, sufficiently scarified to demonstrate his allegiance to the gods but not so much that the scars marred what Drothul considered handsome features. He had kept no manor waiting for half a local day, while the sun climbed high into the sky, making the rainbow bridge shine like a jeweled necklace. His windowed and drizzle-topped quarters in the prefectory overlooked the place of hierarchy, south of the citadel, in the district once known as Calicur Heights. 
Nom Anor still remembered the heights from one of the first of his reconnaissance missions. When the market area had teemed with pushy survey takers and blazed with flashing musical adverta screens. Free product samples delivered from worlds throughout the galaxy had been on continual display, floating on repulsor carts and wafting wonderful aromas into the air. I took the Supreme Overlord's admonition to heart, Nom Anor said from the exquisitely woven Vulruk floor mat to which he had been shown by Drothul's attendants. The High Prefect himself spoke from a pillowed recess in his dais. Then you'll be interested to know it has reached my attention that a coalition of shamed ones is intent on disturbing the ceremony. Drothul fixed Nom Anor with a gimlet stare. I think you are not entirely untutored in the tactics of the heretics, Prefect. I profess to know something of them. Drothul was clearly entertained by the response. You give yourself too little credit. Such self-effacement is not becoming to one who has managed to escalate himself from mere executor to prefect of Yuzhan Tar in so short a time, who, on at least two occasions now, has enjoyed private audience with the Supreme Overlord, who, I would risk saying, even has Shimra's ear. Nom Anor feigned a short laugh. Hardly his ear, High Prefect. Drathul scrutinized him some more. However did this come about? he asked, as if to himself. Was it not Nomanor who sent the priestess Elan to her death? Who created the bumbling peace brigade? Who helped engineer the disastrous assault on Fondor? Who allowed the traitor Verger to escape? Who has disguised himself as a human, a Duros, a given? And who knows how many other species is rumored to have refused a duel with a Jedi and to have murdered his own operatives with an infidel's weapon, who all but lured Warmaster Savong La to dishonor at Ebak Nine. He paused briefly. Look how his Playerian bowl stares at me, so eager to spit venom. You must understand, High Prefect. Nom Anor touched the artificial orb that substituted for an eye. Just a particle of sand lodged in the corner. In fact, you have succeeded brilliantly in disparaging me, but you neglect to add that there has been a bright side to all those events. Or else, he grinned faintly, how is it I have come to wear the green robes of high office? Drothul was infuriated. The sole reason I tolerate your presence and your escalation is that you are known to have been in the company of my predecessor. Yug Skell, when he died. I know in my heart that you had something to do with his death, and were it not for his death, I would probably not be sitting here delighting in rebuking you. Nomanor inclined his head. I exist but to serve, High Prefect. Precisely. Which is why I command you to root out this coalition of shamed ones, and either talk some sense into them, or have them killed. I would prefer the former, since I suspect that additional killings at this point will only incite them further. But know that I plan to hold you personally responsible for any interference at the sacrifice, just as Shimra will me. Do you trust that I speak from the heart, or do I need to bolster my words with threats of what will befall you should you fail me? I will do my best, High Prefect. Your tricks bear watching, Nomanor. This has always been so. I trick no one but myself, High Prefect, by imagining myself more than I am. Nomanor had had his consuls arrange for a saddled bishop to carry him back to the spacious residence that came with his new status. But for all that he had received, he had earned the envy, anger, and distrust of many as was frequently the case with those escalated because of actions that needed to remain secret and undisclosed. Others in Shimra's close company suffered similar indignities, in part because Shimra was fickle and full of contradictions, as if jerked this way and that by his emotions or what passed for revelations from the gods. Even mighty Nas Choka was not immune to petty jealousies, which is why he had tripled his complement of bodyguards 
something Nomenor had considered doing, but ultimately rejected. There was small advantage in announcing one's apprehensions to one's adversaries. But how to keep those apprehensions concealed from the heretics? He had mistakenly believed that the abrupt disappearance of Yusha, the prophet, would have weakened the movement. Instead, Nomanor had only provided his gullible audience with a martyr, more so because many believed that Yusha had been put to death on orders of Shimra. Tucked away in his residence was the original Uglith cloaker Nomanor had worn when exhorting his followers to rise up against the system that had doomed them to become outsiders a system that perpetuated a belief in gods who would deliberately shun their creations. It would be a different matter if every shamed one was guilty of overreaching or pride, but in fact no one could explain, the shapers least of all, why implants were rejected. As a result, however, countless individuals were left wondering for the rest of their miserable lives where they had erred, when they had displayed pride, or if they were paying for the transgressions of other creche or domain members. The elite pretended sympathy, when in fact they fairly luxuriated in witnessing their competitors fall from grace. How grievous what befell Consul Shal Tor at the last escalation! But how happy I am that it wasn't me! Only a short time ago, before his life-turning decision on Zonama Seacoat, Nome Anor, sufficiently inflamed by the inequity, had wished to see his entire culture tumbled down, to see Shimra shaken from his polyp throne by the debased members of Yuzhan Vong society. And he had very nearly succeeded. What might have come from that was unclear. If the war were lost, what would it mean for Nome Anor, since, save for the Jedi, the inhabitants of the galaxy the Yuzhan Vong had invaded were not above barbarity? Flight, imprisonment, execution. He couldn't take the chance. Now the very movement born of rumors escaped from distant Yavin, and given order and embellishment by Nomanor himself, threatened to deprive him of all that he had achieved by opting to foil Zonama Seacoat, and thereby reinstate himself in Shimra's good graces. The thought weighed on him as his living transport lumbered past the place of sacrifice where priests and savants, adepts and initiates, were busy preparing for the coming ceremony. Past the shell-like shops of workers, and past solitary shamed ones in their threadbare garments begging for alms. Before Nas Choka had been escalated, he had had occasion to reproach Nomanor for pride, and counsel him look to Yun Shuno, god of the shamed ones, for pardon. All these years later, here he was their prophet. Chapter 13 The Ichna led the attack on Kalula Station, towed into place by a special breed of Dovan basil grown on faraway Tinna, the monster slug fastened itself to Kalula's deflector shields like a leech, fattening as it absorbed every jewel of ionized energy the generator could summon then taking the suddenly vulnerable central module in its enormous mouth and crushing it like an eggshell. No sooner had the module depressurized than into the rend dropped hundreds of Yuzhan Vong warriors, disgorged from landing craft and outfitted with armor and the star-shaped breathing creatures known as Nuliths. Squadrons of battered starfighters streaked from the station's launching bays to engage swift flights of strafing coral skippers. Close-in weapons traversed and fired, pouring storms of green energy at the approaching capital ships. In the intact modules, klaxons continued to wail, locks cycled, and blast shields descended to seal off corridors and vital enclosures. Against the barricades of solid durasteel, the Yuzhan Vong splashed red-hot magma, and where that failed, they loosed an improved stock of black-plated Gretchen whose digestive acids were corrosive enough to burn through alloy. 
Close to where the Ichna was feasting, crouched behind a rampart of fuel-depleted loaders and stacked cargo crates, Han, Leia, and two dozen soldiers waited with hand weapons, assault rifles, repeating blasters, and a few grenades and rockets that had been scrounged from Kalula's near-empty armory. Those droids that weren't carrying ammunition or standing by to refresh weapons moved about in a daze, including C-3PO, who was walking in tight circles behind Leia. Don't lose your head, she told him. Lend a hand. But, Princess Leia, I'm scarcely a war machine. I'm useless for anything but protocol and translation. Oh, where is R2-D2 when we need him? 3PO, you're forgetting that you've been as courageous as R2 ever was. C-3PO came to a halt. Have I? Well, now that you mention it, there was that incident on... Incoming, a soldier yelled from down the line. Fifty meters away, something was burning an enormous hole in the lowered blast shield. Clouds of noxious vapor streamed from the ragged edges of a widening circle. Han checked the charge of his DL-44 and drew a bead on the center of the circle. Hold your fire, he said. Wait till they show themselves. First through the breach were a pair of Gretchena. The six-meter-long beasts leapt snarling from the acid clouds like apparitions, only to be cut to pieces by blaster fire before they had gone ten meters. Then the armored warriors came, rushing through in groups of three and four, hands gripped on amphistaffs or bandoliers of thudbugs. Now, Han shouted. Thirty blasters fired simultaneously, dropping the vanguard dozen, then a dozen more behind them. But the Yuzhan Vaughn kept coming, treading on their fallen comrades in a mad charge, and hurling plasma eels and amphistaffs on the run. The weapons thumped against the barrier and caught one or two of the defenders by surprise. But no razor bugs or airborne venom followed, making clearer than ever that the warriors wanted captives, not casualties. Advancing into the grid of laser fire, with fists raised in overtures of personal challenge, they were mowed down by the fives and tens, seemingly ignorant of the fact that the Alliance soldiers were playing by a different set of rules. The warriors would have called foul if they could, foul at being so dishonored. Their every action defied death and sowed confusion. And somehow that made them harder to kill rather than easier targets. Blasters fired nonstop, and the thrumming blade of Leia's lightsaber battered away a hail of thud bugs. But the line couldn't be held. Outnumbered, the defenders were forced to fall back. The Yuzhan Vong pressed the attack, stopping only to drag away and bind those they had stunned. The warriors exulted at the taking of each captive, even though six of their number might have died to gain one victim. Withdrawing deeper into the station, Leia was glancing over her shoulder as she approached a corridor intersection when Han suddenly threw his left arm around her waist and twirled her off to one side. From the scarlet glow of the intersecting corridor dropped an amphistaff thick as a war club, slicing the air where she would have been and hitting the deck with a hollow thud. The warrior attached to the amphistaff howled and sprang forward, falling victim to a precisely placed bolt from Han's sidearm. You do care after all, Leia said around a short-lived grin. Still in his one-armed embrace, she went up on her toes to kiss him on the cheek. Han smiled and let her go. What's a star without his leading lady? Combat always did bring out the romantic in you. She started off after him, then stopped and turned to see C-3PO dithering at the intersection. This way, 3PO, hurry! He glanced at her, then gestured to the side corridor. But, Princess, come on! C-3PO muttered something, then began to shuffle forward as fast as his squeaking legs would carry him. Leia and Han were waiting for him at the next blast shield. She palmed the operating stud as soon as C-3PO had crossed the threshold, but the shield closed only halfway. Han pounded the stud with his fist, then stepping back a meter, fired a bolt into the control panel. Leia ducked a ricochet and shook her head in dismay. Anyone ever tell you you're as hard on technology as the Yuzhan Vong? The thick blast shield vibrated and slammed to the deck. Han grinned smugly. Only when technology puts up an argument. And speaking of which, where'd Threepio go? Taking a quick look around, Leia found him cowering in a corner. What are you standing around for? Han said. You want to end up as a skewered droid? 
No, Captain Solo, but the blast door. His words were garbled by the sound of approaching footfalls. Leia raised her lightsaber, Han his blaster. But it was a dozen Alliance soldiers who showed up a moment later. You don't want to go that way, Han and one of the soldiers said at the same time. Yuzhan Vong, Han said, pointing toward the blast shield. Dead end, the soldier said, pointing in the opposite direction. Han stared at the blast shield, then whipped around. Dead end? C-3PO raised his hands to his head. That's what I've been trying to tell you. Something rammed into the far side of the blast shield, and within seconds, wisps of stinging smoke began curling from a series of small perforations. Han and Leia looked at each other. Weren't we just here? she commented. Everyone moved back from the shield to take up positions in the corridor. Again, Han checked the charge of his blaster, which was down to fifty percent. I'm not letting them take me alive, Captain, a soldier nearby said. Han aimed his forefinger at the young man. You're not going to be taken. Leave it at that, soldier. The soldier gulped and nodded. Thank you, sir. The center of the blast shield was rapidly dissolving. War cries and shouts of personal challenge echoed in the corridor. Han listened for a moment, then swung to Leia. I've got something that just might pass for an idea. Threepio, get over here. The droid rose unsteadily from behind a rodent's nest of corroded ventilation ducts. Coming, sir. Han looked straight into C-3PO's photoreceptors. Threepio, I want you to talk to the Yuzhan Vong in their own language. Talk to them? But I wouldn't begin to know what to say. Han's nostrils flared. What, suddenly you are at a loss for words? Tell them that all warriors are needed for individual combat in the number one module. Tell them it's lunchtime for all I care. I don't believe that Yuzhan Vong have a word for... Do as Han says, 3PO, Leia interrupted. See, 3PO's head moved in fits and starts. How could I possibly mimic? Boost the base settings of your audio output modifier, a soldier suggested. C-3PO cantered his head. Oh, I didn't think of that. Yeah, and throw in some sound effects while you're at it, Han added. It took C-3PO a moment to realize that Han was joking. Sound effects indeed, he muttered. Why doesn't someone just paint a target on my recharge coupling? Han hurried him to the public address comlink mounted on the interior bulkhead. Say something. Placing his vocabulator close to the mic grate, C-3PO began to speak. Bruck Tuckin Vong Prat! Altana! Brenslet! Chorok! Almost instantly the war cries ceased. That's the idea, Han encouraged. Keep talking. The droid carried on for another minute, finishing with the phrase, Altana! Shimra! Nota Yuno! Long life to Shimra, beloved of the gods! They're withdrawing, the soldier closest to the blast shield reported. Han clapped C-3PO hard on the back, then wrung his hand in pain. Good going, Goldenrod. You did it. C-3PO straightened. I do have my moments. Of course you do. Now let's get out of here. They waited to make certain that the warriors were gone, then one by one they squeezed through the hole in the blast shield and took the corridor C-3PO had wanted everyone to take to begin with. Not one hundred meters along, however, they ran smack into an enemy hunting party. But this time C-3PO was prepared. Adjusting the audio output modifier, he began to speak, completing just two sentences before a storm of thud bugs whirled through the corridor, prompting Han Leia and the rest to hit the deck. What did you say to them? Han asked up on one knee with his blaster raised. C-3PO thought for a moment. Oh my, I may have mixed up my words. He looked down at Han. I think I insulted them. Well, that's just great. Really, 3PO, Leia said, now you've made them angry. Everyone raced back to the intersection, but with a dead end in one direction and Yuzhan Vong in the other, there was no safe turn. They had to make a stand. The band of warriors C-3PO had insulted surged down the corridor. Forty strong, they outnumbered the defenders better than two to one. Fusillades of blaster fire improved the odds somewhat, but also depleted many of the weapons. 
Exhilarated by the sight of empty blasters being hurled aside, the warriors ordered their amphistaffs to curl about their forearms and began to strut forward, determined to go hand-to-hand -hand with their quarries. Several of them had their sights set on Leia, who was parrying the last of the thud bugs with nimble twists of her lightsaber. Han broke for her side, shooting from the hip to drop two of Leia's would-be contenders. Two others were quick to fill the gap. One lost his head to Leia's blade, the other flew straight at Han, driving him clear across the corridor and hard into the exterior bulkhead. Dodging hammer blows, Han slid down the wall and squirmed between the warrior's legs, hoping to be able to choke him from behind. But the warrior spun while Han was struggling to stand, vicing his huge hands around Han's neck in an asthcore throat hold and whirling him back against the bulkhead. Han saw stars, then darkness made a narrow tunnel of his vision. He was gasping for breath when the warrior's head suddenly exploded. The hands on Han's throat loosened and the body crumpled to the deck, taking Han with it. Certain that Leia had saved him, he tried to crawl out from under the Yuzhan Vong, but the corpse wouldn't budge. His outstretched right hand seized on a small object and he held it up to his eyes. As long as a human finger, and somewhat thicker, it was an older generation rocket dart, with its obviously defective explosive tip still attached. Han wriggled free of the fallen warrior in time to see four more Yuzhan Vong felled from behind by blaster bolts and rocket darts. The fatal volley was coming from halfway down the corridor, where half a dozen soldiers were crouched, kneeling, and prone on the deck. They wore pinch-cheeked helmets that were as domed as an R2 unit, bisected by horizontal viewplate strips, and surmounted by flag-like targeting rangefinders. Their gray uniforms were exoskeletoned by blast dissipation vests, forearm gauntlets, knee pads, armor mesh gloves, and alloy boots with zero-G grip soles. They were armed with blaster rifles, handguns, combat knives, rocket dart launchers, and whatever else might have been hiding in the alloy utility pouches affixed to their broad belts. A weapon system all his own, the leader wore a combination jet pack and anti-personnel missile launcher, and his belt was red. Catching sight of Han, the trooper tendered a distinctive fingertip salute before hurrying off. Leia was suddenly alongside Han and helping him to his feet, but her gaze was directed down the corridor. When she finally turned to Han, her eyes were wide, her mouth a rictus of astonishment. Fet? Han managed. Fet? Leia shook her head in refusal. It can't be him. Anyone could be inside that armor. He nodded his head in agreement. That's gotta be it. Besides, I mean... Even if it is him, he was probably trying to kill me, not save me. The galaxy's most notorious bounty hunter, Boba Fett, had nearly been the death of Han, Leia, and even C-3PO, following the Battle of Hoth, during the Galactic Civil War. But the then-rebels had even the score on Tatooine by dropping Fett into the hungry maw of a Sarlacc that resided in the desert world's Great Pit of Carcoon. Many believed that Fett had ended his days there, but Han and Leia knew better, having encountered Fett on several occasions since his escape from the Sarlacc. However, there had been no accounts of the man since the start of the Yuzhan Vong War, and Han was inclined to agree with Leia that the trooper who had saluted him could have been anyone. And yet there was the familiar voice of the man who had called himself Hearn. Han, Leia, C-3PO and the surviving Kalula soldiers stepped over the bodies of the Yuzhan Vong and raced after the troops in Mandalorian armor, who had already moved off. Dozens of Yuzhan Vong lay dead or dying in the corridor, and fierce fighting was underway in the high-ceilinged hold into which the corridor debouched. Han watched a warrior battle vainly against a whipcord that had lashed around his neck and was just then dragging him into an area of the hold Han couldn't see. He saw two more warriors nearly halved by rocket darts. The sibilant reports of blasters were momentarily overwhelmed by the ear-shattering explosion of a concussion missile. Six warriors, lanced by shrapnel, flew backward into the hold, but still others attacked. 
a strapping warrior with a koofy in each hand, charged screaming around the corner, only to reappear moments later, black with blood. Leia clamped her left hand on Han's upper arm. Didn't that one have hair when he went in? Han nodded in shock. I think they're taking scalps. A knot of Yuzhan Vong warriors had formed in the hold, many of them gesticulating wildly and all of them talking at once. Princess Leia, Captain Solo, C-3PO said from behind them. The Yuzhan Vong are very excited. They have sent runners to other parts of Kalula Station to report that they have found warriors who are exceptionally worthy of captivity. I'd say that's pretty optimistic of them, Leia said. She and Han fought their way into the hold. The armored soldiers had been backed into a corner. Two of them were certainly dead, and several others were in danger of being overpowered by groups of bloodied Yuzhan Vong. The Kalula forces gathered what weapons they could find and dashed forward to help. Han was searching for the leader when he heard a loud whoosh and saw the trooper, who might have been Boba Fett, streaking toward the ceiling. Blades of fire shot from the jetpack's horn-like gimbling servos. And bolts rained down on the warriors from his twin hand blasters, which he twirled expertly before slipping them back into their holsters. Amphistaffs flew at him from all quarters, one of them catching him in the chest and sending him off course into a bulkhead. Fighting broke out among the Yuzhan Vong for the privilege of being the first to reach him. Two warriors were climbing over the others, almost within arm's reach of the rocket man, when Han raised and aimed his blaster. Just in case it is him, Leia said, try not to hit the jetpack. He has returned! Yusha has returned! The gathering was small, numbering no more than two hundred shamed ones. But word of the prophet's return was spreading through the underbelly of Yuzhan Tar and given enough time, the audience would swell to thousands, perhaps tens of thousands. Noma Nor gazed down from what had once been the elevated rail of a magnetically levitated transport, to what had been a broad boulevard of nightclubs and restaurants, where his followers stood with faces raised in renewed hope and expectation. For a moment, and just that, it felt good to be back. From his residence, he had retrieved the Uglith cloaker that disguised him as Yu Sha. He had told his servants that he was not to be disturbed, and attired in the garb of an ordinary worker, he had let himself out through a secret passage and wound his way through the sacred precinct, past the temple of the modeler and the place of the dead, through the districts of Vistu and Bludan, shaking spies perhaps only imagined, then on along well-trodden paths that led down below the verdant surface growth, down into the deep canyons that had once harbored Coruscant's poor and disenfranchised, and with the arrival of the Yuzhan Vong had become the realm of the shamed, where outsiders were met with suspicion and anyone not shamed had to tread carefully for fear of never surfacing again. At certain crossings, he had uttered passcodes that had opened the way to even lower levels, not merely populated by shamed ones, but also ruled by them. He recalled having spied Onimi on a path much like the ones he was forced to follow. Onimi, doing Shimra's bidding, who had unwittingly led Noma Nor to the knowledge that the ultimate repository of the Shaper's arts, the so-called Eighth Cortex, was empty. Now he, too, was doing Shimra's bidding and, like Onimi, had become Shimra's puppet and pet, tasked with safeguarding secrets. Long before Nomanor had been able to seek out his former confederates, he had been recognized, and shamed ones in filthy frocks and tattered robeskins had flocked to his side in awe of Yu Sha's unannounced reappearance. The rumors of my death were greatly exaggerated he had tried to tell them. Only to hear someone respond, The prophet has defeated Shimra. He has defeated death. No, you miscomprehend, he had said. I was never taken by Shimra. The prophet evaded Shimra. He has been waiting only for the right moment to reappear among us. His carefully conceived plans went further downhill from there. By the time he had reached what was the broad boulevard, now grown over with shrubs and saplings, a small crowd had already formed. 
No one seemed to care that Shimra had expressly forbidden such gatherings, under penalty of dishonorable death. He has returned! Yusha has returned! Nom Anor scanned the crowd. Below the elevated track, pushing their way forward, came Kunra, Idrish, and Vatel. A shamed warrior, Kunra had been Yusha's bodyguard and chief disciple, and the only one who knew of Nom Anor's visit to Zonama Seacoat. We knew you would return, Kunra said when he and the others had climbed to the top of the rail. You promised that you would elevate us once you had regained your status, and you have been escalated beyond the rank you held. You're in a position to help us beyond our boldest imaginings. Guys or not, you are indeed the prophet. Nom Anor recalled his words to Kunra and the late Nirit. Indeed, he had vowed to restore the honor of the shamed ones. If they only knew how he had betrayed them. Yes, I promised to lift you, he said to Kunra. But we must wait a while longer. This time I come only to warn you. Shimra knows what you're planning to do at the sacrifice, and you must trust me when I tell you that he will respond wrathfully. Kunra spread his arms and raised them over the crowd. Yusha says that we must restage our plan, that we must attack in greater numbers. No, no, Nomanor said while the crowd cheered. You must rethink the plan entirely, or Shimra will eradicate you. Kunra raised his arms again. Shimra plans to eradicate us. We must make the first move. Nom Anor bellowed to the shamed ones. You can't look to me, the Jedi, or anyone else to deliver you from your lowly stations. None of us can repair your disfigurements or modify your rejected enhancements. Yusha calls on us to accept that our blemishes are only surface imperfections and that we must look past them to see our true selves, Kunra said. He tells us to follow the authority of our inner selves, to steer by our inner rudders for all important decisions, rather than pray to the gods, consult with the priests, or fear what actions the warriors and intendants might take against us. Individualism is the greatest threat to the hierarchy supported by Shimra's elite. Shimra relies on the elite in order to preserve a system that perpetuates inequity. He wishes to keep us anchored to ritual and domain, so that he and the elite may prosper. But the prophet tells us that we are individuals first and citizens last. A chill passed through Nomanor. He finally understood what Kunra was doing. Kunra who had saved his life after an assassination attempt by Shun Mayesh, and who burned with a warrior's fire, was not about to let Nom Anor shrink from the promise he had made. What was supposed to have been a final sermon had become a contest of wills. Nom Anor tried once more to persuade the crowd. You err by looking to me or my disciples for signs. Kunra showed him a covert grin. The prophet tells us to look to nature, to the sky, and to the stars, to the planet of redemption, whose coming he foretold. The shamed ones cheered and lifted their faces higher, beyond the elevated train rail, as if searching the sliver of purple sky for signs. Kunra moved close to Nomanor, close enough so that Nomanor could feel the tip of a kufi against his ribs. Well done, Yusha he said quietly. The multitudes are heated to the point of boiling over. We couldn't have done this without you. He paused, then added, And remember, Prefect, just as all things are possible on Yuzhan Tar today, all things will be possible tomorrow. Chapter 14 As had become her ritual since returning from the convoy ambush, Jaina would search out the officer of the watch every four hours to learn if the falcon had been heard from. Then she would spend the next hour or so on one of Rao Roost's observation viewports, gazing at the incoming traffic and stretching out with the force, in the hope that one of the moving lights might return her touch or convey some hint of familiarity. 
She was about to abandon the effort that afternoon when a swiftly moving ship caught her eye. If there was a spaceborne equivalent of a swoop, Jaina figured she was looking at it. A cramped cockpit anchored to incongruous ion fusion and hyperdrive engines, the small craft was inbound and on a trajectory for Ralroost's primary docking bay. Jaina set off for the bay, hurrying down the attack cruiser's sterile passageways and offering only the hastiest of answering salutes to passing non-coms. By the time she had descended from the landing bay's service gantry, the craft's human pilot was on deck and taking off his scratched and dented helmet. His hair was red and shaggy, and his face was wildly freckled. Made up of garments borrowed from at least three separate units, his flight uniform was soiled and patched, and his boots were as mismatched as the engines of his ship. The blaster on his hip was even more ancient than Han's. When Jaina intercepted him in the landing apron, he offered a crisp salute. "'Where are you arriving from, Lieutenant?' she shouted above the din of warming engines, repair work, and launches. "'Kalula Orbital, Colonel!' Noting Jaina's confusion, he added, "'Tyan Hegemony! I have a message from the commanding officer for Galactic Alliance Command!' Jaina moved closer to him. "'You're a courier?' Yes, sir. Then I'll show you to Admiral Crefe's cabin. Clearly the officer puzzled him, but he thanked her out of respect. That's really not necessary. I insist. Jaina motioned to the passageway hatch and fell into step beside him. When did you leave Kalula? she asked, when they could finally speak without shouting. Two days ago, local. No hostile contacts along the way. But my ship had some drive problems. Did any ships land at Kalula before you launched? Ships? A banged-up YT-1300 freighter in particular? No. You're sure? I'd have remembered a YT-1300, sir. What's the situation at Kalula? The lieutenant glanced around. I don't know that I'm at liberty, he began, then shrugged. What's it matter, right? Commanding Officer Garay wants the Admiral to be advised that, unless we can be reinforced and reprovisioned, we're likely to fall to the Yuzhan Vong. Jaina felt her pulse quicken. I'm sorry to hear that. He stopped abruptly. If it's all right with you, I'll go the rest of the way on my own. The sooner I deliver the message, the sooner I can get back to Kalula. Jaina nodded. May the Force be with you, Lieutenant. Same with you. Jaina watched him rush off. For the first time in a long while, she felt isolated and fearful. Still no word from Jason, Luke, or Mara. And now her father and mother were missing, possibly marooned in some remote star system. When she tried to reinforce the sense that they were all right, dreadful images whirled in her mind. And when she called to Leia through the Force, she received no response. She began to understand how her parents must have felt when their children had embarked on the mission to Mirker. Anakin killed, Jason missing. Jaina fleeing for the Hapes Consortium in a pirated Yuzhan Vong vessel. It was difficult enough being a teenager and worrying about your parents' safety. But being a parent and worrying about your kids had to be even worse. As Han had said on Anakin's death, a father isn't supposed to outlive his children. Jaina's thoughts turned briefly to her Uncle Luke and Aunt Mara. They had left their infant son, Ben, in the care of Cam and Tion, at the Hidden Maw installation. But they had to be wondering, worrying. Sometimes even the Force couldn't protect a person from imagined fears. Jaina pondered if she would ever be able to raise a family, to cope day to day with the concern that her child would fall victim to illness or accident make a wrong choice, or be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Dizzy at the thought, she leaned against the cold bulkhead. She heard someone call her by name, and turned to see Jag hastening to her. Tall and wiry, with a shock of white in his black hair, he was the son of Suntir Fell and Seal Antilles, both of whom had elected to remain in Chiss space. Like his Chiss confederates in Vanguard Squadron, Jag wore a black uniform with red piping. Are you all right? he asked with uncommon alarm. Did something happen? They held each other for a moment before Jaina straightened. I'm fine. No, actually, I'm not fine. I'm scared to death. 
Jag's green eyes searched her face. Of what? She shook her head in uncertainty. Possibilities. He took her right hand in his. No message from your parents. Nothing. And no word of Jason. Jag firmed his lips. I'm certain that all of them are fine. She frowned slightly. How are you certain? Or is that just something people say when they don't know what else to say? Jag blinked. I, well, perhaps it's something of both. Do I know for a fact that Jason and your parents are all right? No. Does my heart tell me that they're all right? It seems to. Jaina smiled without mirth. No medicine like logic, is there? Jag's fine eyebrows beetled. A scar ran from his right brow almost to his hairline. I know you're right. I'm driving myself mad. Thanks. He studied her. What does the Force tell you? Let's just say that the Force isn't painting as cheerful a picture as the one you just did. Jag's expression grew skeptical. You could be mistaken. You mean the Force might be throwing me a curve? She shook her head. It doesn't work that way. How does it work? He asked stiffly. Is it so different from intuition? Is there a stronger link between you and your parents than between me and my parents, simply because of the Force? Jaina shut her eyes. Jag, please, this isn't a good time to be arguing. He started to say something, then stopped and began again. Perhaps we can talk heart to heart when the war ends. Jag, I'm sorry, I'm just preoccupied. No, really. Besides, I'm slated to report to General Bell Iblis. I'll look for you later. As he started away, she almost went after him, but thought better of it. What was happening? Was Jag drifting away from her as well? Was she drifting away from him? Or was her relationship with him going to turn out to be another of the war's odd pairings? Another reversal born of desperation? In either case, it certainly had been an unexpected development. Since events in the Hapes Consortium, they had been growing more familiar with each brief encounter. They had seemed to be falling in love. Danny Quee had told her that one shouldn't be too analytical about love, that rational thinking was the quickest way to rout affection. But Danny, a scientist who did little else but analyze, was no one to talk. And how could someone not wonder about wartime romance? Because they so often emerged out of a desire to live to the fullest, wartime affairs were notorious for being as short-lived as explosions in deep space. People tended to skip all the usual stuff and fly straight to the heat. But how could you trust your emotions at a time when any day might be the last? For yourself, your family and friends, your comrades. What might have happened had she and Jag gotten to know each other in peaceful times? What would have accounted for their shared experiences? Hollow presentations? Picnics? Getaways on tourist worlds? She shook her head. Maybe she was being too hard on them. Take her parents, for instance. They had met, fallen in love, and married during the worst of times, and everything had worked out great for them. So it could work. But was she trying to emulate them in some way? Hey, soldier! Kip Duran passed her on the outside and put his arm around her shoulders. Fit, sharp-featured, and dark-haired, he had surrendered the scowl that for years had been his signature expression. Reflexively, Jaina curled her arm around his waist and leaned against his chest. The chest of a man she had once slapped across the face, but who had later become a kind of mentor to her, especially in helping her navigate the emotional storm that had attended Jason's unexpected return from Yuzhan Vong-held Coruscant a year earlier. Kip brought them to an abrupt halt and turned slightly to gaze at her. If it's any consolation, kid, I'm worried too. Jaina smiled and laughed shortly. I don't have to say a thing, do I? Kip shook his head and brushed his hair away from his eyes. Everything tells me that Jason is okay, but your parents are in trouble. They've been getting into too many tight situations lately, and now they're really in the thick of it. 
Jaina felt stronger for Kip's having articulated her fears. For a short time, she had thought she could fall in love with Kip, but those feelings had passed, and ever since then they had settled into a close and comforting friendship. I was just talking with a courier who arrived from a station in the Tyan hegemony, she said in a rush. I don't know why, but I think they're there. Kip considered it. If they are, then I guess I'm wrong about them squaring off against the Yuzhan Vong. Jaina shook her head. That's just it, Kip. Kalula Orbital is under heavy siege. From what the courier said, I think the station might already have been overrun. If I knew for sure, I'd leave right now. Kip took her hand. Let me know if you need a wingmate. Hans Blasterbolt caught the Yuzhan Vong in his unprotected armpit, twirling him fully around and sending him plummeting from the shoulders of two warriors who had been providing unintentional support. With the immediate threat eliminated, the faceless rocket man raised his left arm and fired a small grappling hook from his forearm gauntlet. The hook found purchase on an expansion girder, instantly towing him to the ceiling of the hold, out over the extended arms of swarming warriors, and through flights of blunt amphistaffs. Clambering into a crouch on the girder, he gazed down on his would-be captors, then armed his backpack missile launcher. He's going to fire. One step ahead of C-3PO, Han and Leia each grabbed one of the droid's arms and yanked him down to the deck. The projectile exploded in the center of the hold, flattening everyone within a radius of ten meters. Fifty or more stunned or dying Yuzhan Vong warriors formed the circumference of the detonation zone. But reinforcements were already on the way. Han heard them surging down the corridor, crying for blood. He got to his feet, then helped Leia and C-3PO to theirs. Simultaneous with the snap hiss of Leia's lightsaber came the drone of launched thud bugs. Leia fielded those she could. Taken by surprise, a dozen Kalula soldiers were dropped in their tracks. The volley of deflected bugs flew back down the corridor at the approaching Yuzhan Vong, only to be returned by several warriors at the head of the pack. Han caught a glimpse of five comparatively short warriors, smeared head to toe in black blood rather than sheathed in the usual arthropod armor. Otter still was the way they were holding their amphistaffs to parry thud bugs and blaster bolts. They're using them like lightsabers, he said. That seems to be the idea, Leia replied breathlessly. Han shook his head in incredulity. More new models? I don't think we should wait around to ask. The Mandalorian armored cadre apparently felt the same. Taking aim on a portion of bulkhead close to the deck, two of the troopers used missiles to blow a gaping hole into the adjoining hold. The Kalula defenders began to scramble through, with C-3PO, Leia, and Han bringing up the rear. They raced through the adjacent hold and into a wide corridor, lowering blast shields wherever they encountered them. Greeted with an intersection, Han knew enough to ask. That way, C-3PO said. Han gave a last glance at the armored fighters, then turned to follow Leia and C-3PO. The side corridor led directly to the connector that ran between Kalula's number three and four modules. Outside the tube's curved transparasteel walls, laser bolts and plasma projectiles cleaved the darkness. Coral skippers and star fighters chased one another in chaotic circles. The volcano-like launchers of enemy capital ships fired again and again. Han, Leia, and C-3PO hadn't set foot inside the number four module when something shook the entire station. The Ichna, Han said. Leia agreed. You know how hard it is to satisfy those things. Farther along, Gary's meaty adjutant motioned them from the pack of withdrawing soldiers. Captain, Princess Leia, the Falcon is ready for departure. Han stared at him. You've got to be kidding. He gestured broadly. It's worse out there than in here. I can curse her. Nevertheless, she's patched up and ready to go. Nowhere near good as new, but you should be able to jump her to Moon Calamari in a couple of micro-jumps. Han and Leia traded doubtful looks. Each officer we rescued from Salvaris could rally ten thousand additional troops to our cause, Leia said. Ultimately, Han nodded. A bunch of people a lot smarter than me figured this out so I guess we might have to trust that they're right. 
Leia smiled, spoken like a true enlisted man. Gary's adjutant directed them back to where the Falcon was berthed. With nearly every space-worthy craft launched, the place was practically deserted. Kraken, Page, and the rest of the Salvaris roster were clustered at the foot of the landing ramp. The station's klaxons began to blare triplets. Gary's adjutant cursed, then adopted a resigned expression. The commander has issued the evacuation order. Han nodded cheerlessly. You have to know when to fold. I'll be leaving you here. Han saluted him. We'll win this thing yet, chief. He turned to give the Falcon a quick glance. Leia noted Han's discouraged look. Well, he did say limp her to moan calamari. Crawls more like it. The mechanic responsible for the several add-ons emerged from beneath the starboard mandible. We spared as much blaster gas as we could for your quad lasers, but I'd go light on them if I were you. He gazed up at the Falcon and smiled. Great ship. Good journey. Han pumped the man's hand in thanks. A powerful explosion rattled the bay. Paint chips and other objects showered from the vaulted ceiling. Everybody get on board, Han said, before we end up EV without a ship. When Posh Kraken and a few other officers didn't move, he stormed over to them. You waiting for a formal invitation? Kraken almost smiled. With all due respect, Han, we've decided to remain here and do what we can. Han made his lips a thin line. Posh, this is bigger than Kalula, and you know it. Alliance Command is counting on you people to rally support in your home systems. Besides, you can't make a difference here. Those are evacuation klaxons you're hearing. Han's right, Major, Leia said. Kraken still didn't move. We'll take our chances, Princess. She blew out her breath. Your father's never going to forgive us, Posh. You'll understand. Han nodded. Then may the Force be with all of you. In other circumstances, I might make the same choice. He turned, and without a backward look, hurried Leia and C-3PO up the landing ramp. At the top, he waved Paige and the rest of the officers into the forward cargo compartment. He told Leia to begin the startup sequence, and he sent Cockmame and Miwal to the gun turrets. He ran to the stern to check the status of the escape pods, then raced forward to the cockpit. By the time he arrived, Leia was strapped in and the repulsor lift was cold-started. Han leapt into the pilot's chair while Leia lifted the Falcon, turned her about, and sent her streaking through the MagCon field. Local space was cross-cut with magma projectiles and turbolaser bolts. Dead ahead, the bloated Ichna floated motionless in space. Amid a debris cloud created by coral skippers that had thrown themselves against Kalula's shields. X Wings and other star fighters drifted lazily. Three of the station's modules were wide open to vacuum and expressing what little atmosphere they still contained. Below, explosions were blossoming on the beige and green surface of Kalula itself, with wounded coral skippers plunging into the atmosphere like fiery meteors. Han watched a dozen escape vehicles launch from an undamaged module. Kalula was finished. Three skips converging on us, Leia glanced at him. It's our old friends. Han's eyes darted to the authenticator screen. The ones that tracked us from Selvaris. What is this, a personal vendetta? Maybe they don't like our paint job. Then I'm on their side. He clamped his hands on the yoke. Hang on. Han leaned toward the intercom. Watch the fuel levels, you two. Last thing we need is to be left high and dry. He glanced over his left shoulder. Jump coordinates for Moan Calamari coming in. Leia studied the Nava computer display. We'll have come around to 303. That means back toward the station. I was afraid of that. An explosion shook the ship before it was halfway through the turn. There goes the only new piece of equipment they installed. But we can get by without it. I'm counting on that, dearest. One of the curved-tailed, tandem-piloted coral skippers appeared in the wraparound viewport, coming straight at the Falcon. Take the shot, Han said into the intercom. Singularities formed in advance of the approaching skip, but sheer firepower overwhelmed them, and the vessel came apart in roiling fire. Cockmame is really getting good, Leia said. 
Han shook his head negatively. That wasn't him. He leaned back in his seat to glance through the upper panes of the viewport. A classic fire spray class security patrol craft shot overhead. A cross-shaped ship affixed to an oval engine suite, it was followed by four gladiators, so named because they looked like swords thrust to the hilt through circular shields. It is Fett, and he's clearing a lane for us. Han snorted. Just like him to make sure he has the upper hand on a debt. Incoming transmission, Leia said, from the fire spray. Boba Fett's voice crackled through the comm. Just wanted to remind you, Solo, that my personal fight was always with the Jedi. You were nothing more than cargo. Han snorted. For what it's worth, Fett, you were never more than a nuisance. Fett laughed shortly. Two better days, Captain. Count on it. Sowing mines far to port and starboard, the fire spray continued to break a trail for the near-weaponless Falcon. Then Fett tipped the patrol craft's short wings in salute and vanished. Ready for light speed, Han said. Leia collapsed back into the co-pilot's chair, shaking her head back and forth. I have now officially seen and heard everything. She turned to Han with a half-smile. I'm almost ready to believe this war will actually end. With the Jedi Knights reduced to half their strength since the start of the war, Luke Skywalker's seven incommunicado in the unknown regions, some, including the twenty or so Jedi children, still sheltered at the Maw installation, and others participating in various Galactic Alliance military operations, Kent Hamner could gather only a dozen Jedi for the meeting held in Tracina Lobby's quarters on Mon Calamari. Though understated, the circular room at the top of Coral City's Quarren Tower was spacious and enjoyed a 360-degree view of the tranquil sea and sparkling reefs. In the continued absence of Luke and Saba, and with Kip frequently flying missions with the dozen, Tracina Lobi had become an important voice on Cal Omas's advisory council. A chief, she had a narrow face with angular features and short black hair. Tracina, Markra Mejiv, and Silgal, the Mon Calamari Jedi healer, had spent the morning preparing food, and the circular table in the sunroom was already spread with the appetizing results of their labors by the time Kenth and the others arrived. Gradually they seated themselves at the table, except for Kenth, who was too restless to eat or stay put. Clockwise from Tracina's armchair sat Silgal, Jaina, Kip, towering ginger-furred Lobaka, the Twilik female, Alima Rar, salt-and-pepper-haired combat instructor, Kyle Katarn, Chandrillan, Okta Ramus, slight and terribly scarred, Waxarn Kel, and young and darkly handsome Zek. Some of you might not be aware that operative Baljas Arnjak didn't return from Wraith Squadron's infiltration mission to Coruscant, Kent said as he circled the table. Bendy Drayson was supposed to have remained on world, but it was Arnjak who stayed, and has been furnishing the Alliance with intelligence ever since, mostly with the help of a kind of droid fungus he and his teammates let loose during the mission. Kent came to a stop between Silgal and Jaina, then leaned forward, planting the palms of his hands on the table. Arnjak's latest report states that Yusha, the so-called prophet of the heretics, was recently seen on Coruscant. By recent, I mean within the past local week, since it took that long for a string of couriers to move the information from the core to Mon Calamari. Has his identity been verified? Kyle asked from across the table. Kenth nodded. Which means that he either didn't go to Zonama Seacoat with Corin and Tahiri, or that he returned without them, Kip said. Is there some way we can establish whether he arrived back on Coruscant in the same vessel everyone left on? No, Kenth said. Or if they even reached Zonama Seacoat, Lobaka's voice issued from his droid translator. Kenth glanced at the Wookiee. Exactly. Unlike most of the Holonet transceivers, Esfandia is still functioning, if inconsistently. So assuming nothing has befallen Jade Shadow, Luke and Mara 
should have been able to contact us. We've waited long enough, Octoramus said. It's time we sent a ship. Everyone fell silent for a long moment, then Silgal said, I doubt that we'll find Zonama Seacoat at the coordinates to which we've been transmitting messages. I suspect that the living world has moved. Based on what? Alima asked. Silgal spread her webbed hands. On what the Force tells me. Kenth glanced around the table. Do any of you also feel that way? I do, Jaina said. Jason feels farther away than he did when we received Luke and Mara's transmission. She shook her head somberly. I don't feel him as distinctly. Kenth inhaled with a purpose. That's good enough for me. He compressed his lips. I say we have a talk with the prophet. Kip snorted. I agree, but getting onto Coruscant won't be easy, even with Peace Brigade and trade ships being allowed to land there. Alima looked from Kip to Kenth. Could we appeal to Alliance Command for help in inserting some of us? Kenth shook his head. Not without explaining what we're after, or why we didn't inform Command that we'd sanctioned Corin and Tahiri's mission to Zonama Seacoat. If intelligence learns that we passed on a chance to capture a shaper, a priest, and the prophet of all people. We could go to Wedge, Makra Mejiv suggested. Kenth nodded. We could, and I'm sure he'd do everything in his power to get us onto Coruscant. But I don't want to put him in the position of having to lie to Sav and Krife. I agree, Silgal said. Tracina nodded. Likewise. This is beginning to sound like Mirker all over again, Kip said. Zek looked at him. If Anakin hadn't taken on that mission, all of us might be Voxen fodder by now. Zek's right, Octoramus said. If it sounds like Mirker, it's because we have no choice but to go. Kent straightened and adopted a determined expression. We'll give Master Skywalker a week. If we don't hear from him by then, I'll assemble a strike team. Chapter 15 Its balloon-like bone-white outriggers buffeted by gusting winds, the airship moved swiftly over the devastated surface of Zonama Seacoat. Luke, Mara, Jason, and the Yuzhan Vong priest, Harar, were crammed onto the rear portion of the gondola's tiny cabin. Saba Sabatine and a Faroan male named Krajb had the controls. Companion of the manta-shaped dirigible, elegance enshrined, Krajb had arrived in the middle distance only the previous day, but had agreed to accompany the Jedi on their mission to the southern realm. Next to the two pilots stood Jabetha, wrapped in a fur-lined cloak. At three thousand meters the air was frigid, and the howling wind made conversation difficult. Even if that hadn't been the case, no one seemed inclined to talk. Jason was broodingly silent. Mara, preoccupied and restless. Saba, at least, had a bewildering assortment of organiform control levers to busy her. Luke raised the cowl of his robe and shoved his hands deep into the robe's sleeves. The Force spoke quietly on Zonama Seacoat. The rain had finally ceased in that part of the planet, but the thick cloud cover remained. The sun, whatever star it was, named or unknown, was a broad smear of incandescence behind the gray veil. A persistent chill wind rustled the giant Boris and was fast stripping them of their globular leaves. Many of the leaves had turned blue and yellow as if bruised. Something seldom seen in the middle distance, except at high altitude. Vapors froze during the long nights, leaving the canyon floors covered in white until the sun rose. Thin sheets of transparent ice formed over quiet pockets of the still-swollen river. When glimpsed at all, animals could be seen seeking shelter in caves or burrows, or fashioning durable nests, as if in preparation for a long winter. Boris seeds, too, had been observed creeping off into the Tom Posse, perhaps to seek nourishment among the oldest of the iron-tipped Boris, and wait for the lightning strikes that would split and shape them. 
The Pharaohans rarely venture it out before midday, and then only for long enough to gather firewood or effect repairs to their cliffside dwellings. Most of them avoided the Jedi whenever possible, or, when not, exchanged few words. None, however, had issued further demands that Harar be turned over to them. Luke assumed that young maid had allayed fears that the Yuzhan Vong priest was a threat. He gazed through the cabin's aft wind scream at the wounds Zonami had suffered. Quakes had opened deep trenches in the savannas. Landslides had altered the course of rivers. Fires had ravaged vast tracts of Tom Posse. Luke had considered taking Jade Shadow up to survey and catalog the damages, perhaps attaining orbit for just long enough to survey the nearby stars as well, but he couldn't trust that the planet wouldn't jump into hyperspace again, as it had after its initial reversion to real space. Covertly, he looked at Jabitha, then at Harar. He couldn't recall a time when he had been so close to a Yuzhan Vong and not engaged in fighting for his life save perhaps on the occasions he had stood close to Nomanor. But then any moments spent with Nomanor constituted a duel of sorts. For the tenth time since the airship journey had begun, Luke tried to see Harar in the force, but perceived only an absence. Despite Verger's assurances to the contrary, Harar, and by extension all Yuzhan Vong, did not seem to exist in the force. There the priest sat, not three meters away, and Luke couldn't sense him. Harar was nothing more or less than what he appeared to be. A tall, sinewy, human-like man, absent some of his fingers, and marked with tattoos, scars, and other modifications. Luke knew that he could use the force to levitate Harar, to pirouette him about the small cabin, but he couldn't see him in the same way he could see Mara, Jason, Saba, and Jabitha as a luminous being, not as the crude stuff of flesh and bone, but as an egg-shaped being of light. Verger, who had willingly spent fifty years among the Yuzhan Vong, had maintained that the seeming invisibility of the Yuzhan Vong owed not to any inherent failure of the Force, but to the way Luke and his fellow Jedi perceived the Force. The implication was that they had somehow failed to grasp that the Force was grander and far more reaching than they understood it to be. Luke could accept that. His training had been rushed, and with the deaths of Obi-Wan and Yoda, he had been obliged largely to pursue his own counsel and find his own way to mastery. He would have been the first to admit that his understanding of the Force might be limited or incomplete that he had perhaps become more a master of the living force than what the late Verger had called the unifying force. But even that deficiency should not have prevented him from being able to see Harar. Either Verger had left something out of her lectures, which Luke wouldn't have put past her, or her own understanding of the quandary was incomplete. Luke didn't for a moment doubt that the Fosh Jedi had somehow succeeded in tutoring herself to a kind of mastery, despite having been forced to conceal her Jedi abilities from her captors. But the matter of the Yuzhan Vong's invisibility ran deeper than Verger knew or had allowed. Perhaps she believed, as Yoda had at times, that her responsibility ended with setting Luke on the proper path. Perhaps that was the way among the Jedi of the Old Republic. For all the education and practice each had undergone, the achievement of mastery was ultimately the outcome of a personal quest for understanding. If any of the new Jedi Order grasped this on an intuitive level, it was Jason. Long before his re-education by Verger, some said re-indoctrination, Jason had sought to reach a personal understanding of the Force. In that, he was much like Leia, a knight in her own right, who had, for her own reasons, resisted taking up the path of the Jedi. It was Jason who had insisted that Harar accompany them on the journey Jabitha had proposed a day earlier, when she had visited Luke, Mara, and the others in the cliff dwelling. Seacoat is aging, Jabitha had said. I feel her, and yet I feel estranged from her. She remains in exile to puzzle out what has happened, and in withdrawing, she neglects Zonama. 
I don't think she has done so deliberately. It is as if she has been abducted by dark forces and is somehow imprisoned. Nom Anor, Nan Yim, and I are responsible for what has happened to Seacoat. Harar had said, We should never have come here. If the gods haven't already turned their backs on the Yuzhan Vong, they will now, for we have despoiled a living world. Jabetha had listened to the priest's confession without comment. She said, I know where we can begin to seek Seacoat, a place where the force is strong. Harar seemed to feel Luke's eyes on him and turned. His own eyes were moist, and tears had left streaks on his tattooed cheeks. The cause might have been the wind rushing through cracks in the cabin. I am overcome, he said sadly. Even with all its recent injuries, this is the world I have dreamed of. The world all my people have dreamed of. The one that ordained our past. The one we prayed would prefigure our future. A world of symbiosis rather than competition and predation. The very world we have tried time and again to recreate, only to end up with facsimiles. It is no small wonder I felt nostalgic for this place the moment we landed, that I felt I'd arrived home, though I'd never been here. If the Yuzhan Vong evolved on a world like this, Luke said, what turned you to war? Harar took a moment to reply. The ancient texts are unclear. It appears that we were invaded by a race that was more technological than animate. We called on the gods for protection, and they came to our aid, providing us with the knowledge we needed to convert our living resources to weapons. We defeated the threat and, empowered by our victory, we gradually became conquerors of other species and civilizations. Jabitha interrupted, instructing Krajb to steer the airship southwest. The terrain grew more and more rugged. Jagged mountains of crushed lava rose steeply into the clouds. Braided tails of orange-tinted water plunged from the heights into thickly forested gorges. The wind blew fiercely, and the temperature began to fall below freezing. At Jabitha's direction, Krajb and Saba piloted the airship down toward the expansive talus field of a mountain that struck Luke as being younger than Ben and twice as unpredictable. Here is where my father's fortress once stood, Jabitha explained, after the airship had been anchored to the denuded slope. Seacoat showed Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker a mental image of the fortress, as it was before the advent of the Far Outsiders. The Far Outsiders have a name, Jabitha, Harar said. It is the Yuzhan Vong who toppled your father's fortress. Of course, she said, old habits are not easily broken. Luke asked Saba to remain with Kraj in the airship. Then he and the rest emerged from the cabin and began to follow Jabitha uphill, fighting a cold, strong wind that swept down from the invisible summit. Luke saw the cave entrance before Jabitha drew everyone's attention to it. The air inside was warm and remarkably humid. The cave angled down into the mountainside, and Luke realized immediately that what they were in was actually an ancient lava tube. The floor was paved with coarse pebbles that crunched underfoot. Cooled magma from deep in the planet, the walls were composed of dense black stone, but in some places they glowed with a faint bioluminescence. How like the interiors of our space vessels, Harar said. Luke could see the resemblance, but he was reminded of something entirely different. The cave on Dagobah that Yoda had dared him to enter. But while that place had been strong in the dark side, the lava tunnel felt enchanted, strangely maternal and enfolding. He began to sense the presence of the animating intelligence he had come to know during his short time on Zonama the one helped to consciousness by the first magister, Lior Hall, who had also named the planet in the Pharaohan language, World of Body and Mind. Could this be another of Seacoat's tests? Mara wondered while they walked. I don't think so, Luke said, unless Seacoat is testing itself. 
Stop there, the voice of Seacoat said, speaking through a suddenly transfixed Jabitha. Who walks with you, Jedi Master? Two I recognize, but the third. He is called Harar, Luke said, not to Jabitha, but to the tunnel itself. He came to Zonama in the company of the one who sabotaged you. Jabitha turned to Harar. How is it I seem to know this one? My memories go back billions of turnings, and this one carries a message to me of distant times and distant events. Harar is of the people you know as the far outsiders, Luke said. The Yuzhan Vong, who tried to conquer Zonama shortly before the arrival of Verger. Jabitha shook her head. Those times are not distant, Jedi Master. But why can't I perceive him? Not as I do the children of the Firsts. Not nearly as I do the Jedi. Yes, I recall having the same experience with the far outsiders. They seem to exist outside the Force. No, Seacoat, Luke said. Even though you can't perceive Harar, he exists within the Force. Jason's right hand went to his chest, as if to touch the scar left from the piece of slave coral Verger had implanted in him. He swung to Harar. Why did the Yuzhan Vong leave their home galaxy? Harar firmed his scarred lips, then said, Some have interpreted the ancient texts to suggest that we were banished. For what reason? Jason persisted. Our infatuation with war and conquest. Some interpret our long journey as an attempt to win back the favor of the gods. Jason thought about it. Your ancestors were banished because they turned to war. They did the opposite of what was expected of them. Did the gods banish you from the Force? When Harar lifted his head, his face was a mask of fearful confusion. There is nothing in our legends about the Force. But even you compared the Force to your gods, Mara said. Luke took Harar by the shoulders, as if to shake him, but only eased him to his feet. A power, call it the gods if you have to, may have separated you from the original symbiosis. Your people experienced intolerable pain, and pain has been the only way back to that symbiosis. Harar nearly collapsed in Luke's grip. Separated from the symbiosis from our primordial homeworld. Luke dropped his hands to his sides and turned in astonishment to Jabitha, as if waiting for Seacoat to confirm what he was thinking. I now understand, Seacoat said finally. This one, his people, has been stripped of the Force. Chapter 16 there hadn't been a ceremony to equal it in untold generations. As vast as the world ships were, and notwithstanding the views of distant stars and even more distant galaxies, they weren't large enough to contain the magnificence of high ritual. Compared to Yuzhan Tar's place of sacrifice, the world ships were mere theaters. And yet, for all the grandeur and spectacle, Nom Anor was too consumed by apprehension to appreciate a moment of it. He marched in step with the procession, but the expression on his face would have been better suited to someone on his way to be executed. Located midway between Shimra's citadel and the skull-shaped bunker that housed the well of the world brain, the place of sacrifice was dominated by a hundred-meter-high truncated cone of Yorick coral, helixed with carved stairways and honeycombed with passageways that served to channel blood into fonts and other basins. On the flattened top, the priests performed their rituals, and encircling the base were the yawning pits of the corpse-disposing Maulur. To one side of the spire sprawled a group of temples oriented to the sacred directions, and to the other, a repository in which were stored the holy relics Shimra's worldship had conveyed across the dim reaches of intergalactic space. Constructed in accordance with the hallowed texts and in homage to the ancestral architecture, the complex was dense with conifers, ferns, palms, and the like, wrong for the latitude but somehow thriving. 
The air hummed with the sounds of insects and crab harps, and was heady with the smell of Pollock incense, which wafted in thick curling clouds from bone braziers. Along the perimeter of the quadrangle were pens for the blood-sopping Ungdins, and at each corner sat Amandul, whose enormous tympanic belly was capable of amplifying the utterances of the various celebrants. Since the priests had not yet grown to trust Yuzhan Tar's world brain, the matched pair of consuming beasts, known as Tuskart and Sagaru, waited in the wings with their handlers. In case the capricious Duryam failed to command the Maulur to execute their tasks. More specialized than Yamisks, Duryams had full responsibility for world shaping. Their decisions were based on the continuous streams of data they received from planet wide networks of telepathically linked creatures. But Yuzhan Tar's Duryam had been behaving as if there were glitches in the data flow and it had already ruined several sacrifices by spewing fetid-smelling wastes from the Maulur. Shimra, however, had apparently found a way to placate or otherwise bring the world brain into line, because thus far the sundry biotes were functioning smoothly. No Manor suspected that the Supreme Overlord had tricked the Duryam into thinking that by providing the Maulur with nourishment, it would be helping the gardens and copses of trees to flourish. He and some of Yuzhan Tar's consuls entered the place of sacrifice to music that was at once solemn and celebratory, sated on yan skak and snack beetles, and mildly intoxicated on spark bee honey grog and other home brews, the crowds of onlookers applauded exuberantly. Thousands of warriors kneeled to both sides of the Grand Avenue, heads lowered and amphistaffs curled sedately around their extended right arms, fists planted solidly on the ground. With guards posted at all entry points and circulating through the crowd, it seemed improbable that any shamed ones could get within a fawn of the place. Regardless, Nom Anor continued to torment himself with worry. Behind the intendants marched elites of the four castes. High priest Jakan and his coven of savants. Red-cloaked warmaster Nas Choka and three dozen of his supreme commanders. Master shaper Kila Quad and her chief adepts. And high prefect Drathul, baton of high office in hand and leading his cabal of personal consuls. Last came Shimra, without Onimi for as a shamed one, Onimi was barred from attending such weighty proceedings, but accompanied by his quartet of hideous seers. Attired in a train of living insects and holding the royal scepter, the supreme overlord rode atop a Yorick coral sled drawn by a pack of bishop hounds. All fangs, talons, horns, and blades— Female dervishes whirled at the base of the spire, while the elite arranged themselves in tiers below Shimra's moonbeam throne. Nome Anor sat close to the top with an unobstructed view of the sacrificial platform toward which Jakan climbed, followed by a gang of executioners, priestesses, and young acolytes. At the appointed moment, when the sun had reached a place in the sky from which it could set the rainbow bridge aflame, the captives were led into the complex by a parade of Ungdin handlers and Chazrak troops, riding twelve-legged Queenic beasts. Counting what the peace brigaders had managed to deliver and those captured only three standard days earlier at Kalula, the captives numbered close to one thousand. Military officers, political officials, soldiers, and protesters from scores of worlds along the invasion corridor Men, women, even a few adolescents who had fought bravely enough to be rewarded with honorable death, they had been purged, bathed, perfumed, mildly sedated with sense of slug gas, and blessed with tishwi leaf smoke. Manacled, they wore white robes that glowed with green designs and were veined in black along arterial networks down the sleeves and fronts. The captives were brought to a halt at the foot of the spiral staircases that twisted around the spire. By then Jakan and the others had reached the top and were waiting eagerly. At Shimra's nod of consent, Jakan raised his arms and spoke, 
and the bellies of the four Mandul's carried his invocation far and wide. Accept what we offer as evidence of our wish to render unto you what is rightfully yours, the high priest intoned. If not for you, we should not exist. Dedicated lambents illuminated statues of the gods which lined the quadrangle. The statues would be anointed with first blood. But because of the special nature of the sacrifice, Yun Yuzhan would receive only a healthy share, with much of the sacrificial blood going instead to Yun Yamka, god of war. Guards began to force the captives to ascend the staircases. Despite their sedation, they floundered and fought, showing no appreciation for the honor that had been bestowed on them. In the end, though, there was little they could do to affect their fate. The first of the captives had reached the circular platform when a howl rose from below. With nearly half the audience of elites rising to their feet, no manor couldn't see what was going on. It sounded as if a battle had broken out among some of the guards stationed at the base of the spire, perhaps a domain dispute. He pitied those who lacked the self-control to delay their contest until after the sacrifice, but at least he wouldn't be blamed. Then he realized what was actually happening. As if detonating, carefully camouflaged chukka caps were popping from the quadrangle's hexagonal paving stones. The shells of an aquatic creature, the caps concealed the entrances to shafts that must have descended into the maze of canyons below the place of sacrifice, down to the wide thoroughfares that had once separated the tall edifices of Coruscant, down into the dusky underworld of scrub growth and meandering pathways the shamed ones had claimed as their own. Out of the shafts were emerging hundreds of shamed ones, Yusha's flock of heretics, armed with amphistaffs, kufis, an array of homemade weapons, even a few blasters. Momentarily taken off their guard, the warriors, many in ceremonial armor only, were slow to react, and dozens were felled in an instant. As the shamed ones spread out into the crowd, the commoners began to panic, surging down into the quadrangle. Fearing that the heretics had come for Shimra, the slayers closed ranks around the supreme overlord, unfurling their amphistaffs, heedless of any who might be standing in front of them. But no Manor saw that only a small contingent of shamed ones was closing on Shimra's dais, and that this group was clearly a diversion. It was the prisoners the heretics had come for. Oblivious, thinking perhaps that it was all a hallucination, the captives were being scooped off their feet by bands of heretics and rushed back into the labyrinthine underworld from which the pariah army had climbed. Not all of them made it to safety. Scores were dropped by thud and razor bugs, along with three times as many shamed ones. Shimra's black-smeared seers were flailing their arms in dread, and Jakan appeared to have been struck deaf and silent. The executioners, however, were rushing down the staircases and lashing out with their keen weapons, determined to administer at least a few decapitations, as if the gods could be satisfied with a snack when they had been anticipating a feast. What blood was running into the quadrangle, the Ungdins were thirsty to absorb. Unable to contain themselves, they were wriggling free of their handlers, and in so doing, providing slick patches of crushed bodies for warriors in pursuit of the heretics and the captives they had set free. Nomanor wasn't sure if he should flee, throw himself on one of the slayer's kufis, or crawl to Shimra on his belly and beg forgiveness while there was still a chance. He glanced over his shoulder to see Drothul skewering him with a look of unmitigated hatred. The high prefect had said that he would hold no manor accountable for any interference, and now Drothul was intent on making good his threat. Pressed among the crowd, no manor readied his venom-spitting eyeball. Drothul was already shouldering his way through the throng, brandishing his baton. Was no manor going to have to kill another high prefect just to save his own neck? Shimra would have expected no less of him. Drothul was almost within arm's reach of no manor when the supreme overlord's voice rang out above the melee of droning thud bugs, snapping amphistaffs and sizzling blaster bolts, his huge head rising above those slayers that made up his living fence. High Prefect Drothul, no more of this shall we brook. 
At this place is our patience and goodwill sundered. Shimra stood to his full and imposing height, towering over everyone. I demand the heart of every Yuzhan Vong who has aided and abetted the prophet. Everyone in the vicinity was cowering except for No Manor, because of how tightly he was wedged in place. Perhaps that was why he alone happened to be gazing past Shimra when one of the slayers slipped away into the crowd. Except that the individual wasn't a slayer. Master of disguise that he was, Nome Anor recognized that the deserter was wearing an Uglith masker, which not only cloaked his appearance but also reshaped his body. And from the way the slayer moved with a somewhat trembling gait, the impostor could only be Onimi. For the fourth and final micro-jump that would deliver them at last to Moon Calamari, Han and Leia had sealed off the cockpit and spent the entire time in each other's arms. Leia on Han's lap in the pilot's chair, her arms around his neck. By the time the Falcon reverted to real space, Han was delirious, and Leia felt that, as safe corners went, the cockpit wasn't too shabby, at least until they happened on the real thing. Approaching the water world from well beyond its solitary moon, they were greeted by the sight of an enormous, perhaps unprecedented, gathering of warships, a unified force of battle groups, flotillas and fleets from all regions of the galaxy. Bothan, Bakarin, Imperial Remnant and Chiss, Sullustan, Hapen, Ariadwan, and Hut, Corellian and Mon Calamarian. In a glance they saw Mediator-class battlecruisers, Belarus-class cruisers, Lancer-class frigates, and Hapen battle-dragons. They saw ensembles of Nova-class battlecruisers and Corellian gunships, reprovisioned flotillas of KDY Marl-class heavy freighters, attack groups of Imperial II-class star destroyers, Republic-class cruisers, and Immobilizer-class interdictors, their hemispherical gravity well projectors accented by starlight. There were Rawl Roost, Right to Rule, Harbinger, Alagos Akla, Mon Adapine, and Mon Mothma, the Super Star Destroyer Guardian, and the ancient dreadnought Star Sider. You disappear for a couple of days, Han said when he was past his initial astonishment, and the kids turned the house into party central. Wordlessly, he and Leia maneuvered the Falcon through corridors formed by the massive ships. The confined lanes were thick with starfighters and tenders. Ultimately, they were requested to surrender control of the freighter to one of Raoul Roos' tractor beams, which carried them gently into the cruiser's immense starboard docking bay. A large crowd had turned out to welcome the Falcon home, and cheers and applause filled the scrubbed air as Han, Leia, and their roster of very influential people descended the boarding ramp. Jaina rushed from the sidelines to hug her parents for dear life. Han was nonplussed. We'd have been here sooner, but we had to spend three days at Sublight making repairs to the repairs. I knew you were at Kalula, she said, refusing to let go of him. I should have listened to the Force and gone there. I'm glad you didn't, Leia said, taking a moment to gaze at her daughter. Has there been any further word from the station? A courier arrived from Kalula yesterday, Jaina said. The station and the planet fell to the Yuzhan Vong. Hundreds were taken captive and sent to Coruscant. The sacrifice, Han said. Jaina nodded grimly and began to lead her parents away from the Falcon. Han thought about Posh Kraken and the rest who had chosen to remain at Kalula, rescued only to be captured again. He was reminded of what had often happened at the beginning of the war, when countless refugees had been taken advantage of by pirates and peace brigaders. Is there news from Coruscant? he asked. Jaina nodded. Good and bad, but you can hear for yourself. Admiral Crefe wants to bring you up to speed personally. Give us a hint, Leia said. Jaina lowered her voice. The Yuzhan Vong have amassed an armada. We're expecting them to strike us here. Han blew out his breath. That explains all the ships. Let's just hope that wasn't the good news, Leia said. 
Jaina talked nonstop for the several minutes it took them to ascend to Raoul Roost's command deck and ride a skimmer to a conference cabin amidships. Han and Leia were disappointed to learn that the Jedi still hadn't heard from Luke, Mara, Jason, or the others. It wasn't like them to remain out of contact for so long. The white-furred Bothan Admiral, Triest Crefe, rose from his chair at the head of the long conference table, as Leia, Jaina, and Han were being escorted into the cabin space. His violet eyes took in Han and Leia, and he smiled broadly. We were all starting to wonder if you'd decided to take unannounced leave. Well, we have our own idea about what constitutes a vacation, Han joked. Leia managed to smile, but just barely. By all, Crefe had meant the dozen high-ranking officers who were seated at the table. Defense Force Supreme Commander Seen Sav, Grand Admiral Gilad Pelion, Generals Wedge Antilles, Garm Bel Iblis, Kean Farlander, Carlist Raiken, and Aaron Kraken. Commodore Brand, Queen Mother and Jedi Knight Tanel Ka, and bulky Major General Eldo Davip. Promoted as a result of his brave actions aboard the Star Destroyer Luzankia at the Battle of Borlias. Han and Leia needed no introductions to any of them, but there were others they recognized only by species rather than name. Han threw everyone a grin of greeting. Leia shook hands with Gilad Pelion and Kean Farlander, kissed Wedge and Tenel Ka on both cheeks, then went to Aaron Kraken, with whom she had spoken briefly from the Falcon. Hosh was one of the officers captured at Kalula Orbital and taken to Coruscant, Kraken said. But I'm hoping for the best. No one knows Coruscant better than my son, and if anyone can escape, it'll be him. Han, Leia, and Jaina found seats for themselves. Just to catch you up, Crefe said, the sacrifice ceremony took place as scheduled. But our agents report that before anyone had been put to the Kufi, there was an uprising by several hundred heretics. The heretics managed not only to interfere with the ceremony, but also to abscond with more than three hundred Alliance prisoners. Just to spoil things for Shemra? Han asked. We're not sure at this point, but we have learned that an untold number of shamed ones have been rounded up in return, and are apparently going to be put to death. No Alliance personnel were among those seized, so presumably our people are being well hidden. If they're even alive, Han said, the shamed ones could have staged a sacrifice of their own, in honor of whatever deity they worship. He glanced at Kraken. Sorry, Aaron, but I think it's premature to consider these heretics as allies. We agree, Crefe said. The possibility of a secret sacrifice or a hostage scenario cannot be ruled out. However, we have also learned the purpose of the original sacrifice was to ensure victory for the Armada Shimra plans to launch against Moan Calamari. Han and Leia pretended to be surprised by the news. Do we know when or how they're going to do this? Leia asked. Sav spoke to the question. A Solaston, he looked as if he were wearing a large-eared, heavy-jowled mask. Intelligence has determined that the enemy plans to attack directly from the Perlemian trade route. Secondary salience will be launched from Tungul and Kalula, both of which now host Yamisks. There appears to be twofold purpose for installing war coordinators on those worlds. First, to coordinate flanking attacks, and second, to provide rear guard defense in the event the initial wave is repelled. Han glanced around the cabin. How many Yuzhan Vong vessels are we talking about? On the order of five thousand, Bel Iblis supplied flatly the fingers of his left hand smoothing his drooping mustache. Han sat away from the table in shock. Then we haven't a chance. Not force against force, Sav said, but we have high confidence that the enemy has made a strategic blunder by opting to stage from remote worlds like Tungul and Kalula. Bel Iblis nodded in agreement. More important, we think we can take advantage of the fact that Yuzhan Vong are expecting us to turn tail and scatter. 
Han regarded the inscrutable Sullustan and the gray-haired human. If there was any lingering bad blood between Sav and Bel Iblis over what had occurred during the evacuation of Coruscant, there was no evidence of it now. In fact, everyone at the table appeared to have reached an accord. Why wouldn't we be better off scattering our fleets? he asked carefully. We've enough ships to open dozens of new fronts. And wage a war of rebel actions for the next ten years, while the enemy grows stronger? Crefe said, no. By scattering, we would leave Mon Calamari open to assault. And we certainly don't want to see happen here what happened on Coruscant. There is no more dangerous species than one that views killing as cleansing. He gave his head a determined shake. This must be our decisive step. Without going into detail at this time, Sav said, let me just add that we plan to give all appearances of being caught unawares by the Armada and of engaging it head on. This alone will give the enemy pause. In fact, half our forces will have already relocated to Kantrum, which has agreed to serve as our staging area, thanks to the efforts of General Kraken. We're counting on Captain Page to prevail on the leaders of Coralag to do the same. Han shook his head in confusion. Staging areas for what? The farther from Mon Calamari you place those fleets, the more trouble we'll have communicating with them. And if you're thinking of jumping them back to Mon Calamari by surprise, then maybe you need to be reminded of what happened to the Hapens at Fondor. Tenel Ka acknowledged Han's remark with a veiled nod. Fondor was a special circumstance, Commander Brand said. Our strategy would have worked if... In any case, it isn't our intention to jump the fleets back to Mon Calamari. What is your intention? Leia asked. Crefe cleared his throat meaningfully. By devoting only half our battle groups to the defense of Mon Calamari, the remainder will be free to move against our primary target. Coruscant Chapter 17 Ruthless deeds returned to harass their architect, Gnome Anor thought, as he viewed the execution of the heretics. The deaths were taking place not atop the Yorick Coral Spire in the place of sacrifice, but in an area outside the sacred precinct, where many of the Yuzhan Vong beasts went to die, and warriors trained for combat. Once a sports arena in the district known as the Western Sea, it was now an ossuary, a boneyard, lush with swampy growth, rank with odors of decay, and breeding ground for millions of meter-long Yargan rodents. The bowl couldn't hold many spectators, but Shemra had ordered it filled to overflowing with bone stackers, workers, and low echelon others, both as a blunt demonstration of his wrath and as a warning to any who would follow the prophet. The doleful music of musicians went unappreciated. The foodstuffs spread across the banquet tables for the elite went untouched. The clawed beasts, tasked with the executions, snorted and bellowed. But this was not noble death, but capital punishment. It was three local days after the abortive sacrifice ceremony, and on orders passed down from Shimra to High Prefect Drathul, and then on to Nomanor, three thousand shamed ones had been gathered up, ten for every captive who had been liberated from the ceremony. What percentage of them were heretics made no difference, for this was an attempt to put an end to further enrollment, though no Manor felt that it might have precisely the opposite effect. Shimra had sent warriors to purge Yuzhan Tar's underworld of heretics on previous occasions, but this was the first time he had done so openly and had turned the mass arrests into a macabre entertainment. Some were saying that Shimra had crossed a dangerous line, but only those who weren't aware of the lengths to which Shimra would go to maintain his authority and the mental power he could bring to bear when necessary. No one privy to the methods Shimra had used to attain the throne voiced any criticisms. During the intergalactic journey, Shimra, by dint of noble birth, prophecy, and divination, had been placed among a pool of candidates who might one day be eligible for consideration to succeed Supreme Overlord Quarial on his death. 
All the nobles who comprised that small privileged group had been raised as if they might one day rise to the throne. They were doted upon, fed the finest foods, trained in warfare and religion. They enjoyed every luxury. Though overseen by the high priests, the selection process was markedly similar to the way in which infant duryams were tested, to determine which was the most capable and worthy of becoming a world ship or planetary brain. Shimra was at once the pride and distress of Domain Jaman. Early evidence of his maliciousness, he had killed his own twin at just seven years of age to eliminate a possible competitor from entering the pool. His majestic size was attributed to the work of shapers in his domain. Domain Jaman also had its share of distinguished warriors, and in distant times had produced more than the usual share of supreme commanders, along with three war masters. The shapers, too, were praiseworthy, as were Jaman's priests. Still, the domain was not generally thought to be bellicose. But as the long voyage through the void began to gnaw at every one, Jaman members had grown outspoken about their impatience with Quarial, who was cautious, traditional, and had done little to keep Yuzhan Vong's society intact at a time when guidance was needed most. Even so, no one believed that Domain Jaman would actually rise up and make a bid to usurp Quarial's power. In one bold action, Shimra's warriors moved against Quarials, executing them along with every member of their domains. Then they did the same to Quarial, and they put to death almost all the priests, advisors, and shapers who had supported Quarial in his attempt to steer a course away from the newly discovered galaxy. Others knew better than to question Shimra, and their wisdom allowed them to live. Domains like Chai, which had lost a great warrior during an early confrontation with the inhabitants of the galaxy, and the Praetorite Vong, though their fealty to Shimra had been nothing more than a ruse to keep secret Prefect Dagara's own invasion plans. Plans that Nome Anor himself had been drawn into, to the point of assisting the Praetorite in acquiring a Yamisk even if it was a faulty one that would have been condemned to death had no manor not persuaded the shapers in charge of the biote to allow him to have it in exchange for certain favors. If Shimra knew, no manor might even now be among the ossuaries dying rather than merely witness to the event. All around him, warriors were using their amphistaffs and batons to prod greater enthusiasm from the spectators, but they roused little more than ritual cheers because, in the arena below, things weren't going quite as planned. If Innocent had been arrested with guilty, there would certainly have been much beseeching of forgiveness from Shimra. Instead, the shamed ones were going to their deaths, being torn limb from limb, clawed and gutted, gobbled like succulent fruits, tossed about like playthings, cursing Shimra and the elites and crying, Yusha lives! Long live Yusha! Jakan, Naschoka, Kilaquad, and Drathul could only look on in dismay, for the suggestion was that everyone arrested was a heretic or had at least been somehow persuaded to show disdain for tradition. None of the elite would even dare glance at Shimra, save for Noma Nor, who, out of the corner of his one real eye, saw that the supreme overlord was laughing. Everyone in the Ralroost briefing center had fallen silent, in response to the hologram Admiral Crefe had conjured from a projector. Shimmering in diaphanous blue light were images of a world engulfed by vines, giant ferns, and trees with enormous fronds, some fan-shaped, some as delicate as feathers. Spires and pinnacles and flat-topped bluffs rose from the luxuriant vegetation, and in the distance immense mountains heaved, their alloy bones protruding through the verdant cloaks that had been thrown over them and their faces marred by geometric openings. Water-filled basins abounded, reflecting the light of a bruised sky, and flowing slowly through deep gorges were rivers, without twists or bends or oxbow lakes. 
Mossy outcroppings jutted from jungle patched in brilliant scarlet that darkened to crimson or joined with other patches to form expanses of shimmering black or spark gap blue, all shot through with streaks that shimmered like precious metals. Winged creatures flitted from height to height, hunting just above the canopy, while massive beasts lumbered below. All in all, it was a planetscape too haphazard, too uneven, too immature to be real. And in some sense it wasn't. Coruscant, Crefe told his audience of several hundred Alliance officers. At the touch of Crefe's left forefinger, a second hollow superimposed itself on the first, showing the Senate, Calicur Heights, Column Commons, the Glitani Esplanade, and other once-celebrated locations of the former galactic capital. You can see that things have changed, the Bothan added. Seated to one side of the command rostrum, Han and Leia remained as thoughtfully silent as everyone else. With Crefe stood most of the officers who had been present at the informal briefing that Han, Leia, and Jaina had attended four days earlier. You undermine your own argument for attacking Coruscant, a hut said from front row center. His name was Embra, and he was commander of a resistance group known as the Sysar Runners. Clearly the planet is beyond restoration. From what we have been given to understand, the Yuzhan Vong even managed to alter the orbit and rotation. Why should we waste our dwindling resources on rescuing Coruscant in any case? an Agamarian officer said. What did the New Republic Senate do for us when the Yuzhan Vong invaded? They hung us out to dry. They allowed the worlds of the outer and mid-rims to fall, while they recalled the fleets to protect the core. Many of the choices made were regrettable, Sav said in thickly accented basic, his black eyes shining. There are countless examples of gross misjudgment, but those were political concerns and they shouldn't be reason enough to splinter us now. Shimra wants us to believe that Coruscant can't be rebuilt, and is protected by hidden defenses. But it is not beyond redemption. Yes, the orbit has been altered, and the surface temperature has been raised, but it is certainly not uninhabitable. Much of the vegetation is surface cover. Underneath, beneath the veneer, much of our technology is intact, or at the very least, repairable. Rogue Squadron Leader Gavin Darklighter stood up. Sirs, according to reports made by Jason Solo, Coruscant is protected by hidden defenses. Jedi Solo indicated that an attack would set in motion contingencies that would ultimately render the planet unfit for reoccupation. We've taken Jason Solo's report under advisement, Crefe said, but because of what he experienced during his captivity, we are not inclined to accept his statements as incontrovertible. Han was quick to put his arm around Leia's shoulders. Easy there, Manka Cat. What did you expect Crefe to say? Leia turned to him. You believe Jason? Of course I believe him, but these people aren't as smart as we are. That's not what you said at Kalula. Han waved his free hand in dismissal. Ah, that was only for show. Sav was speaking. Our attack on the Peace Brigade convoy at Selvaris was merely the first step in destabilizing Overlord Shemra. A question, Admiral Crefe, said a wing commander Han didn't know by name. I thought we won the war at Ebak 9. That's not a question, Crefe grumbled, but I'll address it anyway. The war will not be won until we've retaken Coruscant. Our crusade is not only justified, but essential. Coruscant cries out for vengeance. He softened his tone to add, Shimra's planned attack on Mon Calamari will leave Coruscant lightly defended and vulnerable. Even if we fail to catch Shimra's home defense fleet napping, it's possible that we can kill Shimra or make things too unpleasant for him to remain on Coruscant. An attack is the last move he expects us to make. Our resistance leaders on Coruscant maintain that the time is ripe, Aaron Kraken said. The shamed ones are ready to make their move. 
intelligence now believes that Alliance prisoners were rescued not for sacrifice or hostage-taking, but as a means of sending a signal that the heretics are ready to ally with us in the fight. Shimra is well aware of the fact that he is fighting on two fronts, and his planned attack on Mon Calamari smacks of desperation. He knows that he needs to defeat us before we succeed in amassing a force sufficient to threaten him, or before the heretics conspire to pitch him from the throne. According to the same report Colonel Darklighter made reference to, the general continued, the seed ship that conveyed the world brain to Coruscant was overwhelmed, and thousands of captives escaped. Many of those former slaves, who have been forced to survive on gray weave and whatever they can forage, steal, or ransack, have found their way to the resistance. With help from us, they can weaken the Yuzhan Vong from within. An unexpected attack on the world the enemy knows as Yuzhan Tar will be as demoralizing to the Yuzhan Vong as the fall of Coruscant was to the New Republic. The audience stirred, but no one had questions. I wish to speak for a moment about the attack on Mon Calamari itself, Crefe said. Again the Bothan's hand went to the hollow projector controls. The 3D image showed a pliable-looking, bulbous-headed marine-looking creature, trailing a mass of tentacles of varying length and thickness. A Yamisk, Crefe said. The gigantic, genetically engineered creature that serves as a war coordinator for the Yuzhan Vong. Its telepathic abilities, though limited, enable it to facilitate communications among war vessels and to project its thoughts and feelings onto others, Yuzhan Vong, human, and so on. By virtue of its capacity to meld with coral skippers and other craft, its presence can affect the outcome of any military engagement. Analysis of recent battle recordings suggests that the Yuzhan Vong Armada will take the form of this monstrosity, with warships, gunship analogs, and coral skippers strung out to represent tentacles, and capital ships, tenders, carriers, and actual Yamask vessels comprising the Armada's fortified heart. Crefe's light pointer indicated the tentacles. Our strategy will be to sow confusion in these key areas by using our fastest ships to strike and fade, gradually opening fire lanes to the center. These attacks will commence the moment the Armada emerges from hyperspace. As the main body of the Armada nears Mon Calamari space, the ranged weapons of our largest ships will begin to hammer away at the center. Concurrently, Courier ships will be dispatched to Kantrum, where our fleets will be standing by. We anticipate that when the Yuzhan Vong commander at Mon Calamari learns that Coruscant is under siege, he will attempt to jump some of his battle groups back to the core, by way of Tungul and Kalula, trusting the Yamisks installed on those worlds to coordinate withdrawal and protect the possibility of ambush. With all due respect, Admiral, a Mon Calamari officer said, Nas Choka is a far more shrewd warmaster than Savong La was. He won't be taken in by intelligence disinformation. And at Tungul and Kalula, he'll be on the watch for interdictors, or mines of the sort we employed successfully at Ebak 9. Precisely, Crefe said, which is why we'll employ none of that. Instead, Alliance infiltration teams will by then have incapacitated the Yamisks on both worlds. Deprived of battle coordination, the withdrawing battle groups will be vulnerable to counterattack. The odds are against our inflicting sufficient damage to rout them, but the longer we can keep them from returning to the core, the greater the chances of our Kontrum fleets scoring heavily against Coruscant and against Shimra. Han made a low sound of puzzlement, and Leia turned to him. What? she said. Doesn't add up. If Kalula had been defended in the first place, the Vong wouldn't have been able to use it as a staging area now. Suddenly Han was on his feet. Leia assumed that he wanted to share his concerns with everyone on the rostrum. Instead, he said, I wanted to be counted in on the Kalula mission. Admiral Crefe swung to him. 
Thank you, Captain Solo. Consider it done. Leia was still staring at him when he sat down. What? he said. You is what? Salvaris. Then back to Salvaris. Kalula. And now back to Kalula? Besides, you just volunteered for something you said didn't add up. Yeah, but I'd sooner volunteer us for the mission than have anyone else risk it. Leia shook her head in wonder. You're trying to get us killed, is that it? Just the opposite, Han grinned. I can't have you getting bored with me. Well, this should be good for at least another twenty-five years. Han patted her leg, then grew serious. Here's the real reason. I want us to do it for everyone who died or was captured at Kalula. Chapter 18 Casual questioning of some of those who had attended the cleansing rite, or slaughter, as many were whispering, had left Nome Anor with the impression that he had been the only one to notice Shimra's laughter. Now, two days after the heretics had been put to death, the Supreme Overlord's unnerving smile was visible for everyone in the Hall of Confluence to see. Nas Choka knelt before him. The scepter of entreaty curled around the arm that normally would have propped the War Master's domain Tsaisi. Most gracious Lord, Nas Choka was saying, I take it upon myself, in the names of the priests, seers, and others of my domain, to implore that additional thought be given to the holy task you have set before your warriors, to proceed with haste to Mon Calamari, and there lay waste to the ships of our enemy's fleet, so that we might end this struggle at last, and see to the greater duty of bringing the truth to those whose homes we have conquered, lest we be forced to crush them underfoot, like so many Gritcha. I ask this in the name of Yun Yamka, to whom I am forsworn, and in all respect, since it is you who have Yun Yamka's ear, and upon you that the burden of existence rests. Shimra leaned forward, with his pointed chin resting on the palm of his huge hand, and Onimi left the steps below the throne to sit cross-legged by the war master, studying him with his lopsided head tilted to the heavy side, but without giving voice to rhyme or insult. Pray, just what is it that your priests and seers have been telling you, war master? Since your words are the first I have heard of such matters, Shimra asked. Surely you harbor no doubts that your mighty armada can prevail. No, great lord, of that I have no doubts. It is instinct that compels me to ask, at what cost to us? Shimra motioned to him. Continue, war master, so that all here gathered might get a glimmer of the inner workings of so strategic a thinker. Nas Choka raised his gaze. Great Lord, I do not counsel against striking Mon Calamari. I question only the timing of the assault. Shimra adopted a look of perplexity. Of what timing do you speak? Are the stars in this peculiar sky out of alignment? Do the days of the sacred calendar augur for caution? Are you not in the proper mood to mete out punishment? Speak plainly, War Master. I will think only the more of you for it. Nas Choka snapped his fists to his shoulders in salute. Great Lord, I would prefer to concentrate our efforts on securing further those worlds we hold in the regions our enemy catalogs as core, colonies, inner rim, and expansion region. That much accomplished, we will have created an impenetrable wall against incursion, and from inside that wall we can continue to make forays out into the mid-rim and other sectors, until we have at last driven the forces of our enemy into a region where they might be subdued by attrition or with one final stroke. Is that not what we have already done? Shimra asked. As we speak, they are consolidated at Mon Calamari. We have pushed them to the extremes of their own galaxy. Some of the enemy, gracious lord, but not all. Pockets of strong resistance remain. To subdue the huts fully required years, and it may take as many to subjugate the Hapes Consortium, the Chiss Empire, the corporate sector. In all those places, to name but a few, the enemy is strong. 
I won't argue that many of their fleets are now united at Mon Calamari, but our campaigns in the remnant at Esfandia and Bilbringi yet again have cost us dearly. War vessels need to be grown and nurtured, weapons, craft, and coral skippers alike. Our armada is weakest in the very vessels needed to move it. More, we need to be better equipped for surface contests. Unless it is our design to poison more worlds than we already have, and risk having the gods misunderstand our intentions, and pronounce us callous toward life. Nomanor was impressed, and wished he had the courage to support Nas Choka openly, but he couldn't chance adding his voice to the War Masters, not without jeopardizing his special relationship with Shemra. But if the truth could be told, Nomanor would have confessed that he wanted only to protect the world with which he had been entrusted. Having struggled for so long to attain a rank of authority, he had no desire to see the privileges that came with his station disappear because of some blunder by Shemra. The Supreme Overlord himself was too keen a strategist to take issue with all that Nas Choka was saying. But the War Master was ignorant about the one unknown quantity that was compelling Shemra to move quickly, and in seeming defiance of the belief that he was being short-sighted. That one unknown was Zonama Seacoat. I appreciate your concerns, War Master, Shimra said. And indeed, if anyone is worthy of the honorific, it is you, for your insight is sharp as a honed kufi. He paused just long enough for Nas Choka to regain his confidence before adding, But you are in error. I assure you that Yun Yuzhan was greatly pleased by the deaths of so many heretics at the Place of Bones. Trust to him, to Yun Yuzhan, to allay the concerns of the Slayer and the other gods. You will be rewarded with victory, War Master, and praises will be sung to you and your commanders, now and for generations to come. Nom Anor smiled inwardly. Shemra was brilliant at playing the game. All his talk of mollifying the gods was nothing more than a subterfuge. Something beyond debate by the priests, since the supreme overlord was their only real conduit to the gods. And it struck Nomanor that Shimra was right about what he had said at their most recent meeting. The Yuzhan Vong had outgrown the gods. It wasn't that the gods didn't exist, so much as the Yuzhan Vong no longer needed them. All at once he felt someone's eyes on him. He looked to Shemra, but Shemra was still gazing down on Nas Choka. It was Onimi who was watching Nomanor. In his command grotto, deep in the bowels of the holy mountain that was the world ship citadel, Nas Choka, his chief tactician, and a warrior seer studied a display of blaze bugs moving about in their Yorick coral niche. Insects capable of hovering in flight or glowing or darkening at the behest of a Yamask, the bugs provided a visual representation of Yuzhan Vong and enemy forces marshaled at Mon Calamari and the relatively neighboring worlds of Tungul and Kalula. The frenzied motion of the insects mirrored the swirling of Nas Choka's thoughts. Shemra is deranged, the female seer said smiling as if bequeathed more than his usual knowledge of events. Nas Choka looked at his blood-smeared subordinate. You are safe herein, seer, but were I you, I would exercise caution about what words fly from my mouth. Shemra has ears throughout the citadel, and in more places than you can imagine. And who, seer, would you bid go to staffs? with one of the Supreme Overlord's newly enhanced warriors, should you be challenged. The seer bowed at the waist. Your forgiveness, War Master. There is no swaying, Shimra. What matters now is that we do not fail him. Nas Choka turned to face his cardinal subalterns. None of you need fear expressing your opinions here, but take care elsewhere, both on and distant from Yuzhan Tar. He returned his attention to the blaze bug display. The enemy fleet remains, augmented now by ships from star systems far removed from the war. 
The tactician, attired in high turban and long cloak, nodded. As I feared, they are allying against us. We were wrong to move quickly in the remnant and in the Kornacht cluster. We might well have been able to make use of the so-called Imperials and the barbaric Yavitha. We might have at least led them by their noses long enough to consider that there was greater profit in allying with us. Nas Choka snorted in agreement. Had I to do it over again, I might even have kept the huts on our side. They have themselves to blame, the tactician said. Their offer of support was tendered only as a means of positioning themselves safely between us and the enemy. That they underestimated us is reason enough not to extend them any honor. Nas Choka nodded. Their species is arrogant. Sooner or later, they would have attempted to betray us, and it would have come down to contest. Nothing would be different now. Except perhaps that Nas Choka wouldn't have been escalated to Warmaster, the seer said. Another instance of escalation by default, Nas Choka said harshly. Savong La became too fixed on the Jedi. He made the war personal. He displayed pride in having a Vuasa groan, merely so that he could slay it and claim one of its legs as his own. His insolence was his undoing. It blinded him to the truth. The Jedi are a nuisance, but they are hardly the secret weapon we first thought them to be. As their numbers dwindle, so apparently does their ability to call on the Force. He laughed shortly. Savong La would have directed the armada against a handful of upstarts with magic swords. It would be frankly laughable were it not so tragic. Again the War Master scrutinized the blaze bug display. It intrigues me that they remain at Moan Calamari. By installing Yamasks at Tungul and Kalula, we have made clear as rainwater our intent to assault Moan Calamari. Sav, Krife, and the rest of the Alliance commanders must be blind not to see what is coming. But obviously I misconstrue them. My purpose was to persuade them to disband their battle groups and thus subvert the possibility of a final battle of this nature, for I suspected that Shemra was pursuing such thinking. And yet the enemy does nothing to suggest that they received our message. Either they have misconstrued me, or they have devised a way to counter us. Even so, War Master, the tactician said, it makes little sense for them to make a stand at Mon Calamari. They are vastly outnumbered and it is unlikely they would wish to visit destruction on the world they have chosen as their new capital. Nas Choka considered it. Yes, I fear that. In the end, they will scatter. The tactician was puzzled. Was that not your original wish, War Master? To have them disband without our having to travel clear across the galaxy to prompt them. Now we are committed. We will arrive. They will disperse and we will be left with no choice but to chase them into the galactic arms and back, because Shimra will not have it otherwise. Such actions will require many years and consume many resources. It is the pattern our ancestors faced time and again in the home galaxy, the seer interjected. Wars that lingered for generations. The tactician regarded the blaze bugs. What if the enemy should surprise us by electing to stand and fight? Nas Choka smiled. I will know then, with certainty, that Krife and the rest have contrived a counter-strategy. The seer was not pleased by that statement. Would the infidels dare strike at Yuzhan Tar in your absence? I have given careful thought to that, Nas Choka said. I have calculated the amount of damage they can do based on their bringing to bear three times the number of ships we know to exist in sectors other than Mon Calamari. I remain confident that they cannot inflict unacceptable damage. I have planned for that eventuality, nevertheless. Should they jump their entire fleet here, so much the better for us. They could interpret the groundwork we've laid as an attempt to encourage them to attack Yuzhan Tar, the tactician said. Nas Choka betrayed no concern. 
Either way benefits us. But we're a long way from seeing all sides of this. We must bide what little time remains before Shimra declares the omens favorable to launch the fleet. The seer deliberately placed herself in the war master's gaze. I have spoken to the other seers regarding the omens. We have agreed to stretch the truth in order to grant your forces additional time to prepare. Shimra will see through you, Nas Choka cautioned, especially in light of the appeal I attempted today. Regardless, he will suffer your lies as an accommodation to me, just as he suffers you and your cohorts as an accommodation to the elite. Refrain from attempting to grant us too much delay. He paused, then said, In the meantime, we should awaken our masked spies and infiltrators on all occupied and contested worlds, and instruct them to report on any unusual activity involving the movements of ships, materiel, and couriers. Crefe will expect as much, the tactician thought to point out. Bear in mind, War Master, that enemy disinformation was at least partially responsible for drawing Tsavong La to his death. Nas Choka touched him on the shoulder in appreciation. Trust nothing from our network of agents on Moon Calamari. They live only because the Alliance feels there may be some further use for them. Also, instruct our masked spies that while they should keep their noses lifted to the winds, they are to refrain from taking any actions or interfering in any way. I want nothing more than information. I will separate the truth from the deceptions. Above all, I want to give the Alliance just enough vine to hang itself. Part 2 Force and Counterforce Chapter 19 Stars filled the sky. Head tipped back, eyes raised, Luke turned through a small circle, feeling infinitesimal under the giant Boris, under the light-strewn expanse. The night was cold, made colder by a polar breeze, but there wasn't a cloud overhead. Beside him, R2-D2 zithered and twittered, then fluted in what approximated relief. Luke looked down at the readout on the droid's dome. You're sure about that, little fella? The silver dome of the droid's head revolved, taking his primary photoreceptor through a second survey of the stars and clusters. After comparing the results of his scans to the charts he had downloaded from Widowmaker's databanks, R2-D2 mule chirped, then twittered some more. Luke smiled and placed his hand on the droid's dome. At least we're closer to known space. I guess we'll just have to wait to see where Seacoat's next hyperspace jump lands us. Rocking side to side on his treads, R2-D2 tootled and fluted. Luke had been one of the first to emerge from the shelter scooped into the notched cliff face that was home to hundreds of Faroan families. Similar to other shelters in the middle distance, it was a vast vaulted space, excavated some time during the crossings that had taken Zonama Seacoat from its original orbit in the Gardaji Rift through several star systems, and finally into the unknown regions, where Seacoat had selected Classa Ephemera as the planet's new home and sanctuary. Following the discussion in the cave, Seacoat had said that it wanted to perform several short trial voyages to assess whether the jump to light speed, inadvertently engineered by Noma Nor, had done lasting damage to the hyperspace cores, and whatever planetary mechanisms Seacoat employed to augment the powerful engines. Of greater concern was the very real possibility of encountering uncharted mass shadows along the route back to known space. Whether ship or planet, any traveler that entered hyperspace without taking a greater or lesser hyperlane risked catastrophe, and no analogues to the Perlemian trade route or the Hidian way existed in the unknown regions. Worse, the entire territory was known to be rife with hyperspace anomalies, particularly along the Corward frontier. Luke and the other Jedi had to trust that Seacoat knew what it was doing. So instead of dwelling on the prospects of being yanked from light speed by a gravity well of some sort, Luke had passed the days in the shelter 
grappling with Seacoast's revelations that the aboriginal Yuzhan Vong had been stripped of the force. Seacoat had refused to elaborate, and since then Seacoat, speaking through Jabitha, had said only that it was imperative that Zonama be returned to known space, despite the grave risks the planet would face during the crossings and on arrival. The revelation, Luke didn't know what else to call it, had had a profound effect on Harar, and on Luke as well. Was it possible, Luke wondered, that the would-be Jedi who had originally settled on Zonama Seacoat hadn't taught Seacoat about the Force, but merely reawakened it? A few steps away from Luke in the Boris-enclosed clearing sat Jade Shadow. Designed for speed and stealth, the craft was sharply tapered forward and painted a uniform, non-reflective gray. The hyperdrive rating was equal to that of the Millennium Falcon, and she had the added ability to be operated remotely by slave circuitry. The aft cabin space alone was large enough to accommodate an X-wing. Even Seacoat was impressed by the ship, and Luke suspected that it was Seacoat that had kept Jade Shadow from being crushed by the several Boris that had toppled during the recent storms, narrowly missing it. However, the ship was buried almost to her triangular cockpit in sand, leaves, and other forest detritus. Did she weather the jump all right? Mara asked. Glow stick in hand, she emerged from the dark shadows of the giant trees and came alongside him to regard Jade's shadow. No visible damage. Mara tossed her hair over her right shoulder and gazed at the circle of brilliant stars overhead. Any idea where we are? According to R2, we might be somewhere in the mid-rim. The droid cheeped. Mara looked at R2-D2. Is that good? It's a start. Luke glanced at the path Mara had taken. Where is everyone? Jason, Corin, and Danny are trying to convince the Pharaohans that it's safe to come out of hiding. The last I saw, Tekli, Saba, and Tahiri, they were with Harar, who keeps finding similarities between Yuzhan Vong Bayots and what he sees here. She approached Jade Shadow, then turned to Luke. Do you think we're close enough to contact Esfandia Station? Only one way to find out. The ship had a cosmetic external hatch release, but the actual release was concealed inside the starboard bulkhead and could be operated by the Force. Mara entered first and called on the illuminators. As filthy as the ship was outside, the interior was undisturbed. Slipping into the forward chairs, she and Luke activated the ship's hollow net and subspace transceivers. At the same time, R2-D2 inserted his slender computer interface arm into an access port and rotated the dial to an appropriate setting. As Fondia Station, this is Jade Shadow. Mara said, repeating the comm call several times. The annunciator's only response was static. At Classa Ephemera, we were even farther from Esfandia, and we still managed to reach the station, Mara said, after continued attempts to contact the station. R2-D2 buzzed in exasperation. He says he can't find any functioning holonet transceivers, Luke said. Try again, Mara urged. She and Luke pondered possible explanations while R2-D2 rotated the interface dial this way and that. Nothing, Luke said, breaking their long silence. Mara's lightly freckled brow furrowed. Could the Yuzhan Vong have destroyed Asfandia? Luke leaned away from the console. Corin said that something big had been planned for Bilbringi. But even if the Alliance failed to retake the shipyards there... That wouldn't account for our not being able to contact any of the Holonet relay stations. Mara shook her head back and forth. Something terrible has happened. She looked at him. Could Cal Umis have given the okay to using Alpha Red? A Yuzhan Vong specific toxin, Alpha Red had been developed in secret by Alliance Intelligence, working in conjunction with Chiss scientists but the only prototype sample of the bioweapon had been stolen by Verger and transformed into something harmless. 
We've been gone long enough for Diff Scour's intelligence bunch to have cooked up a whole new batch, Mara added. Luke shook his head. Kel promised me that Alpha Red would be used only as a last resort. Maybe it's come down to that, and maybe the Yuzhan Vong retaliated with a poison of their own. Kel knows better. Evil can't simply be stamped out. It's as much a part of life as good is. Mara looked at him dubiously. You're thinking like a Jedi instead of an admiral or an elected official. She blew out her breath. All right. What's your solution to ending this war? I don't know yet. I just know that Alpha Red isn't the solution. Mara smiled at him and took his hand. I happen to agree. But you are starting to sound a little like Verger and Jason. Guilty as charged. But is that wrong? Not in principle. Except that you're probably more attuned to the Force than either of them. Luke made his lips a thin line. I feel like I'm still in training for the trials. Every second of every day. It never ends, and I wouldn't have it otherwise. My understanding of the Force continues to grow. I know I'm a Jedi Master, but I may not feel like a true Master until my dying breath. Besides, Jason, Jaina, Tahiri, Ben, they're the future of the Jedi. Everything we do now must be for them, to ensure that they carry on what began a thousand generations ago. Luke took his eyes from Mara and glanced around the cockpit. I know what you're thinking, she said after a moment, and I think it's time we tried. He smiled faintly. If you'd stayed in my thoughts a little longer, you'd know why we can't leave. Mara looked disappointed. You're not going to tell me you're worried about running us into a mass shadow, because our two can plot a safe route, even if it takes us twenty micro-jumps to get back to known space. That isn't it. Luke regarded her again. Mara, I'm as concerned about Ben as you are. Something terrible has happened, but it's momentary. We have to stay focused on the greater picture. Mara rose and paced away from the control console, crossing her arms when she swung back to Luke. The future's exactly what I'm thinking about. Ben's future. You said yourself that everything we do should be for him and the other young Jedi. She sat down again and took her husband's hands in hers. Luke, Ben was almost killed on Coruscant by that witch, Vicky Shesh. If something should happen to us... Luke pictured their red, golden-haired infant. By leaving, we could destroy everything we've accomplished here. And then we won't be a help to anyone, Ben included. Mara studied him. You're basing this on personal experience, on some mistake you once made. I am. Luke, there are times when action is the best course. Actions have consequences. What are the consequences here? Jason and Corin can stay behind. We can leave them Jade Shadow if you want. We'll ask Seacoat to grow us a ship. It's Seacoat I'm worried about. Mara stared at him. Seacoat? Seacoat might misinterpret our leaving as a lack of trust and change its mind about returning to known space. Then you can explain our reason for leaving. Tell Seacoat that we're worried about our son, about our friends, about what's happened to the Holonet. Luke paused, then asked, What about Seacoat's concerns for the Pharaohans? or for what might happen to Zonama when it becomes part of the war. Mara mulled it over for a moment. Luke squeezed her hands affectionately. Ben will be fine. I saw him fine. Mara's eyes narrowed in a reluctant smile. You saw him piloting a ship of completely unfamiliar design, like the ones grown here. Luke recalled the rest of his vision. Ben tracing lines in the sand, kneeling by a river, rubbing smooth round stones between his fingers and smiling, wrestling with a young Wookiee. Luke saw himself holding Ben while they observed glowing lines of traffic move through the sky of an unknown world, like Coruscant, but not. And yes, Ben at the helm of a starship of unique design. Mara was watching him. Assuming you weren't gazing at Ben from some other plane of existence, 
you're going to be around to witness all those things. So will you. Was I part of the vision? In fact, Luke hadn't seen Mara, not at first. Luke, promise me something, Mara said before he could speak. If anything happens to me... He tried to shush her, but she pushed his hand away. No, I need to say this. Promise me that if anything happens, you'll love Ben with all your heart, and you'll make him the center of your world as he is to me. Luke pulled her into his arms. Hush, my love. The night is mild, and slumber smiles on you. Promise me, Luke. I will, if you'll make me the same promise. She nodded against his chest. Then, no matter what, the future's assured. Chapter 20 Nas Choka pushed through the living membrane that sealed the command grotto from prying eyes. A trio of supreme commanders and their subalterns trailed in the War Master's angry wake. Our course is now set, he announced to his own subalterns and tacticians. Supreme Overlord Shimra will abide no further delay. We are enjoined to launch the Armada in three local days when the auguries are favorable for victory. Three days, fearsome one, the tactician said when Nas Choka had dropped cross-legged onto his Yorick coral bench. The burden is mine, Nas Choka replied abruptly. Don't add to it by echoing my words. Tender your report. The tactician inclined his head in a bow of respect. Rumors teem like an infestation of sackworms. From all sectors comes word of heightened enemy activity. Ships masquerading as spice carriers leave hut space, but as often as not they are empty. The same holds true in Bothan space. There is increased traffic within the Hapen cluster, with many ships inbound from Kashiik and from the more distant remnant. Known operatives and agents consort clandestinely on Corellia and Bimisari. Courier ships of the Smugglers' Alliance arrive and depart Kontrum, with a few venturing as close to Yuzhan Tar as Koralag. Sheer impudence, Nas Choka said. But much like the diversionary raids at Gindine and Duro that preceded the clash at Ebak 9. He fell briefly silent, then said, Proceed. As instructed, our agents made no attempts to interfere or provide the slightest signs of suspicion. And at Mon Calamari, almost half the fleet has departed. Many capital ships have returned to their home sectors. Others have been traveling in and out of dark space. Still others have been deployed as substitutes, for the transceiving devices our Dovin Basils engulfed. Nas Choka rose from the bench to regard what now amounted to an entire wall of blaze bug displays. My long tenure in hut space was well spent, he said after a long moment. I was forced to acquaint myself with all make and manner of deception and duplicity. Fabrication comes as easily to the inhabitants of this galaxy as invention comes to our shapers. So I am wary of all these reports. He turned to his supreme commanders. Sav and Crefe grasp that our patrols and reconnaissance vessels are too widely dispersed to keep watch over every planetary sector. They attempt to overwhelm us with activity in the hope of screening a few missions of genuine purpose. His expression grew dour. Our actions in sabotaging the Hollownet may come back to plague us. We no longer have the luxury of being able to eavesdrop on enemy communications. Yes, the courier ships require additional time to reach their destinations, but the messages they carry come and go only to those who need to be apprised of the content. Even now, this war takes unexpected twists and turns. His hooded eyes fell on the tactician. What of the Yamisks at Tungul and Kalula? Unperturbed, fearsome one, although... Nas Choka waited, then said... Give voice to it. Kalula surrender, War Master. Before the fall of the orbital station, the commander who led our assault was contacted by the governor of the planet. The governor promised that Kalula would yield to occupation without need of an amphistaff being raised against it. 
There is nothing unusual about that, the warrior seer interrupted. Many local governments have opted, wisely, I think, to spare themselves devastation. In exchange for a pledge that we will be equitable about how many captives we take, and in how we pursue our timetable for world shaping, including the effacement of buildings, temples, and the obliteration of machines. The custom began as early as our defeat of the library world of Abroa Sky. Yes, seer, but in the instance of Kalula, the governor made a special request. She asked for permission for scientists to visit, to observe some sort of natural spectacle peculiar to the planet. This, of course, would necessitate the temporary maintenance of the spaceport for the landing of ships and scientific personnel. Nas Choka folded his massive arms. Our commander agreed to this. The tactician nodded. In the interest of rapid and effortless pacification, and for the sake of the Yamask, he granted provisional approval. So as not to subject our people to lifeless technology, he assigned security of the spaceport to peace brigaders. Now, however, the petition to allow scientists to visit Kalula rests in the hands of High Prefect Drathul. He, in turn, will defer to the sagacity of High Priest Jakan. For several moments, Nas Choka paced in silence. This interests me, he said finally. Much of the enemy fleet remains at Mon Calamari. Elsewhere ships scurry about in seeming abandon, and following weeks of noble fighting by the defenders of its orbital facility, Kalula surrenders without contest. He let his statements hang in the air, then turned to the tactician. Tell Eminence Jakan that I wish a word with him before he renders any judgment on the petition. The tactician bowed. Anything else, fearsome one? Who commands the Yamask emplacement at Kalula? I can provide the answer momentarily, Warmaster. Nas Choka paced to his bench. Return not only with the name, but also with the commander's dedicated villip. I need speak with him as well. The Yuzhan Vong warrior at Kalula Spaceport made it clear that he was ready to unleash his amphistaff at the slightest provocation. The sight of the tattooed and scarred warrior standing against a backdrop of shuttles and landing craft was just absurd enough to widen Han's eyes, but he knew better than to smile. Several Yuzhan Vong warships were in orbit above Kalula, though not nearly as many as Han had expected to see. You are the scientist, Melok, the warrior said in basic to the female Hodin on whom the entire infiltration mission rested. More than two meters tall, with sucker-equipped four-fingered hands, a purple crown of erect thermographic receptors, and a reptilian-complected lipless face, she might almost have been a Yuzhan Vong shaper. Indeed, among all the species of the galaxy, the bipedal Hodin were treated with particular favor by the invaders, not only because of their devotion to plant life, but also because of their aversion to technology. Yes, I am Melok, she answered in Yuzhan Vong. The warrior extended a sinewy hand. Your authentication. Melok displayed the fist-sized nugget of flesh and fur that had been delivered to her on a broa sky. The warrior took the creature between his hands, squeezed it, and studied the pungent droppings it left on a piece of leathery parchment. Then he nodded and motioned to Han, Leia, Kip, Judder Page, and the Bothan intelligence officer, Raw. The members of my support team, Melok said. Their names should also be contained by the Lumpen. Having lived among the Yuzhan Vong for close to four years on the enemy-occupied library world, she knew how to deal with them as well as speak to them. The warrior squeezed the lumpen so hard it squealed, and another batch of droppings fell to the parchment. It took a moment for the warrior to confirm that the names and descriptions detailed in the droppings matched the counterfeit identities of the humans and humanoids in front of him, but ultimately he nodded again. The Lumpen will remain here until your departure. If all of you have not returned in three days, you will be hunted down, imprisoned, and punished for your insolence. Do you understand? Yes, 
Melok answered for all of them. Then proceed inside. A surprise to everyone, and some cause for suspicion. Yuzhan Tar had granted permission for a few select scientists to visit Kalula, to observe what was called the Nocturne of the Winged Stars, an allegedly extraordinary natural phenomenon that occurred once every three hundred standard years. As Han understood it, the local governor had cut the deal in secret, even while the orbital station was still under siege. At the mission briefing on Mon Calamari only two days earlier, Han had voiced his misgivings, telling Diff Scour that the last time he had checked, the Yuzhan Vong weren't in the public relations business. The cadaverously thin intelligence director, who had had a hand in organizing the mission to destroy Kalula's Yamisk, had offered other examples of the Yuzhan Vong's recent attempts to win the hearts and minds of defeated populations, as against their usual tactic of plucking them out at the first sign of resistance. Regarding Kalula, Scour believed that the nature of the negotiation, centered as it was on the observance of a rare natural phenomenon, might have appealed to whatever priests had been tasked with ruling on the request. Not that it mattered. If the Yuzhan Vong had refused consent, the execution team would have gone in regardless. The last-minute addition of Kip Doran to the team had been cause for further concern, because Yamisks were believed to have the ability to sense Jedi, as had happened aboard an enemy vessel to the late Worth Skidder. Kip had countered that being a Jedi had nothing to do with it. Yamisks could detect the Force, and Kip maintained that Leia was as strong in the Force as he was. Han was not at all eased by the explanation. A Bothan and a Jedi, he told Kip. We might as well be wearing Galactic Alliance insignias. On the other hand, having Kip along on the mission made it something of a family affair since Kip had figured prominently in Han's life for close to twenty years, ever since Han and Chewbacca had rescued the sixteen-year-old fledgling Jedi from imprisonment in the spice mines of Kessel. Han's trust in Kip had been tested by the many trials Kip had himself endured, on Yavin against the spirit of a long-dead Sith Lord, in Kip's feverish quest for vengeance against Imperial Admiral Dela in bringing the Sun Crusher to bear on the planet Corita, and in nearly destroying the Millennium Falcon and Han in the process. More recently, Kip had tricked Jaina into helping him annihilate a civilian Yuzhan Vong world ship at Cernpedal, and yet, following the events at Mirkur, he had been instrumental in keeping her from going to the dark side, thanks in part to Leia's warning Kip that if he ever again hurt Jaina or any member of Leia's family, he would be safer turning himself over to the Yuzhan Vong. I'm through with travel if it means carrying a lumpen instead of an identichip, Ra said to Han while they were entering the spaceport terminal. We're here to make sure you don't have to, Han said. We've got enough unhappy Bothans without adding you to the list. Ra laughed hoarsely. As good with his mouth as he is with his blaster. That's what I've always heard about you. I ain't true, if that's what you mean. Han had more to say, but Leia touched his arm in a gesture of restraint. From the start, he and the long-faced Bothan spy had butted heads, but he appreciated Leia's reminding him of mission priorities. Where Yuzhan Vong warriors and bishop hounds held sway over the landing field, peace brigaders... Nikto, Weequays, a couple of Gamorians, and other alien traders, oversaw luggage inspection and terminal security. The modular prefabricated building had been stripped of technology, but it hadn't yet been transformed by the Yuzhan Vong. Three other teams of scientists were having their equipment inspected and being subjected to constant harassment by bribe-seeking brigaders. Flanking the building's only exit were a pair of exceedingly tall humans, or more likely Uglith Masker wearing Yuzhan Vong. Team Malok's equipment was being pawed through by a Klatuinian and a Kodru G, whose forearms were buried to the elbows in Han's backpack. The Yuzhan Vong had prohibited the import or use of recording devices other than sketch pads and writing implements 
but they had allowed tents and camping gear since the expeditions were destined for the rugged mountains that walled Kalula City on three sides. As rudimentary as they were, the brigaders' scanners were capable of detecting most weapons. So blasters had been left off the packing list. Leia's and Kip's lightsabers, however, were included among the cooking supplies, disguised as handles for self-warming fry pans. The Klaatuanian put the field kitchen duffel on the inspection table. I'm going to need to go through all of this, he said as the lofty Maloke approached, a sheath-like skirt making her appear even taller than she was. Kip stepped up to the table and made a subtle hand motion. You don't need to inspect this bag. The canine-faced humanoid stared at the Jedi and blinked his heavy-lidded eyes. We don't need to inspect this bag. Momentarily confused, the Code Rude G eventually nodded in agreement. Gather your belongings and leave. Gather your belongings and leave. Kip caught Han's look while the two of them were shouldering the duffels. Problem? I thought that wasn't allowed or something. Kip shrugged. We can debate Jedi philosophy some other time. Han laughed through his nose. Don't get me wrong, kid. If I had the ability, I'd be using it every chance I could. You only think you would, Leia said, slipping into her backpack as she caught up with him. Would you use it when you place a back? Han considered it. Might take some of the fun out of the game. And I know you wouldn't want that, she said. No sooner had they exited the terminal than clouds of indigenous flit gnats surrounded them. The insects weren't the biting variety, but that didn't make them any less irritating. Hope you remembered to pack the repellent, Han said to Leia. Wouldn't help, Raw rasped. Every visitor to Kalula gets assigned one hundred flit gnats, and those hundreds stick with you for your entire stay. Han laughed shortly at the Bothan's joke. Well, everybody's got their own idea about what makes a good vacation. What Han didn't say was that the tiny pests were already sticking to the cosmetic that lightened his complexion and the adhesive that secured his gray beard, mustache, and woolly eyebrows, and that he was even more uncomfortable than he had been on Afran 4 two years earlier, where he had worn a similar getup. Leia was the only other one also in disguise, her hair concealed under a wig of closely cropped silver locks, and her skin a faint shade of green, thanks to some pill intelligence had had her swallow. Even though he was a Jedi, Kip's keen face wasn't well known, and Paige was so nondescript that a moment after meeting him one practically forgot what he looked like. Still, for all his discomfort, Han was happy not to be wearing one of the Uglith masker-like brands, developed by Wraith Squadron's Baljas Arnjak, and being worn by all the team members assigned to killing the Yamas Gan Tungle, which was guarded only by Yuzhan Vong. Apart from the off-the-rack spaceport terminal, Kalula was about as basic a world as Han had visited in a long while, a world where the stones that formed the walls of most buildings had been given shape by other stones, and where most of the human and humanoid population had more in common with the Yuzhan Vong than they probably realized. It took him a moment to come to grips with the fact that on Kalula, and hundreds of similarly primitive worlds, life simply went on. Even though deprived of technology, even though forced to live in the shadow of new temples, beings fell in love, got married, had children, got into squabbles with their neighbors. They learned to adapt to new foods, use Yuzhan Vong tools, swore allegiance to the new conquerors, even while continuing to worship their own gods in secret. Here come our guides, Paige said. A Rodian and a Rin, they were wearing rustic trousers and shirts, beat-up footwear, fabric belts, and tight-fitting woven skull caps. And clearly they were comfortable around the saddled mounts they rode and led. The size of small dewbacks, the long-snouted quadrupeds, were nearly as shaggy as banthas, but lacked horns or tusks of any sort. I'm Sasso, the Rodian said, as the pair came within earshot of Han and the others. Furfur, the Rin said under his breath, adding, Gatherer 164, 
out of Balmora. Han reached up to shake hands with the Wren. How's your boss? On the run, Furfur said. Han nodded, thinking of Droma, the Wren who had befriended him at Chewbacca's death and who was rumored to head the gatherers. That figures. As introductions were being made all around, Han found himself thinking that Sasso and Furfur reminded him of many of the folk he had had dealings with during his early years in the corporate sector. On Darun, Deltuin, and other worlds. Folks who were often hardened by circumstance, but true to their word. Lately, when he wasn't thinking about the war or dwelling on the deaths of Anakin and Chewbacca, he would often catch himself reminiscing about the old days, or wondering what it would be like to return to the worlds of his youth without his tall, thick-furred sidekick, but with Leia and the kids. The person who had scammed his way through half the outer rim was very much alive inside him, and for all the lavish parties on Coruscant, the diplomatic affairs, state dinners, and royal weddings he'd been obliged to attend during the past twenty-some years, he was still more comfortable around beings like Sasso and Furfur than he was around senators and princes, the wealthy and influential. Weather-beaten faces and hands calloused from hard work, the great outdoors instead of some refresher, food dug from the soil or yanked from the trees instead of factory-produced foodstuffs. Maybe someday he and Leia would get the chance, he told himself. Sasso pointed him to his mount, which was known locally as a timbu. Han planted his foot in the stirrup and pulled himself onto the immense saddle. The timbu grunted and turned his big floppy-eared head to regard Han through a liquid black eye. Whatever you do, don't jerk the reins too hard, he told Leia as she nimbly mounted a smaller timbu. Why, what happens? Think about the worst gob of spittle you ever saw a tauntaun launch, then multiply that times ten. Scary. You've ridden a timbu before, Sasso stated rather than asked. Han nodded. On Bonadin. The Rodian's tapered snout wiggled in a kind of smile. Terrific place. Team Malok moved out. Four member bands of Yuzhan Vong patrolled Kalula City's mostly unpaved streets, but the alleged scientists were allowed to pass without incident. On a lush common, Two priests were overseeing a mixed group of locals and Yuzhan Vong workers who were erecting a temple to Yun Yuzhan. Street and storefront electric lights had been ripped from their supporters, and there wasn't a droid or a speeder to be seen. Welcome to the new galaxy, Kip said. No slave coral, Leia said quietly. Sasso nodded. That was one of the conditions of the surrender. How'd everyone feel about the surrender? Page asked carefully. Let me put it this way, the Rodian said. The governor no longer appears in public, and she's had the walls of her compound reinforced. Han noticed that Page appeared to be right at home. He rode his timbu with practiced ease, and he knew which way to direct the beast even before the guide said anything. It was as if he had already memorized the layout of the streets and the topography of the planet. Han guessed that Page would be able to converse in Kalulin if necessary, eat the food and drink the water without getting ill, catch the eye of the local women, make do as if he had been born and raised there. Raw, in contrast, was clearly out of his element. The bristly-bearded Bothan had a habit of looking at everyone with what seemed like bemusement or mild derision, but his head fur betrayed none of the changes that were a characteristic of his species. But Han had encountered the style before in individuals who had built their lives around inveigling secrets from others, and then seeing to it that those secrets reached the proper ears. How far to the Yamask? Kip asked Sasso. The installation is practically the new city center, probably to discourage attempts at orbital bombardment but our safest approach is from the south, which means crossing two ranges of hills to get there. The weapons are cached along our route, Page said. There are weapons buried everywhere, Sasso told him. 
As soon as it became obvious that the Vong were interested in occupying Kalula, we began hiding as much as we could. Blasters, foods, droids, you name it. You can't dig a hole in the hills without uncovering one supply dump or another. By the time Kalula Station fell and the Vong were coming down the gravity well, we were already living like homesteaders. Surely the Yuzhan Vong are aware of your actions, Malok said. They are, but so far they haven't done much investigating. A few caches of arms and droids were discovered, and twenty Kalulans were sacrificed. But aside from that incident, things have been relatively quiet. Sasso nodded his snout to indicate a change in direction. We go this way. How soon before we'll begin to see winged star shells? Malok asked. As soon as we gain some elevation. Sasso brought the train of eight Timbus to a halt at the foot of a steep uphill track that disappeared into a thickly forested ravine. A winged creature passed soundlessly overhead, disappearing into the trees, before Han could get a good look at it. Yuzhan Vong Bayot, Furfur said nervously. We're being watched. Chapter 21 Mirroring the sweeping curve of the planetary ring, the war vessels of the Armada were spread above bright-side Yuzhan Tar like fine grains of crystalline sand. Arrayed in battle groups and reprovisioned flotillas, each cruiser, carrier, and tender analog had been branded with domain emblems and daubed with blood preserved from the sacrifice of the Alliance captives. Some of the vessels flew battle standards earned over countless generations. Others were necklaced hundreds strong with coral skippers. Behind the mica transparencies of observation blisters and resupply balconies, commanders and subalterns crouched on one knee, their heads lowered in obeisance, and their right fists pressed to the York coral decks. There lazed Realm of Death, Blade of Sacrifice, River of Blood, Slayer's Conceit, Serpent's Kiss, and the pennant vessel, Yamka's Mount, commanded by Warmaster Nas Choka. Close to orbitally altered Yuzhan Tar, closer to the massive Dovin Basils that were the planet's first line of defense, closer to the Rainbow Bridge, symbolic of Yun Yuzhan's traffic with the species he had created, floated the oblate yacht that had carried Shimra and the non-warrior elite from the surface. Smeared with blood, the throne chamber of the yacht was also festooned with wreaths of thorn vine and adorned with hundreds of delicately wrought fans, sacred to Yun Yamka. In honor of the launching, all present in the chamber wore glistaweb armor, including Shimra's prefects and seers, Kila Quad and her chief shapers, High Priest Jakan, even preposterous Onimi. The Supreme Overlord stood tall and self-possessed before a unique villip that forwarded his visage and words to every villip contained in every vessel, dedicated or choir member, warship or choral skipper. Yun Yuzhan, great maker, Shimra murmured. We beseech your blessing for these vessels we dispatch into the void, for their mission is yours also by injunction. With this final battle, we fulfill our obligation to cleanse the realm you saw fit to provide us, to make it worthy, and in turn to be made worthy by victory of claiming it as our home. From this moment forward, we will set ourselves to the task of taking these humbled species under our wing and of instructing them in the truth you bade our ancestors here at the dawn of time. We pledge that from these beginnings we will carry our task through to completion, purging this realm of machines and replacing them with our biological partners. When Yuzhan Tar has been fully reshaped according to the ancestral architecture, and when temples to you and your sacrosanct domain crown the tops of the highest mountains and dominate the principal population centers of every occupied world, we will petition that you judge our work one final time. The grand moment has arrived. 
the culmination of generations of voyage and discovery. Even now, in these unfamiliar skies, the ancestral galaxy moves into beneficent aspect with this newfound home. What was distant is near at hand. What was completed is begun anew. In a blinding display of honor and power, the largest of the war vessels launched 5,000 plasma missiles toward Yuzhan Tar's primary. Then in groups, and led by Yamka's mount, the armada began to move out, building momentum for the transition to dark space. Nom Anor watched from his assigned place in the holy yacht, wondering what Nas Choka might be thinking. The outcome of the war and the future of the Yuzhan Vong hinged on what would occur over the next quarter clacket. The warriors and priests, lifted to ecstasy by days of fasting and dancing, were sanguine that the armada would prevail. But not everyone was so assured. The consuls under Nomanor's command, and the executors under their commands, had brought to his attention rumors of grave apprehension and doubt among the high caste. And beneath those vague rumblings, Nomanor could feel the more sinister roiling of hatred among the dispossessed. From beneath the bridge, from the dark underworld of Yuzhan Tar, he could hear the clamor of angry voices, the words of the heretics growing louder and more forceful, venomous in the aftermath of the executions, the descent spreading through the ranks, among not only the shamed ones, but also others who had lost or were beginning to lose the faith in Supreme Overlord Shimra. A vast wave, building and building, threatening to break against the Yuzhan Vong's every shore to wipe the armada from the sky, and to pull into the depths the holy yacht and everyone aboard. Shimra had told Nomanor that his war was with the gods, but Shimra had overlooked the real enemy, the enemy that surrounded him and on whose shoulders he stood. Even Coriel in his final days had not been the object of such suspicion and loathing. If it were left to the shamed ones, Nas Choka's mighty force would be routed at Mon Calamari, and Shemra would be dragged from the throne by Yun Shuno himself, to be devoured in public by packs of starved bishop hounds. Nomanor shifted his troubled gaze from the departing ships, and at the same moment Onimi shifted his to needle Nomanor with a meddlesome look. Nom Anor wondered if Onimi's olfactory sense was so keen that he could smell the fear coming off him. Perhaps that was just one of the reasons why Onimi's rhymes were so biting, because he could read subtle signals in all those who appeared before Shemra. Nom Anor stiffened in disgust and something close to dread as Onimi wobbled over to him from across the throne chamber. Be encouraged, Prefect, Onimi said in confidence. As is true between the gods and the Yuzhan Vong, Shimra's strength flows from the combined certitude of his subjects. Falter, display doubt or weakness, and the careful balance may tip. Nom Anor sneered. Who are you to address me, shamed one? Onimi's uneven mouth twisted into a frigid smile. Your conscience, Prefect the still small voice that reminds you how tenuous your position is. Still wearing her silver-locked wig, Leia was deflating Hans and her sleeping pad when she saw Sasso drop something by the smoldering campfire. A leathery creature about the size of a shock ball, it looked like a villop with wings, and this one had been pierced by a wooden quarrel fired from the Rodian's crude bowcaster-like weapon. That's one that won't be able to report on us, Sasso said, examining his fresh kill with the thoroughness of a born hunter. Leia went over to the fire to have a closer look at the dead creature. The biote we saw yesterday? Maybe not the same one, but from the same flock. Sasso's green snout twitched. Got it on the first try. That's never happened before. Leia regarded him questioningly. I hope you're not thinking of cooking it. I am curious, but no. I'm trying to decide whether to burn it or bury it. I vote for burning it, Hans said from behind them. Otherwise the bishops might be able to sniff it out. 
Kalula's sun had been up for an hour, but the ravine's forest of cane trees was still waking up. Birds were abundant, and the flitnats, Leia's personal flitnats, had returned. Thanks to the netting supplied with the bedrolls, she and Han had slept flitnat free and wonderfully, waking frequently, if briefly, to watch for shooting stars or listen to the calls of nocturnal creatures. Han had prepared breakfast over the fire while she and Ra had broken camp. It was an elemental life, but one she thought she could get used to. Under cover of darkness, Sasso and the Rin Furfer had sneaked off to a nearby supply cache and returned by first light with the bowcaster and a couple of weapons old enough to have been carried by Leia's adoptive father's bodyguards, including a thick-barreled blaster with a large hardwood hand grip, another with a finger-contoured grip and built-in scope, two black military-grade hand weapons with trigger guards and top-mounted heat radiators, and a rifle Han identified as a DC-15 with a folding stock. The blasters were now stashed in the duffels, but not so deeply they couldn't be retrieved in a hurry. Malok and the mustachioed furfur returned to camp just as Han and Ra were about to secure the gear bags to the timbus. The docile animals were foraging for food in the tall grass. The stately Hodin female looked disappointed. Couldn't find any winged star shells, Han said. She shook her head. We found hundreds, but all of them were inactive. At least some should have opened by now. The weather has been off, Sasso said. Hotter than usual for this time of year. Malok considered it. I suppose that could account for it. By firelight the previous evening, she had given everyone a biology lesson on the nocturne of the winged stars. Similar in appearance to the drone flitters found on countless worlds, winged stars emerged from chitinous shells. Unique among flitters, however, Kalulas had but one day to perform their mating dances, display their celebrated luminosity, mate, and lay eggs, which would hatch 299 years later. The larval stage lasted less than a local week, at the end of which the surviving larvae would be encased in durable cocoons. Those newly emerged wing stars that weren't immediately devoured by flying lizards and other predators would die of natural causes by the time the sun set on the day of their emergence. Correct me if I'm wrong, Malok, Ross said, but unless you're aging more gracefully than a Wookiee, you've never actually observed a nocturne. That's true, she told him. But on Moltak, we have been able to simulate the life cycle in controlled settings. Maybe the Yuzhan Vong have something to do with the casings not opening on schedule, Han suggested. They might have introduced some organism that's affected the ecology. Look what they did on Tenna and Duro. I find that very improbable, Malok said. Those worlds were altered for strategic and logistical reasons. Where a world like Kalula must please the Yuzhan Vong to no end. For all the barbarity they've demonstrated, they have a reverence for life. Raw snorted. You sound like a sympathizer, Professor. Raw, Leia said sharply, but Malok only waved her sucker-equipped hand in dismissal. What other attitude can be expected from a member of a species that has declared its intent to exterminate the Yuzhan Vong? Malok was referring to the Bothan doctrine of our cry or total war. Raw laughed. I was only joking. His head fur betrayed nothing. Leia waited until Malok and Furfur had left to search for additional shells before she went over to Raw. I don't think Malok appreciates her sense of humor. Raw shrugged. What can I say? We're worlds apart. Then your cynicism doesn't stem from your commitment to an amoral, unprofitable career? Amoral, maybe but certainly not unprofitable. In terms of credits, you mean. What other terms are there? Leia glanced at Han, who merely spread his hands. Go ahead and poke him if you want to. I won't try to stop you. Just then, Paige and Kip returned to camp. Paige looked from Han to Leia to Raw, then back to Han. We interrupting something? Just a little campfire sing-along, Han said. 
Page didn't ask for an explanation. We found signs of a Yuzhan Vong patrol, tracker beasts, and a couple of those twelve-legged mounts. Bishops and Quenix, Sasso said, getting to his feet. We'd better get moving. The sooner we cross the next ridge, the better. Everyone pitched in to load the remaining gear. With Furfur riding point, they climbed to the crest of the ridge, then began a slow, switchback descent through dense forest. Sasso, Page, and Kip rode ahead to scout the trail. Halfway to the valley floor, Han spurred his timbu to come abreast of Raws. I figure you spend a lot of your time hanging around with low-life characters, Han said. But everyone here is on the same side. Understand? You're one to talk about consorting with low-life characters solo. Han forced a smile. I got over it, pal, so maybe you should look to me as an example. The Bothan nodded. I'll give it thought. Han fell back to ride alongside Leia. Why do you even bother? she asked. Well, either I'm going to change his mind, or I'm going to change his face. You still won't be rearranging the person inside. Maybe not, but I'll feel a whole lot better. Leia heard rapid hoofbeats up ahead, and a moment later Kip rode up. Yuzhan Vong, they're climbing out the valley. He pointed down through the trees. Just there, at that stand of broadleafs. Is there a way to avoid them? Leia asked. No, and we can't afford to fight them here. Han rose up on his stirrups and motioned to an outcropping of rocks below the next switchback. Looks like a decent ambush point. Kip nodded. That's my thinking, too. They hastened through the switchback and into a gulch where Sasso and Page were waiting. Furfur led the mounts away, and everyone else scrambled to take up firing positions in the boulders on both sides of the trail. Han, Leia, Page, and Malok on one side, Raw, Sasso, and Kip on the other. Han sighted down the barrel of the military blaster. Page did the same with the DC-15 rifle. Melok wrapped her huge hand around the wooden grip of the antique sidearm. Leia took hold of her lightsaber, but didn't activate it. Shortly they heard the patrol approaching. First to appear were a trio of bishop hounds. Low-bodied creatures, they moved in a waddling motion, their long snouts sniffing the air and ground, and their clawed feet leaving distinctive tracks in the dirt. Behind them walked three Yuzhan Vong warriors, armed with amphistaffs and bandoliers of thud and razor bugs. Two were sporting shoulder-mounted tactical villops. Behind them came three warriors on riding beasts, as large as Gretchena, but as sedate as Rontos. I'll take the tracker on the right, Page whispered to Han. You take the one in the middle. Go for the Velops first. Page waved a signal across the canyon to where Kip and the others were concealed. Then everyone hunkered down to wait for the patrol to move into the crossfire. The bishops lifted their snouts toward the boulders just as the first blaster bolts were raining down on them. Hans and Page's shots blew the two small villops to pieces, while sizzling red bolts from across the ravine knocked two warriors from their mounts. But even though taken by surprise, the Yuzhan Vong were quick to counterattack. Razor and thud bugs swarmed into the air, and, rearing and snarling, the three bishops surged up into the rocks. By then, Han, Page, Leia, and Malok were already in motion, firing on the run and scampering for new positions. A bolt from Han's heavy blaster shattered the skull of a charging bishop. A second bolt caught one of the trackers squarely in the chest, blowing a smoking hole in the warrior's Von Doon crab armor, and sending him flying backward, to be trampled underfoot by a confused Quenic. Running down the opposite outcropping, Raw came within a meter of being bishop fodder, but a well-placed shot from Sasso dropped the beast before it could snap at the Bothan a second time. Kip front-flipped down onto the trail ahead of the patrol. Lightsaber ignited, he fought his way through a hail of razor bugs to take the fight to the remaining warriors. Han was astonished to see the Jedi's blade neatly cleave a rigid amphistaff, then, on the reverse stroke, sever the head of the warrior himself. Still in the rocks, Leia was similarly engaged in fending off a stream of frenzied bugs. Milok was cowering below her, afraid to show her head. Pulling the frightened hood into her feet, Leia led her to a safer position. 
whirling twice to send return flights of bugs smashing into the rocks. Han emerged from the boulders to see Kip kick a koofy out of the hand of the only Yuzhan Vong left standing, then pierced the warrior through the neck as he was running for his mount, as if in an attempt to flee. A blur of motion caught Han's attention to the left, and he swung around, flattening himself to the ground. The last of the three bishops hurtled him and bounded up into the rocks, close to where Malok was crouched, staring distractedly at her heavy-gripped blaster. Unable to get a clear shot at the retreating beast, Paige shouted to Malok, Kill the hound! She glanced at the escaping bishop, then in bewilderment at Raw. It's just an animal. Kill it! Paige repeated. I... Bolts from Raw's weapon stopped the bishop dead, just short of its disappearing over the rim of the gulch. Butchers, the Hodin said as sudden quiet descended. She staggered out of the rocks and down onto the trail to join Leia and the others. Butchers. Bishops are trained to return to base, Paige said calmly. Another patrol would have picked up our trail in no time flat. Malok heard him out, then nodded dully. Six Yuzhan Vong, two lizard hounds, and one Quenic lay sprawled in the dirt. Page moved from warrior to warrior, making certain that each was dead. He put the convulsing Quenic out of its misery with a single bolt, then did the same to three amphistaffs. Han squatted down beside the warrior he had shot in the chest, then regarded the thirty-year-old weapon that had supplied the lethal bolt. I never knew these old blasters packed such a wallop. They don't, Kip said from where he was crouched near another warrior. He wrapped his knuckles against the breastplate of the Yuzhan Vong's living armor. Inferior armor, inferior weaponry, inferior troops. He glanced around. Even the bishops were slow. Leia glanced at Sasso in sudden uncertainty. Another side effect of the heat wave? The Rodian shook his head in perplexity. Let me get this straight, Ra said. You're disappointed because we won too easily? He snorted a laugh. I'm beginning to wonder if all of you aren't sympathizers. He's right, Page said. We can use every bit of luck we get. I've played enough sabak to know luck when I see it, Han said, and this wasn't it. He scanned the boulders and nearby trees. They could be luring us into a trap. Kip glanced at him. Something else is going on here, he said. Chapter 22 Rimward of the Tyan hegemony, Jaina watched the Yuzhan Vong armada revert from hyperspace once again. One moment it appeared that ten thousand stars had been eclipsed, the next that that part of the galaxy had gained a new star cluster. Cappy shrilled and squeaked, underscoring its obvious distress by spotting the cockpit's display screen with countless glowing bezels. In the same instant, two cinder black A-wings that had been Jaina's starboard companions for the past hour fell away in stealth and made the jump to light speed. Despite the glowing threat assessment screen and her previous sightings of the Armada, Jaina was staggered by the sheer number of ships the Yuzhan Vong had amassed. Close-ups of the vessels provided by the starfighters' long-range scanners showed their pitted hulls to be marked and etched with cryptic symbols and blackened with what looked like war paint, but was probably blood. Many displayed slender tendrils of Yorick coral from which flew sail-like battle standards. Evidenced by melt circles and areas of carbon scoring, some of the ships were clearly veterans of earlier campaigns, uprooted from occupied systems throughout the invasion corridor. Others looked newly commissioned, newly grown, including an enormous rose-colored oval that had to be the flagship. The fact that the Yuzhan Vong had essentially entrusted hundreds of conquered worlds to the protection of patrol craft and ground troops meant not only that they were willing to risk everything they had gained on one conclusive battle, but also that their intent was nothing less than the obliteration of the Alliance fleets. Cappy sent another transmission to the cockpit, and Jaina clutched the control yoke in pulse-quickening anticipation. 
a pyrotechnic display of globular explosions began to fire brighten the leading edge of the mobile cluster of ships, and a dozen bezels disappeared from the display screen. Again the Yuzhan Vong had moved headlong into an expansive arc of smart minds that had been sown at the jump point. But as had occurred at the Perlemian transit point, the explosions began to taper off almost immediately, until there were only isolated bursts, and many of the undetonated mines disappeared, vacuumed into immense singularities created by Dovin basils. Jaina pressed her chin to the helmet's microphone stud. Hormia Controller, this is Twin Suns One. The beast has arrived and opened the packages we left. Did the packages come as a surprise? Not for long enough to give the beast any pause. What is the status of your companions? Heralds are away. Can you corroborate the beast's current vector? Jaina keyed a short request to the R2B3 droid, which replied with tones and buzzes that became text on the display screen. Bearing toward jump coordinates for Mon Calamari. Copy that, Twin Sons One. You are green to depart and reposition to Mon Calamari Extreme. Rendezvous at Iceberg 3 with Vanguard, Scimitar, and Rogue Squadrons. Jaina signed off the command net and switched over to the tactical frequency. All pilots, this is Twin Sun's leader. Instruct your droids to set coordinates for Moan Cal Extreme. Jump to light speed at my zero count. Ten, nine, eight, seven. Jaina sat back in her chair and waited for the X-Wing's Incom hyperdrive to engage. The jump would be Twin Sun's third and final since they had first observed the Armada emerge from hyperspace. All major staging points between the Perlemian, Trade Route, and Moon Calamari had been strewn with mines months earlier, primarily to discourage enemy forays. The Alliance Command hadn't expected an Armada to use the transit jump points, and now every fleet strategist was pondering why the Yuzhan Vong hadn't jumped directly from the trade route to the Mon Calamari system. Had the enemy committed another tactical blunder, or were they merely testing the waters? Perhaps they suspected that the Alliance had positioned forces at jump points convenient to Mon Calamari in the hope of outflanking the Armada once the battle commenced. At each transit point, Jaina had sent updates to a frigate stationed at Quormia, which was serving as a hyperspace transceiver. The frigate relayed the intelligence to the MCCC fleet annex, but a redundant system was also in place in the form of courier ships, some of which had jumped to Quormia and others to Mon Calamari. By now, other couriers were certainly alerting the battle groups designated for Tungul and Kalula, where withdrawing elements from the Armada would be prevented from jumping to the aid of soon-to-be-embattled Coruscant. The transit to Mount Calamari would also be the longest of the three. So Jaina took advantage of the lull to center herself in the force. She thought briefly of her parents, executing a mission on Kalula, and of Jason, wherever he was. But she didn't attempt to reach out to any of them. Everyone had their separate duties to perform, and she knew instinctively that the scattered members of her family were thinking of her just as she was them. Nor were there any Jedi among twin sons for her to touch through the Force. With Kip on Kalula as well, Octa Ramus had been assigned to lead the dozen, and both Lobaka and Alima Rar were commanding their own squadrons. Madurin, Streen, and some of the other Jedi were stationed on those capital ships that were essential to defending Mon Calamari itself against the enemy onslaught. Having set her inner chrono to rouse her before the X-Wing reverted from hyperspace, she returned to full awareness just seconds before Cappy signaled her with a ready tone. She took a calming breath and waited for the stars to reappear. Mon Calamari Extreme was just that, the far reaches of the star system where the Armada would likely decant. Iceberg 3 was the code for the penultimate of the system's eight satellites, a misshapen chunk of frozen waste, in fact, a captured comet, destined at some point in time to collide with the outermost planet. Silhouetted against the small white spheroid were dozens of Alliance cruisers, destroyers, and carriers, along with hundreds of starfighters. 
It struck Jaina that nearly every vessel that had been in production for the past forty standard years was represented in one form or another. From Randilli Star Drive dreadnoughts to Rejuvenator class Star Destroyers. And the gathered ships constituted only the outer circle of defense. Despite the fortifying exercises she had taken herself through during the hyperspace flight, Jaina realized that her heart was pounding and her hands were trembling. This is actually going to happen, she told herself with a stubborn measure of disbelief. The end of the war and the fate of the galaxy might well be decided over the course of the next few days. Welcome back, Twin Suns leader, a recognizable voice said into her helmet earphones. Thanks, Wedge, she said. I feel like I've been away for a week. Terrific work, Jaina. Your rally point is Iceberg 3 at 479 Ecliptic. You're to stand by until the seating's concluded. Copy Alliance Control, standing by. Instructing twin sons to form up on her, Jaina led the squadron to its assigned coordinates at fixed orbit over the frozen spheroid in the company of a wing of star fighters made up of Rogue, Vanguard, Scimitar, Black Moon, and Tsar Sabatine's Wild Knights. Hey, Sticks, another familiar voice said. Jaina opened a channel to Gavin Darklighter. How long have you been sitting here, Rogue One? Too long. Was intelligence correct about the number of Vong ships? I think they underestimated. Before Gavin could respond, Wedge broke in. Group and squadron leaders, the beast is at the gate. I know you're all eager to welcome it, but you're going to have to wait your turns. The calm fell eerily silent, then erupted in chatter as the Yuzhan Vong war vessels began to emerge. Cones and polygons, faceted and smooth, bone white to reddish black, craggy with plasma launchers or strung with coral skippers. More rapidly and in increasing numbers they came, filling local space and eventually blotting out Moan Calamari's distant sun. Just when it seemed that the last of them had reverted, still more appeared. Somewhat removed from Alliance forces, and almost as if performing for an audience, the vessels began to tighten up, maneuvering into positions that ultimately created an oblate mass of Yamask carriers and destroyer and cruiser analogs. From that mass, emerging from berthing cavities in the largest ships or dropping from anchorage on Yorick coral branches, streamed hundreds of picket ship analogs and coral skippers deploying to forge the multitude of short and long tendrils that were meant to simulate the tentacles of a yamisk. To Jaina, the final arrangement more closely resembled a flaring star, or perhaps the spiral arm galaxy the Yuzhan Vong were determined to overwhelm. But whatever the armada's form, beast was the description that fit it best. Then the immense organism was on the move, tentacles elongating from the hub as the cluster advanced on Mon Calamari, acutely aware of the reception party that awaited it, but resolute in its purpose. All group and squadron leaders, a male voice announced over the battle net, seed ships have arrived. Alliance Command might have borrowed the term from the Yuzhan Vong, but the reference was not to the vessels that initiated the process of world shaping. It was to the several dozen unarmed and remotely piloted freighters that gushed from behind Iceberg 3 and launched straight for the Armada. Plasma missiles assaulted the bulky container ships from all quarters, though armor plating kept most of them intact until they were within the embrace of the longer tentacles. There they surrendered their payloads of thousands of probe droids. With wide-domed heads and dangling mechanical legs, the probots were marine in appearance, and indeed they spread out like a school of deep-sea creatures riding the currents of a rising tide. Normally the Yuzhan Vong wouldn't have wasted firepower on droids, but each probot had been programmed to mimic the propulsion signatures of Alliance starfighters, so the coral skippers and pickets had a field day, slagging the probots with fiery projectiles or simply dismembering them by collision. The Alliance might as well have been providing the Yamisks and Coral Skipper pilots with practice for acquisition and targeting, 
But in fact, each probot was contributing invaluably to Alliance Command's goal of clearing fire lanes to the heart of the Armada. Many of the battles fought during the Long War had been decided not by firepower or kill ratios, but by the ability of Yuzhan Vong Biots to detect mass signals and to manipulate gravity. As intelligent as the Yamisks were, they were evenly matched by the crunching power of battle analysis computers, combined with the targeting skill of pilots. The Dovin Basils were a different animal. For a time, the Alliance had managed to outwit them by employing decoys, stutter fire lasers, and the Jedi propelled shadow bombs, but those advantages had recently been lost. Still, the Alliance had one powerful weapon in its arsenal invention. Gleeful as they were about decimating the probots, the Yuzhan Vong were unaware that each droid had been tasked to calculate entry points and targeting solutions for the starfighters. Transmitted to Alliance Command's computers, the data were collated and relayed to group and wing commanders, and on to squadron leaders and pilots. Your droids should be receiving navigational and targeting information, the voice of control said to Jaina's right ear. Watch your display screens for assignments. Data began to flash on the cockpit display as Cappy deciphered the information forwarded from Moan Calamari. Jaina watched a graphic representation of the Yamisk resolve on the screen, with each tentacle of skips and gunboats assigned a number or letter. Twin Sons, Rogue, and Vanguard squadrons were tasked with taking out tentacles 14 through 20. But as impatient as she was to go to guns, there was an order to battle that had to be maintained. The first assault wave was comprised of A-wings, TIE interceptors, Chiss clawcraft, A-9 vigilances, and a handful of Y-wings. The objective of the fastest of the starfighters, the A-wings and the A-9s, was to tease the coral skippers out of formation. Both fighter types were small and fragile, but the short-range concussion missile launchers of the former and the fire-linked lasers of the latter did to the outlying coral skippers what the skips had done to the probots. For each Dovin Basil singularity that came to the rescue of a targeted ship, four failed to deploy in time, allowing the small fighters to strike and fade before the Yuzhan Vong pilots even knew what hit them. Harried, the coral skippers and picket vessels that formed the tips of the tentacles began to disperse, and as soon as they did, the dagger-shaped TIE interceptors and light bomber Y-wings were on them, weaving through the budding chaos with blinding speed and loosing proton torpedoes and bursts of high-powered laser fire. The perimeter of the shifting armada became a blur of roiling fireballs and fragmenting vessels. Packets of green energy and nova-bright bundles of explosive power began to eat away at the suddenly flailing tentacles. Molten ejecta rocketed outward at the attackers. In such abundance, the armada might almost have been hemorrhaging. Jaina switched over to the battle net in time to hear Control issue the order to withdraw. We have clear fire lanes to their capital ships at 1, 6, 7, 8, 12, and 22. All starfighters in those lanes repositioned to escorts and carriers. While the starfighters began to loop back, the Super Star Destroyer Guardian and the Moon Calamari Cruiser Harbinger lumbered forward. Traversing, their ranged weapons poured huge bolts of destructive power down the unprotected lanes. Explosions blossomed at the heart of the Armada, all but setting in a glow. Colossal pieces of Yorick coral streaked through local space. The beast withered visibly, but stuck to its course. Second group away, Alliance Control ordered. Jaina licked the sweat from her upper lip and punched the X-Wing's throttle, leading Twin Suns swiftly into the fray. The forward view through the canopy showed so many coral skippers, so many targets of opportunity, she felt as if she were part of an elaborate simulation rather than engaged in actual battle. Remotely controlled by however many Yamisks were contained in the core, the tentacles slithered and snapped like amphistaffs. Skips moved in and out of her targeting reticle faster than she or even Cappy could keep track of them. For all the shrieking and yelping, the astromech droid might have been on a thrill ride. 
Even so, Twin Suns managed to maintain its integrity as it advanced on the whipping rank of vessels that had been designated Tentacle 14. Behind the X-Wings flew B-Wing fighters and a squadron of TIE defenders. In combat, the B-Wings were somewhat cross-shaped, whereas the TIEs, with their elongated bodies and triads of solar collection panels, resembled arrow-like projectiles. Their job was to mop up any mess that Twin Suns, Rogue, and the rest left behind, and to clear the way for the ship's task with landing punches on the capital vessels. Heavily armored E-Wing fighters, equipped with proton torpedoes, and twin-piloted scimitar assault bombers, carrying enough concussive strafing power to decommission half the rock spitters of an enemy destroyer analog. Coral skippers with enough fight left in them began peppering the X and B wings with plasma nodules and marshalling their Dovin basils to make grabs for the attacker's particle shields. Then, without warning, capital ships at the heart of the armada funneled furious firestorms along the depleted lanes. Jaina's X-Wing wobbled and tumbled through a swirling corridor of flames. With the starfighter's shields all but incinerated, she rammed the control stick to one side to free herself, rolling out of volcanic heat with the ship nearly roasted, and Cappy's dome a drooping hood of molten alloy. She performed a desperate pushover and scanned local space, dismayed to discover that almost all of the TIE defenders were gone, atomized by the superheated tempest. The beast hadn't been stunned by the initial assaults. It had merely been waiting for the right time to counterpunch, and the single blow it delivered had knocked fifty or more starfighters out of the fight. Jaina was doing a count of twin suns when the Armada Yamisks instructed the tentacle arms to rotate clockwise, and full chains of coral skippers and pickets quickly filled the gaps. Where moments earlier Jaina was facing six wounded skips, she suddenly found herself in the sights of a ravenous thirty.